Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's try to, to start sitting and, and get this started because we have quite uh, a packed uh, agenda. Uh, from my side, uh, this is Jordi Piera. I am the, the director of the, of the Digital Health Strategy for Catalonia at the, at the Catalan Health Service. And it's my absolute pleasure to, to welcome you all here. Thank you for, for taking your time uh, and being with us, uh, with us today. Uh, also on behalf of the organizing committee of, of this uh, event, uh, which is the, the Catalan Health Service and the uh, TIC Salud y Social uh, Foundation. Uh, we, are, we are starting this session with, uh, with uh, the institutional will, uh, welcome. It will be delivered by uh, Professor Xavier Pastor, who is uh, a senior consultant in medical informatics at Hospital Clinic de Barcelona. Also, he's the former CMIO at uh, Hospital Clinic de Barcelona, also uh, a professor uh, at the Faculty of Medicine uh, of the University of Barcelona, which is this fantastic venue. And we also have uh, Mr. Paul Pérez uh, on behalf of the Catalan Health Service, who is the Director of uh, Information Systems. So please uh, welcome them and uh, thank you for being here again. Now, oh, okay. Well, uh, welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure to, to have you here uh, today. Uh, uh, my position uh, here is uh, as a representative of the two hosting institutions, one the University of Barcelona, uh, the Faculty of Medicine, uh, that uh, is the responsible for teaching medicine here in this campus and also as a representative of the medical director of the hospital clinic, uh, who is also an innovative organization that has been promoting the use of uh, technologies in the clinical, in the clinical activities every, every day at the hospital. Uh, just very brief uh, comments. Uh, as an academic, I have to recognize that we are uh, a big, we have a big delay in uh, updating and upgrading the medical curriculum in uh, the topics uh, related uh, about uh, would be uh, talk, uh, would be discussed today here. Uh, this is a, a challenge, a big challenge that we have ahead. Uh, the University of Barcelona, the medical school of the, Medi of the University of Barcelona has the commitment in the next couple of years to do a deep uh, review of the medical curricula and include a lot of uh, challenges and, and a lot of uh, competences uh, for the next uh, medical students in the, uh, in the managing uh, the, these new technologies in the everyday practice. We know that every day we have more and more uh, medical equipment that uh, generates a lot of uh, data, and uh, those data are the, the prime matter to deliver new knowledge and new models uh, to assist, to help the physicians in the, in the decision making. And uh, it's important uh, that the physicians no, not the technology, perhaps, or uh, not the, the, the technology in depth, but how to evaluate and how to use these technologies in the everyday practice, and how to interpret the results and the, the results of and, and the and the counsels that these new uh, equipments uh, can uh, deliver to us, and also how to understand them and how to communicate the results to the patients. This is a very big challenge ahead of us. And I guess that in the next couple of years, we will have a new curriculum of the medical, in the medical studies no? to, to build this capacity in our professionals. This is one challenge ahead. By the other hand, as a representative of the hospital, I am really very 
pleased to have you here uh, for uh, talking about that topic, this standard open air, and also uh, the big project that we have uh, ahead of us. Uh, I am very, a little, let me say, I am uh, proud to say that uh, when, uh, as a medical information, informatics unit at the hospital, uh, we had to decide what should be our focus of research and innovation, standards was a clear, a clear choice for us. And uh, we uh, began to participate in several committees of standardization in healthcare, no? And also we did some uh, small pilot projects using uh, some standards, mainly ISO 13606, no? But uh, now uh, we have uh, the opportunity to see that finally uh, there is no time to waste, as, a, as a, is a, a, the, the, the title of the conference. And uh, we have to face this new uh, step ahead uh, in order to build a new generation of electronic health records. I think that is a, a big opportunity to, uh, to do that step ahead. No? and build really a tool that can uh, be uh, uh, centered on the patient and also the connection, the nexus, the, the, the network of uh, different professionals and also the patient. The patient more and more is participating in the clinical process. That's uh, what I want to tell you today to do that um, that inauguration of this, of this, and I guess uh, a very successful uh, conference and very successful uh, personal contacts among, among all the people who are here that will uh, be sure fruitful for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Mm, welcome to Barcelona at Open Air conference. Uh, we prepare a few words to make this, this institutional welcome from the Catalan Health Service and Department of Health in Catalonia. Um, do you know that uh, the Catalan health system uh, in, in, in its uh, digital strategy is moving towards an open platform model for patient-centered uh, health data? Uh, it's known that in Catalonia there are a very a high heterogeneity of uh, healthcare information systems in our centers, and it's very difficult for us uh, to speak at the same language at the different health information systems that we have in our hospitals, our prima, uh, so mental mental care centers, etc. After 10 years, more or less, to work in data interoperability, uh, we need to take a new step forward uh, towards a semantic interoperability. We have to change because we only in interoperability with data, not with the meaning of the information, and we lack information, our physicians lack information in each jump between different systems. Representing clinical artifacts in database that allow us modeling the knowledge through terminologies and archetypes is the strategic solution that we are heading towards. This strategy allows us to decouple the data models from the applications. We try to break the silos of information uh, among all the systems all the transaction different systems, all departmental systems, even uh, integrate into electro electromedicine equipment. This April in 2023, the develop, development and implementation of a clinical data repository based on open air is awarded, is awarded which will be respond the patient's care area. Therefore, from now, all the tenders will go in this direction. They will have to speak with archetypes of the open HR model here in Catalonia. We start the way and we don't stop. 
We start the way with uh, the base in, in, OPHNR, in open air model, and we try that all of new systems and any renewal of electronic medical record in Catalonia will have to speak in open HR. We are aware of the complexity of this project. This is, however, we bid on this as the future solution and we trust that the other health system goes at the same direction as us. We hope that they go the, the, the same direction as us and adopt this model in pursuit semantic interoperability. Our goal, our final goal in Catalonia is to build a longitudinal clinical history for all the citizens of Catalonia. I don't have nothing to do more. Um, thank you for, for this, this presentation. And Jordi will start the conference as you want. So, yeah, uh, thank you, Paul and, and Xavier, for, for this uh, kind uh, introduction to the conference. Now we are moving to, into the next session, which is uh, entitled Building the, the Third Generation EHR. It will be delivered by my good friend, uh, Rachel Danscombe. She's uh, uh, co-chair at the Open Air CIC. She's also chief uh, industry advisor uh, at Dedalus, and she has many other roles at the university and, and in other positions in the, in the UK. So please uh, welcome Rachel on stage. Thank you. And I'd like to start by thanking Paul and Jordi for this wonderful conference because it's been fantastic to see everyone come together to talk about open EHR and everything surrounding it. So thank you so much, both of you, for making this happen. As Jordi said, um, I'm co-chair of the Open EHR CIC. Uh, I'm advisor to Daedalus. I'm visiting professor at Imperial College London. Um, I'm on the UK AI Council and the lead for um, healthcare policy in AI for the UK government. And I'm also director of the Digital Health Society. So a number of hats, uh, and I'll be talking from those hats and some of my previous hats as well in this presentation. So Jordi uh, asked me to speak about the next generation EHR. And this is something that I worked on with the NHS in one of my previous roles. And what the NHS was really looking at was where have we come from and where are we going in terms of engineering EHR. And the definition of EHR was far greater than just the hospital EHR. It was a health record for our citizens and patients. And we looked at where we'd come from. So best of breed. Originally, you know, going back, back into the 90s, we bought a collection of systems that may or may not have interoperated with one another. They were tactical and often may have been managed by departments like pathology. And that was something that while we were digitized, you know, um, to a smaller degree, it was fit for purpose. But that certainly wasn't structurally going to meet our needs. And, you know, coming forward a decade or two, we ended up with a idea, really, that we should move to a monolithic EPR. So I'm a recovering CIO, and I say recovering because I've learned many of these lessons by not necessarily doing the right thing. But the monolithic EMRs were all about trying to do everything in one place, in one system. And we, we sort of had this idea that you buy one big system and it will do everything. Obviously, we've learned those lessons. Um, a single monolithic EMR that you know, does everything in an organization is not a reality and never will be. And um, gone are the days of us thinking that that's possible. The third generation, as we were uh, exploring it for the NHS, was about a platform-based approach. It was about orchestrating healthcare. It was about the flexibility to be able to innovate, develop new pathways, and allow healthcare to evolve, supported by longitudinal data. And engineering 
uh, both software engineering, engineering systems, engineering platforms was very much a focus. Looking at how we provide minimum friction, um, data liquidity, and also allowing that innovation and new models of care to happen um, around a stable core was absolutely essential. And as EY did this piece of work, they, they looked at the benefits of these three different approaches. Um, they showed that as we evolve from best of breed to monolithic to the third generation federated, we created more benefits for the systems and for the citizens. And a little bit later, I'll come on to the actual value to the healthcare system of moving towards these sort of federated third generation models. But I'd like to dwell a little bit more on EY's work. And I, I don't think we've got EY with us here today, but they've been an incredibly um, thoughtful about the research that they've done on this topic. And what they've shown is that, you know, today we are still to a degree siloed. We have many data silos, application silos, logic silos. And as we move forward in the next few years, we need to move towards a, a unified data layer. So that's semantic. Uh, layer that Paul talked about. And on top of that will be AI, as that's emerging, logic, and around that will be a number of different systems, including the traditional hospital EMR. But we have a proliferation of data. We have apps, wearables, medical devices. We have a huge amount of novel data types. We have problems from our citizens. Um, and we have data that is coming also from social determinants of health, which are incredibly important uh, for personalized care and personalized medicine. So EY are predicting that this is the model that will be emerging as we move into the third generation uh, EMR. And as we see open air and the other standards that we'll talk about today, they are absolutely essential for making this journey but this journey is one of engineering well for the future. And a little bit later, I'll also come on to why we need to do that, because our systems have moved from being tactical, you know, data being something that is almost disposable, to being a strategic asset that has value over decades. And that is a really big change. And actually, policies globally are starting to change to reflect that. And that might, may sound slightly dry, but I'll go into some of the accounting practices that are changing, which mean that data is being seen as a strategic capital asset. So that data layer is now the focus of the, of the sort of healthcare systems we provide. It is the core engineering that we need to undertake. We need to think of data first, and the systems over decades will come and go over that data, but well-engineered data will be for life of our citizens and our healthcare systems. So, drivers for the future EMR. I, I've put a picture here of a Newton's cradle because the pendulum swung from being, you know, um, best of breed systems through to single monolithic system. And now we are finding where we should be, which is well-engineered systems, not too many, but that share the right data model. So what caused us as CIOs to um, actually go through this journey? I've done a bit of reflecting on that. And the first generation, the best of breed, I can always remember the finance director saying, buy the cheapest thing that will do the job. Buy the cheapest system that will work. And that really pushed us into a whole set of different data formats, data silos, limited interoperability, um, limited data provenance. It was always about the cheapest thing for the organization. It was very tactical. There was no strategic thinking when we were in those sorts of uh, decisions. Um, and we have started to build an articulation of why that is not right. We've also moved away from, say, our pathology department looking after the pathology system or ophthalmology looking after the ophthalmology system because we realize all of the patient data needs to be together. The second generation monolithic, buying a massive big EMR that will do everything. 
well, we've realized that doesn't work. And actually, I can remember the moment for me, maybe 15 years ago, perhaps a bit more, where I realized that wouldn't work. We wanted to create some new data types. We wanted to innovate. And the data model in our EMR could not deal with that data. We couldn't put it in there. And I spoke to my EMR vendor. And the EMR vendor said, well, it may be 18 months. We may be able to put that data in for you. But there's change control wait list. And you're going to have to get other people to vote for it. So it's going to have to lobby other CIOs, including those in the US. And it didn't happen. So my realization was that we couldn't innovate. We couldn't put new data types in there. We couldn't be a world leading academic center doing new and novel research and care models within that EMR because it could not deal with the data we needed to put in. And that monolithic EMR as well, for me, very much reinforced US care models, yeah? So we were a social health care system in the NHS, as, as many of you are, and we have a way of operating that is not based on US insurance and billing. Yet the systems I was receiving had many attributes that were formed from billing, from you know, a US payer model, which was not fit for purpose for us. And as a result, the usability for the clinicians was poor. Um, we were putting in much more data than was needed. The flow, the workflow was too rigid um, and forced through by you know, the sort of US care model. And so the monolithic EMR did not realize the dream for the social healthcare system in the way uh, that we had hoped. The third generation is one that has come about through those learnings, but also the emergence of things like AI. Um, we need to be data focused. Data is for the life of our citizens. Data is for the life of our, our um, health systems. And data from all care settings needs to be brought together for an individual. We will not realize personalized medicine and precision medicine without that data. And we will not realize, um, you know, without the likes of social determinants of health, the ability to risk stratify our populations and plan our services and plan our new hospitals and healthcare uh, facilities. So the next generation is wider than just the hospital EHR. It focuses on all care settings, including the home. Um, it is citizen focused. It's longitudinal. Um, and as I've said before, you know, people, as they are born, if they end up in NICU uh, with chest exacerbations, that will bear out for the rest of their life in terms of risk stratification. Data for an individual has a lifespan of 80, 100 years, and you may even gift it at the end of your life. Yeah. So the view here is that we need to store data in a format that will last decades, if not centuries. It needs to be adaptive and additive as well, you know, as we, we are putting more and more new data uh, into the record from the citizen, from apps, from wearables, from, you know, new pathways. That is really important that we are able to be additive and add that to the record. It needs to be orchestrated, so we need to be able to use that data for different reasons, so we need to keep the data provenance. And it needs to be modular as well. And I'll come on to the AI piece a little bit later, but obviously in the world now with everything that is happening, I've, I've just come back from talking with the Canadians and the European Union on uh, AI readiness and AI governance. Um, we need great data. If you feed AI poor data, it is what it eats. It is a poor, you know, AI. And so great data is what we need for this next industrial revolution of cognitive. And open EHR and the other standards we support are absolutely key to that. So I'd like to thank Kathan for tweeting this. He tweeted this a couple of weeks ago. And it's the postmodern approach. And I thought it was worth sharing because we are starting to share framing around what the next generation is. And, you know, I, I'm not sure where Kathan got this from, but thank you, because for me, this is something that I've pinned and I, I keep referring back to. But that data fluidity um, that spans health and care domains 
is key to everything we're, we're doing for the future. We need that lifelong uh, clinical repository of data that conforms to open standards. I honestly believe that at some point our citizens will start to say we have a right to our data being in an open standard, both for our use and our healthcare system use. And with, you know, initiatives like the health data space in Europe, we are going to have to move towards that data being in an open standard so it can move with the citizen. We need full interoperability between our vendors, technologies and applications. And that needs to be semantic interoperability where possible. It needs to be the data that is interoperable as opposed to us interoperating between different data formats. Interoperability can be warranted or it can be unwarranted. Interoperability can be used as a sticking plaster between data that is in the wrong formats. And we lose data provenance. I've heard that called data munging from Australia, which I quite li like. That's a phrase that means you've taken all the goodness out because you're lo losing context. And we need to make sure that we are not doing, we're not having unwarranted interoperability in the future. Data also needs to be vendor neutral, not just because of our need as health systems to use that data, but also because our citizens have got a right to their own data in a format that's reasonable and standardized. And I can see under GDPR and other data privacy rules globally that people will have a right to their data in a reasonable format in real time or near real time. Um, and that's something that I think citizens will start to demand, especially those that have conditions and want to be able to take control of their own health care. Applications will be care team driven um, and will have the user experience that really takes the weight off our professionals. All of our care systems at the moment are under huge stress. We have backlog from COVID. We do not have enough clinicians globally. Um, there is not a single health system on the planet that is not under pressure at the moment. And I believe that we can take that pressure off by creating excellent user experience over the right data to be recording, yeah? And that is something that's really important. One phrase I like from the US is no more pajama time. And pajama time is when clinicians go home sit on their sofa in their pajamas and key data or catch up with paperwork. That's something that we should not be doing. It should be easy enough to record in the care setting. And finally, agile and modular. And as I said before, having been from, you know, a really um, sort of radical uh, academic health uh, group, we needed to move forward with innovation, with research, the agile and modular, we need to be able to work in sprints. We're able to, uh, you know, be able to do tests of change in weeks, not in years. And that's what this enables for healthcare systems. So it's engineered correctly for our future uses. And that's what this third generation postmodern EHR is about. So I, I just want to float uh, one idea past you. And this came out from a diagnostic workshop I did with Carnegie Mellon University to look at how viable healthcare system data was. And we used something called Viable Systems Model to do a diagnostic. And that surprisingly came out with, we have hugely unwarranted um, data in healthcare at the moment. And we used my, you know, my CIO experience in the NHS to sort of map that. But unwarranted variation creates unwarranted variation in care. And my thesis is that unwarranted variation in data does create that unwarranted variation in care. I need to create more evidence. I've done the diagnostic. But we have a huge amount of opportunity. So the BMJ said that ridding the NHS of unwarranted variation could save five billion a year in our operating cost. That's about 6% of our operating budget, maybe 7%. I've then also been very lucky to work with Peter Pronovost. And globally, we have a $3 trillion problem in uh, unwarranted variation and defects in care. 
there is a huge amount to go at here. And actually, I believe a large component of that can be fixed by creating the right data. And if you think about that globally, we have the pressure on the systems, but we also have inefficiencies. We also have harm that is created when data is not available for a patient. We have harm when data is not um, visualized correctly for a patient. And I, I'd welcome your feedback, actually, about unwarranted variation in data, creating unwarranted variation in care, which is, is harm, basically. But if it makes it worth you taking a journey on standardized data, we have this prize, or part of this prize, to go after. And that is very significant. And, and certainly, I'm one of the editors of the BMJ Leader. Um, and I am hoping that we manage to publish some of the figures around how we are helping unwarranted variation in care by dealing with standardized uh, data. Now, this picture is something that I put together from the World Health Organization's um, toolkit, the, the toolkit for digital healthcare. It's a very good document. Um, but in that document, they explore how we should be putting together data for high quality care and data that will last the lifetime of our citizens. And I guess traditionally, we talked about the EMR earlier and about how we've been through a journey of learning and how people like me have done the wrong thing in the past, perhaps. I think we've been also on a journey in terms of standards. People used to sit in one camp. You know, people would be HL7 people or open EHR people or fire people or snow med people. Um, and I think we are now learning that this is approach of the standards working together for the data platform. So I thought I'd visualize those standards that are in the document um, and actually put them up here because for me, this again is one of my aid memoirs to say, you know, how are we using these standards together uh, to get benefit? And certainly OMOP has been something that has emerged in the last few years. That's very important that we use that for research. But all of those standards are important in a, a health system. And certainly here, you know, in the open air world, we need to be working with all of those other parties as well. But if we move forward with these set of standards and work out how we will work together and how we will create platforms that will conform to these standards, this is a pretty good way of getting standardized data. And actually, the World Health Organization, very few people in healthcare systems were of that document. You know, I've talked to a number of people about it, but it's a very sensible set of suggestions, and it's also a very sensible way of visualizing how we fit together to create the healthcare platforms of the future. I also added synthetic data environments because as we look towards the world of AI, um, we have things like federated learning, but in order to actually expedite the journey of intelligence and AI, we need to be able to synthesize data. I was talking to Patrick about rare diseases this morning. We certainly had a rare disease unit, you know, at Salford. Um, if we're going to do that across the globe, Synthetic data can be an easy way of starting to train a model and then validate it against real data once you've been through all of the governance. But in this world of sort of standards, I think we're starting to see a picture emerge. And I think that picture is one that I feel comfortable with. Obviously, those bounds are slightly permeable. You know, what might you store in fire? What might you store in open air? You know, some people store everything in open air. Some people will use fire for some things. You know, where will you use OMOP? Um, where will you have warranted and unwarranted, you know, interoperability? Can we stop unwarranted interoperability? There are questions, but we're starting to get a picture that we can talk about. And for me, that is really valuable because I don't think 10 years ago we had this clarity. And actually, it's very nice to see people like the World Health Organization understanding this too and annotating it because that is a, a sort of global authority that understands that these things need to coexist and work together. So how do we engineer? I've used the word engineering multiple times, I think. 
And I've actually worked on the new hospital program in the NHS. And I got involved with healthcare planners. And we all know the hospitals we build now, you know, Karolinska or, you know, um, Erasmus MC or any of the, the new facilities. They are engineered well. They are engineered for the purpose in which they will be used. They have architects working on them. They're quantified. They have simulation done over them. Um, they are buildings that, you know, are really fit for purpose in the main. They, they are built also with flexibility. So working with healthcare planners, I learned that space is built to be multi-purpose for the future. So you could use a room now for one patient, but maybe two patients in the future. An operating theater could be used in a certain way, but it could also accommodate future medical devices and equipment. And if I actually think about where we've come from and historically where we've been, we've been a bit like a medieval set of villages as opposed to a modern hospital. We have been sort of randomly placed buildings with straw roofs, if you like, um, because we've not used those scientific domains to actually engineer. Certainly, going back in my past, that's been very true. And as we look forward to the future, this is about engineering data. And it's very important that we engineer data rigorously. The reason is that our data is now a capital strategic asset. And that's a very interesting point because the accounting rules are changing in countries, certainly in the UK. We can now see data as a strategic capital asset that is financed in the same way as buildings. So really, you can see the data that we're creating as being directly equivalent to bricks and mortar, glass and steel, those buildings. And that is a big change. It's a very big change. And so we need to move away from generation one and two, and we need to move towards generation three, which is engineering for the future, with a sort of rigor that we put behind everything else we engineer in healthcare. And healthcare planning has been a domain that I've worked with in the last few years. And there's actually something called the Institute of Healthcare Planning and the Academy of Healthcare Planning. And they are starting to train the people that plan healthcare services. So they plan buildings, they plan how communities work in data and digital as well. And they're starting to help us plan how data should be used for the future. And so it's nice to see that we're actually being taken strategically seriously, but we also need to engineer for the future to show that we are fit for purpose for decades as opposed to tactical. So again, I'm going to refer to EY here. And EY did a report for the NHS on the value of its data. And yes, some of that was around how we use that data with life sciences. Um, some of that was around how we innovate with industry. But much of that was about how we as a healthcare system, if we get our data in good order and standardized formats like open air, how we can drive efficiency, safety, quality in a better healthcare system. And that is actually where the five billion figure came from, from that, that rigorous piece of work from EY. And you can actually Google it. If you Google Pamela Spence and EY, you will find this piece of uh, research that research was also supported by Imperial College, where I, um, I work as a visiting professor part-time. And so that has been validated academically by health economists as well as by EY. And the very interesting thing here is that um, the data is seen as an what's called an intangible asset. Um, and that intangible asset has now got these new accounting rules around it. So the intangible asset and you know, the tools that we use around it can be capitalized and financed differently. Now, if any of you here work in health systems, you know how hard it can be to get money, right? You know, if you're going to buy a system, you might have to depreciate it over five years. And you probably can't capitalize the data you're creating from it. But with these new rules, we can finance it over a much longer period strategically, 
and we can also capitalize the data that we're creating. And this is important because it changes buying behavior. We can now buy more strategically, as I said. We can buy systems that create great data and put a weighting on the creation of the data. We can even make that the biggest factor in our procurement. And what we now see is a change in organizational buying behavior. We're seeing people put more weighting on the data, more weighting on creating great data over decades, and we're also seeing a change in how we finance. And certainly with the European recovery money that we're seeing now as well, um, we're seeing people being able to you know, talk about creating lifelong data for their citizens with that money. That's something we would not have seen 10 years ago. We'd have been talking about systems, not the data. But the data is the real focus for the future. So, the third generation EHR is also here to support the cognitive age. And I'm sure we've all got chat GPT and, and you know, general AI fatigue. There's been so much in the media in the past few weeks, it's been unbelievable. But behind the scenes, all of our governments, the G7, um, European Union, um, Australia, are busily working out how they can leverage the cognitive age. And the cognitive age is about putting in place legislation and governance to leverage AI so it is useful but not dangerous. <laughs> um, and we do have a, an obligation to do that. We have an obligation because, um, you know, much of this AI can take that pressure off our systems. We can automate our back office. We can risk stratify our patients. We can use it to help us catch up with backlogs. We can use it to, to drive in, uh, you know, equ inequity out of our system. It can find groups and people who do not receive the services they need, and we can address that. And AI itself can also find bias in our current system. So AI is not just about providing new solutions to health problems. It's about finding out where our system is not working today. So the third generation of EHR needs to be able to provide that data for AI and intelligence. And from my policy role with the UK government, data is the first biggest enabler for an AI-driven economy. It's the most important asset. And certainly within the UK, we have um, the Open Data Institute, we have a policy of open data for government because our governments realize how much we are dependent on open data for the future. And it's very interesting to see other governments looking at those enablers. They, they are, you know, data, as I said, and governance because governance in this age is really quite different to the governance that we've had um, in previous generations, especially with generative AI, because we still don't have some of the tools that we need to give us transparency, to look at bias, and to do things like life cycle management. I believe that Open EHR and the other standards that we've talked about are absolutely essential for healthcare to safely leverage this revolution and drive benefits for our citizens. And I put up here a federated learning model. It's, it, it's one of the federated tools that I have been using. Um, and also a, a link there as well to, to some, of the, um, some of the articles from Accenture around federated learning. But what we're doing with that federated learning model is basically across multiple countries, across four countries in three continents, we are doing federated learning with um, you know, AI to actually find out more about cancers and rare diseases. Um, and that is only possible because we've standardized the data. And that's the world we're in now because, um, you know, as these things emerge, we will all be asked as health system players, as health system actors, to be able to surface data for the training of models, to be able to surface data for, you know, um, validating models, looking for bias. 
And one thing that's really important uh, in my learning journey around AI is we talk about CE marking, we talk about FDA marking. That is fine, that's the start of the journey. But for any intelligence or AI, it needs life cycle management. And that is about constantly monitoring or training it. It's about looking for bias in new populations you're running it over. So for instance, here we have a population in South America and a population in Canada. You know, if, if we validate that algorithm in Canada, it then needs to be tested for bias and, and how it acts over a very different population. And I think we're gonna see a world where we're gonna have to provide data for the constant life cycle management of AI. For me, I say AI is a bit like a junior doctor or nurse. Um, the narrowband AI does simple tasks that doctors or nurses would have done, and the general AI does much broader things but it needs to be supervised, trained, audited, given an appraisal, if you like. And so we need to build those systems, but without the data, none of this will work. So, to summarize, looking to the future, we need our third generation EHR, and we need you know, the industry players who are playing in this space to work with the healthcare systems to provide that. Data becomes the focus, it is the capital asset. Systems will come and go, you know. 20 years time it will be gesture driven or, you know, voice and gesture driven. 30 years time, who knows? Where will we be in 50 years? But actually, my observations today are still valid in 50 years time. Unwarranted variation in data must be driven out to achieve safe and efficient systems. And that means we cannot have you know, 30 different ways of recording blood pressure that are not consistent. And a new approach to data is needed to change our health systems. It needs to be engineered for the coming AI revolution as well. And it needs to focus on value-based care, personalization, citizen participation. It needs to flex for that and care nearer the home or in the home. So. Thank you for listening to all of that and hopefully sharing some of my scars from the past as well as the things that I've learnt will um, enable you to perhaps have some reflections. I'd welcome them. Uh, you can tweet me at UK Penguin. But I think overall we have a very, very good future um, emerging. I think we have an amazing set of leaders, many of them in this room. But data is for life, not just for one system. And I think if we continue on this journey together, we will be saving and improving the lives of many millions of people. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you, Rachel, for uh, this very insightful uh, keynote speech uh, about the third generation HR. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to ask you to stay because I, I have a, a favor to ask you. But uh, first of all, a couple of uh, practicalities that I have been uh, asked by my colleagues. One is that uh, you should mind your step with these stairs. Uh, they are dangerous and it's not that clinic hospital is, is looking for new clients, but it's that they are, uh, well, bad engineered in a way. And then uh, the second engineering problem that we have, and it's not in regards of the EHRs, it's in regards of the letters with the, with the Wi-Fi. So you cannot find this Wi-Fi. Uh, this is, in fact, the username and the password for a Wi-Fi, which is wifi.ub.edu. So that's the, the idea of the Wi-Fi. And then this is the uh, username and the, and the password. And now uh, I would like to ask Rachel to just uh, stay on stage and, and continue uh, to moderate uh, this, this overall conference and, and to continue with, with the rest of the sessions. Uh, yeah, we know each other for quite a long time and I feel that you will do a great job. Thank you. Thanks. So I would like to welcome Ian McNichol to the stage. Ian is the CEO at Fresher and also the past co-chair of the Open EHR International. Thanks, Ian. Um, we've also got Paul Miller. So Paul is Clinical Informatics Lead at NHS Education for Scotland and co-chair of the Clinical Program Board at Open EHR International. 
We also have a virtual guest. So um, John Meredith is going to be joining us via video. Uh, John is the Assistant Chief Architect of Digital Health and Care Wales and a director at Open EHR CIC. Fantastic. Good. So I am going to hand over, first of all, to Paul. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really nice to be here. I think lessons for me for this conference are not to get your slides to the presenting team um, on the very morning of the conference when your laptop battery is dead and you only have a UK plug for your laptop. However, we managed with a mixture of uh, Google Drive and um, uh, the flexibility of the audiovisual gentleman at the top of the stairs there. So it's really lovely to be here. Barcelona is a great city. Um, I was last year when I was eight. Um, so it's changed a little, I think. Or maybe it's me who's changed. I'm going to talk to you this morning about something I feel very passionate about um, with regards to health records and a little bit about the journey I've been on, a little bit about what Rachel was talking about, maybe with a slightly different slant. Um, my background is as a general practitioner, so I'm a family doctor in a small town called Paisley, which is just south and west of Glasgow, which is a big town, or big-ish, um, near, um, on, the, on the west coast, in the River Clyde. Uh, I'm a GP there, been there for about 17 years, but now I only do one day a week there, and most of my life is spent doing clinical informatics, clinical informatics lead for um, what's called the NES, NHS Education for Scotland Technology Service, something of a mouthful. Um, and somewhat bizarrely, through an accident of design, we've ended up being the organisation that is tasked with building a new digital health and care architecture for the NHS, that's the public sector health service system in Scotland, um, which we're calling the National Digital Platform. So I'm juggling between these two roles, sometimes I'm a doctor, sometimes an informatician, but I'm always kind of both. So that's me, and this is me also, and maybe this is also you, the clinicians in the room, um, because when you look at health systems, the day, I remember the, um, I guess my first Windows 3.1 PC in about 1995 or six, and just being wowed um, by it and thinking, what, what can we do with this? How can this transform healthcare? And it should transform healthcare, and yet we're stuck. It's not doing that. The magic has not been realized, and, and that's really frustrating. Sure, we can do you know, repeat prescriptions and uh, call and recall systems, but where's, where, where's the spark? Where's the, the transformation that we expected from the power of computing? Why have we had 60 years of digital health? 60 years, this is mumps way back in 1966. Does anyone know how to write mumps code? Okay, it's still, it's still in use, mumps, in uh, Intersystems Cache, as built around mumps. What happened? I've only done the timeline up to 1994, but what happened in these 60 years? Pretty much bang in the middle. The internet happened. So all these siloed systems, all these systems that were delivering care in, in organizations, hospitals, GP practices, to one unit, suddenly people went, oh, look, we can share stuff, we've got the internet. What we're going to do about that? I'd really like them to see that data as well. And the, the vendors, I'm sure they weren't panicking, but they went, hmm, yes, right, good point. So how are we going to fix this? And the answer they come up with for fixing it was interoperability. Well, I'm here to tell you interoperability is not working. Um, maybe you've heard this message before, maybe not. But I still go to meetings and see strategy groups where the first thing they say about, we're going to procure a new system. Yeah, we're going to procure, buy a new system. Um, but we need to make sure everything's interoperable. 30 years, it's still not working. It doesn't scale. That's what the little diagram is. It shows you the maths and illustrates the A to B to C to D to E connection. Each one of these connections through the, the Palfrey and Gasser book is very good. I keep going back to it because it has this stack of barriers that you need to overcome to do interoperability successfully, from data up to institutional. All these layers need to be in place in order to make data flow semantically across your system. And every time you do that, it's actually what I would call graft. I don't know if it's a term that translates. It's work. It's hard work for people. 
Um, mostly people like Ian McNichol, who spends his life doing these mappings and data models for people. You've actually got to get the people to sit down and go that, and Excel goes to that over there, and maintain that through the lifetime of your product. It doesn't scale. That's why it's not working. That's why we're not seeing the transformation. Um, I was thinking that I was about the only person seeing this at any level, but it's not true. I mean, this leaders like Alistair Allen, and I had a quote from Thomas Beale, but I suspect oh, I left it in. I, the, one of the things about um, sending your presentation very last minute to the organizers is you don't know what version you're getting because they get jumbled up in your various file stores. So this is the version we're getting. I was hum humming and humming about whether to keep this in um, because of its... I think you've been on a bit of a roll that day when he was writing this. I think there was a little bit of um, irritation, I think. You can pick up through the subtext. You can't do it. It doesn't work. The way the systems are currently architected, you're not going to fix things with Interop. Um, so it's this story, really. Um, that every time you go to these meetings, people go, interoperability. We need to start saying, it's not working. Let's stop doing that. Let's do a different thing. Um, the emperor has, has, has no clothes on. What? Interoperability doesn't work. What? But there is a challenge, a real challenge around this, which is that health and care data is intensely complex because it's very contextual. So a, a doctor over there might say, you've got gout. A doctor over there might say, it's cellulitis. A doctor over there might say, you, you could probably get diabetes. And I would say, no, you're not got diabetes. You've got impaired glucose tolerance. So it's very contextual. The patient, of course, is in the mix of all this. And they're going, I've got many of these things. Doctor, I'm absolutely fine, feeling great. So making that data work, because it, it's um, analog data. We are not binary beings. Um, we don't respond to stimuli in predictable ways. You, it's really hard to compute it. So what's happened, I would argue, with, this, with current vendors, come the internet, they went, we have to share, we'll do interoperability. But it's really hard. So they've built pictures, windows, portals. It's portals all the way down in some systems. Portals to view the data. What's wrong with that is that it means that the CPU, the processing engine, the thing that has to do all the work is still this. And that's not scalable either against a background of modern health and care and all the understanding we have and the incredible developments we're getting in actual care with, you know, um, treatments that actually do do a thing rather than we had maybe 40, 50 years ago. So this is the 1950s medicine. Now, I, I wasn't going to use this because I thought, well, it's very, it's Dr. Finley's case because it's not just a kind of Scottish thing, but it's also a very a British um, um, thing that people know about and I've, I tried looking for the equivalent in Spanish I couldn't find anything now I, I found various things I thought no people will just I'll get it wrong I'll cause offense so I just left it out and left this in instead essentially it's a very kind of benign 1950s style parochial paternalistic medicine approach where um, you know it's all about um, speaking very gently to people and having comfort and asking them about their their um, you know their cat and having a cup of tea so it's a very old school medicine approach and that's what we're supporting in our healthcare system, I would argue, particularly in the UK, is still delivering that same style of medicine. They're just doing it with a modern, a modern uh, facade. So they've not really transformed the process. And the impact on that is productivity um, and the failure of technology to really improve the efficiency of healthcare systems. Um, it, sh it, should, it should be... Doctors and other clinicians should be able to do more with their patients more rapidly because they're not spending time chasing data, chasing information, because the computers are actually doing the work for them and telling them, hinting with decision support systems and indeed sure AI in due course of what to do next. So we're, we've not delivered on the productivity challenge either. So instead I would argue we do something else, and this is an open air conference, you would expect me to say that. But I think it's true. If we can get instead common data models, the artifacts that we all understand as human beings working in health and care. We all know what a blood pressure is, we all know what a medicine is, we all know what an allergy is. So why have we got a hundred different models for these things at the data layer? It's just crazy. Give us the models that we can all understand and then let the computers do the processing. Because if we want to deliver in the magic of AI and medicine, of precision medicine, an incredibly exciting field, um, of dynamic decision support and actually improve the productivity against all the strain health systems are under because of demand, because of 
pandemics because of constrained finances, we're going to have to think differently about who we build our architectures. Rachel used some of this slide that Ernst & Young, and I keep coming back to it as well, being something of an Ernst & Young fanboy. I don't know if fanboy translates either, um, but bear with me. Um, what I like about this is that they, they show everything tightly bound in the stack. These are the systems you have today. Actually, they often say they're tightly bound as vertical systems and slightly irritating learns than Young have done in horizontal. But it's the full stack of systems. A stack would be vertical. Um, so your data your application logic layer are all tightly bound together. Again, that's just not how we want to do things. Ernst & Young say, separate out vendor neutral data store. Bring that out, take it out of the, the EHR and keep it as a separate thing. Okay. And um, Gartner um, is very, say, a very similar thing in their DHP reference architecture. So these are big consultancy companies who are looking at the health and care sector and digital solutions and saying, what I'm saying, I'm just really reflecting back what they're saying in their papers to you. Stop doing what we're doing, break up the stack, build platform architectures, take the data out. So when you go looking for how you're going to do that, how you're going to build your EHR as vendor neutral, this is where you come to open air. Because open air gives you all these things. It is designed as a specification to let you build electronic health records. It's not just a data store, it's not just a database, it's a health record that understands the semantics, that understands um, the auditing, the, the kind of uh, versioning that's required. Um, it, so EHR systems built to specification give you all this and allow, of course, um, quite a bit at the bottom, which is very good for me, way for clinical experts to be involved. So, more jobs for clinical informaticians. This is a common line I use. I'm sorry if you heard it before. So who's doing this? Well, many of you in the room are doing this, which is great. Some of you, I know it's new to you. Um, so I'm hoping this has helped to focus your thinking. In Scotland, we do have a strategic objective, um, which I'll be talking about later with my colleague, Dan McCafferty, um, to build a digital platform uh, based around open standards. And of course, open air is, is in the mix there. So that's good. So we're quite early in our maturity and our growth, and there's um, political and financial and other shenanigans around that mean that it, you know, there are challenges ahead of us. But fundamentally, platform base, CDR, that's clinical and care data repository built around open air. So I, I think we have a happier future as clinicians. We should be able to start to smile again because we are at that point where there's a critical mass of people, look at you all, who are saying that this has not worked. Let's do a different thing. And I think that gives us all a better future and will start to make me happy. The last point I'll say is a, a joke I really like. You all have heard it. It's the, someone goes to see the doctor and says, doctor, doctor, when I do this, it hurts. And what does the doctor say? Stop doing it then. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna hand over to Ian. So, thanks, Paul. Um, I'm Ian McNichol. I used to be a family doctor, actually not very far away from where Paul works, um, but I haven't been a, a GP for 20 years, which is why I'm so happy and got a nice, relaxed face. And, um, I'm now a full-time informatician, have my own little company, and I guess what we do is standards-based clinical informatics, particularly around open air. So, many of our clients and companies and organizations we work with, including CHS, are in the room. My job today is to try to dive a little deeper. I appreciate many of you in the audience will know some of what I'm about to say, but we know others won't. So we're just going to dive a little deeper, which hopefully will, will help you understand a little bit what, what open air is about. I like to start by saying, and it repeats a little of what both Paul and, and uh, Rachel have been saying, is you know, what, what is it we're trying to do here? And we do get into these discussions about whether we should use, be using technical interoperability with HL7 Fire or semantics with SNOMED. I like to think that we, what we all believe we should be getting to is a coherent patient-centric view of a patient's record or their health status. If you like, the, 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 the diagram at the top right. But we also know any of us who've been in this space for any time realize that this is an incredibly complex and difficult activity. Um, there are many, many different organizations, many professionals. Patients are now in the mix with their own applications and devices. And drawing this together, we should not underestimate the challenge in doing this. 
and not be terribly surprised that we're still pretty grumpy. I've been working on this for probably only over 40 years, and I'm still surprised how much I, I'm still learning. Um, and the reality today, if we take something like a cancer journey, you know, a patient is traversing many, many different professionals, many, many different organizations, each of whom is capturing their own records in their own way, and often for good reasons, because everybody along that journey is doing a different job but they're capturing it in their own siloed bits of paper or applications or data stores. And it means for a very, very difficult journey for that patient in terms of communications. Um, I've been on that journey with a partner and it's not a happy experience, not because the professionals involved are doing a bad job, but because the communications and the synchronicity between each part is really clunky. That may be a UK experience, but I suspect it's more universal than that. So what can we do about it? Well, we have this idea, and the tra traditional way is either build one system, which I think we all would agree is probably e not, neither feasible or, or practical, um, and, and you know, gets us into a whole uh, monopoly situation, or we use this idea of exchange. So keep the data in each of these individual applications and use a technology like HL7 Fire to transfer that information between each node. And what you can see here is it's actually doable. Um, I think it is possible, but I think I agree with Paul, and I think the, the message coming from, from the experience in Catalonia is that there are limits to how this will actually scale. It's also very expensive. You know, Paul's quite correct. I make some of my living from doing those data mappings, and it's good money, you know? We, we, we love this stuff because we have to keep doing it time and time again but it doesn't scale. And I think particularly the idea that we can synchronize all of those nodes. So you know, if one bit, one bit of information changes in one node, it will somehow magically uh, flow to all the others. I, I, think it, I don't think it will happen. So this is the world that I think we're moving into, this idea of data platforms. So congregating the data, aggregating the data, and having multiple apps talk to it. And as others have said, this is not science fiction anymore. It's happening, and I think Catalonia is, is actually re leading the world in its, its vision of this being the future at scale. More practically, in terms of what does open air mean, where does it come in, in this world? So it is, as Paul said, it's about separating the apps from the data. That's the key thing. Many, many apps, Still organizational apps, personal apps, user apps, things that are focused to let people do their job, but starting to converge the data in these data platforms. And inside the data platform, the open air version of that, there are really two components. There's a technical layer, what we call the data store, the clinical data repository, or it should really be care data repository, because any time we say clinical, we really should say care. It's beyond just traditional um, clinical medicine into social care, other things that affect the citizen. And in open air, we deliberately split the technology, the CDR, from those information models, the definitions of what's a blood pressure or a diagnosis or an end of life care wish, um, into the separate vendor neutral information model layer that is open sourced. The CDR is a critical component. It essentially is a smart data store, which natively stores, uh, retrieves, and queries open air data through a standard API. So for those of you who are te technological, the next question you will ask me is, what does the database look like? And I love telling people, you don't know and you don't care, because you never act directly with the database. You always work at it through this uh, standard API. And that gives us another factor, which is technological independence. It means that the person or the company or organization that supplies the CDR technology can actually change the internal database or data store technology that you use without interfering with anything else. So that's a really powerful. We've not only got vendor neutral, we've got technology neutral. So over that lifetime, uh, of you know, perhaps 100 years of patient data, we can keep track with technology changes as new, as new products emerge from the market. And the other really important factor is we've got this idea of no-code deployment. Some of my technical colleagues don't like that term, but for me, as a clinical informatician, building those data models, 
Um, we are empowered to upload the data models to these data stores, and we don't have to ask an engineer or a technologist to change the data structures. It all happens automatically. All of the data is completely available, and it's all defined by the data models that we build, and then it's all queryable. So essentially, you've got this situation where the technology, the vendor control, is removed. You put the power into the, 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 the hands of the healthcare provider, like the Catalan Health Service or equivalent around the world. The real magic, the other magic, apart from the CDR, is in the cl clinical data models. We have things called archetypes, which are essentially components of a clinical record system. This is an example of an advanced intervention decision. It's really used for end of life care preferences. Uh, and uh, it's developed and now published in an international repository. So it's freely available. It's now in use. Uh, there are 70,000 care records in London working using this, this data model, uh, which was developed by the international community. These are developed and managed by clinical informaticians like myself and Paul. Engineers don't get involved in, it in any way at all. And as I said, we deploy these without any help. One of the things, though, about open air is that we are sort of committed to boiling the ocean. Because this is about storing data and supporting applications, the fire guys, I think, quite rightly said, look, we're not trying to do everything. We're trying to get the high-value the, the high bits of data moving between systems. That's not good enough for us. We have to build anything and everything that someone comes, across, some, comes along and asks us for to support their application development. So the whole collaborative review and publication of these models is really, really important. And I want to pay tribute to colleagues, particularly Heather Leslie and Vibjorn Anson, and Silvia Vacker from their Norwegian CKM team, for over many years working away, slowly boiling that ocean to the extent that now any typical project that, that I'm involved with, at least 70% of the archetypes and content that we deal with, we get for free from this shared library of content. It's been a hard slog, and it will continue to be a hard slog because it is a very complex activity. But I think we've got the right tooling and the right methodology to just keep working away at that. And right now, my own little company is working with colleagues in Catalonia, in the UK, in the Karolinska, in Sweden, and gradually we're building up this store of content. Very powerful and exciting methodology. So ultimately, what is Open Air as, a, as an organization? Um, Open Air International, which is the organization that runs this, um, it really produces these two artifacts. There's a specification for this patient-centric healthcare information. It, there's not an application. This is obviously a, a, sometimes a confusion from technical people per, continually will, will come in and say, uh, where's the app that we can download and build? It's not an app. It's a set of specifications and then the data models. Both of these are open sourced, but they don't have to be used in a purely open source system. So around the room in the vendors and, and uh, application builders that you may meet, there is a mix. There are some that are pure open source, some are uh, commercial entities, but the open air parts of these are openly specified and standard. Open air essentially is a collaboration of vendors, um, uh, implementers, clinicians and clin clinical informaticians like myself, and healthcare organizations like CHS uh, and others around the world. You're very welcome to join. It is really starting to get momentum. Uh, I've updated this slide as of yesterday, forgot to do this one. We now have a lot of, uh, a lot of systems working around the world. Uh, I heard yesterday a figure of uh, several hundred million uh, open air based documents actually stored in, in live systems around the world. And you'll hear about, hear about them through the rest of today. One of the ones that I've been uh, really excited about and involved with uh, is a London based uh, system called the Universal Care Plan, which started as an urgent care planning system. But the ambition is to go well beyond that into other care planning modalities using what we call an information for life pattern. Because what we've discovered is a lot of the information that we collect in all these individual applications is actually in common. You know, who are the people that help, help you when you're sick? Who are your, your friends, your parents, your, your, your kids or your, your colleagues? Um, you know, what, are your, what are your personal preferences? Where do you live? These have got nothing to do with a single care plan or hospital episode. These are things that are about you as a person. And we think we can engineer these systems to take advantage of that, 
not only make that care journey better for patients, but actually reduce the huge data collection burden that our colleagues in the health and care system have. Very often nurses and, and social care practitioners, the doctors get away with, the, with, with this a little bit. Um, and that was a really ambitious program. I, I'm sure other people will talk about it, but I think the care planning modalities, the care planning environments are actually going to be a really, really good fit for open air based systems because we're not going directly up against the more established players in the market. And I, so I think this is where we're heading, is this idea of patient-centric and coherent information. Uh, whether it's one store or multiple data stores, I think that will depend on the, the country, the environment and the culture. There are legal and privacy concerns, but I think this idea of starting to aggregate or congregate the data in a, a set of one or more data stores, uh, rather than in every single little application around the world, that is the future. And it has to be based on open standards or we're, we're just locking ourselves into further, further silos. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. And I think we have a video now from John. So um, just let me check how we cue that in. Let's see. Hi, I'm John Reddit. Really sorry I can't be with you today. But uh, you're just going to have to put up this video of me talking briefly about how open air is affecting modern digital health architectures. In the 18 years that I've worked for the NHS in Wales, I've noticed a, a significant shift in how healthcare architecture has been changing. Notably, we are shifting to this open architecture approach, loosely coupled components, um, relying on uh, APIs that are openly published and defined uh, away from this silo black box uh, sort of approach. Uh, we've also noticed this shift away from the document bound paradigm where all the information is stored in a document management system. Um, because of course you give a PDF to a clinician, they might be able to read the contents, but they can't do anything with that data from a structure perspective, unless we put a layer of software engineering in place. So some of the things that we've done in the last 10 years, we now know we're just sticking plaster approaches. Take document scanning, for example. The notion that we have to get rid of this mountain of paper, digitize it, and then put it in the hands of a clinician as a means to uh, support better clinical care. Sure, it helps, but it isn't a part of the solution because, of course, you can't do anything with that data without that software engineering layer put in between. And so the solution 10 years ago now seems to be something that was just merely a temporary fix. Let's take a moment to consider what we mean by the open platform. First of all, it's standards based. It has a persistent layer. It also has standards based APIs that have been published. They could be open air, they could be fire. It depends on the use case. And also is supported by a persistent data model that outlives the application. They're technologically neutral. And that we are also storing that data in, an open, in a secure, auditable way but it also has the capability of scaling. And importantly, by harnessing these attributes, we are providing a reusable capability. And that's something that would be able to release design and development resource over time. We don't have to talk about blood pressures anymore, for example, or how to store smoking status. A key theme that's emerged over recent years is that of convergence. And that's where the idea of the Fox stack came from that we're seeing this pattern of components being used uh, out there in the healthcare uh, environment, th such as fire, which is you know a, a great step forward from what came before it for providing that messaging solution. Open air again for you know the data structures, IHC covering off the document and the metadata standards, and of course SNOMED CT running through this as that effective terminology. And really the Fox stack just came about because I noticed that people were using this stuff. So how does that actually manifest? So this schematic sort of describes how the Fox stack components all slot together. At the top, we've got the application layer with a range of third party consumers, NHS applications, other health tooling and things like that. 
And below this is where the open architecture layer starts to take shape. We have a series of platform APIs that will be, you know, serviced via an API management gateway, a series of other authentications and terminology systems. This is where we start to see fire as that standardized syntactic interoperable messaging layer. Um, but also it's where we start to see SNOMED and other reference data capabilities appearing. These feed down into a series of system APIs that sit on top of the data repositories. On the right hand side, this is where OpenAir starts to uh, come into its own in terms of supporting structured data. But this will be also be flanked with IHE XDS document repositories and uh, related components. And that's not to say this is going to be exhaustive. You know, we might have legacy results or pathology repositories. We'll have other repositories of uh, different data appearing across the software and co uh, component ecosystem. And this then is a manifestation of that architecture. On the left hand side here, we have open air that could be tied to a low code development environment, for example, and we might be creating complex granular data structures that are surfacing electronic health records and, and supporting clinical use cases. And these could then feed into an aggregated layer. In this case, we could surface this as HL7 fire. This might be some sort of you know, regional you know, observation service, for example. And at this point, we're talking about a single source of truth. Now, a single source of truth in this context has to rely on aggregated data or an aggregated data view. And it has to do this because something as straightforward as a blood pressure observation is going to be spread right the way across our digital ecosystem. It'll be in third party systems that have been procured. It'll be in local systems that have been developed. So therefore, the idea that we would store all of that in OpenAir just doesn't really make sense. So this aggregation layer is key. But of course, we have to remember, as soon as data flows from this aggregated layer into some form of digital capability, if that sits on top of OpenAir and is stored as an OpenAir composition, it could add to clinical decision making. At that point, it is technically owned. It has to have the fingerprint of it that is relied on uh, provenance and relied on unique identification to ensure that we not start, don't start double counting data items and also that we are attributing when data has a role to play and part of the diagnostic pathway. Here's an example of a straightforward data pathway. At any point we have a business requirement that needs definition you know, an informaticist, for example, will create some sort of model, um, will hand that over via software to a clinician and they'll start generating that. Of course, then you need some software engineering layer to either store that data, transform it out, uh, and then put it in the hands of a data scientist or a researcher or some other secondary use. Now, that's all well and good. However, well, the moment we start to want to reuse that data, we have to be very careful that the data structure is still fit for purpose. And so for basic interoperability use cases, if so for example, blood pressure, I'm sure everyone can agree most use cases require a systolic, diastolic, maybe a cuff size, and some other provenance related data to describe how, when, and where, and who recorded that result. But the moment we start to need to use that data for a more complex use case, we have to go back to the drawing board and we have to go back to that definition phase. Now, of course, if we're using data that has been aggregated from several different sources for primary data entry, then we run the risk of introducing breaking changes into systems, forcing different versions of APIs that need to be redeveloped because now we've changed the, the structures or maybe the contents, and it gets increasingly complex. And most notably, in order to reduce that, you then have a lossy transaction. You have a dumbing down, essentially, where all system suppliers or all consumers of said data need to all agree on the lowest common denominator or version of it in order for it to be usable for a variety of different care contexts. That's a key element of having the maximal data model approach and utilizing open air, is that you don't have to dumb the data structures down. I'll leave you with this thought. We've heard from Paul that traditional interoperability approaches 
don't work. Um, and I would suggest that anything where we don't put the data front and center is actually a regressive step. Um, we won't make the, the appropriate steps forward. Now, I don't know how the open platform and, you know, the example of the Fox stack implementation is going to um, evolve over the next few years. But we know that open air will play an increasingly important role in establishing a baseline of semantic coherent data to allow us to be more dynamic in terms of clinical decision making and actions. It's often been said that we're on the precipice of a new industrial age where data is that key driver. And I think now we're at that stage where um, technology has caught up and the idea of an open platform approach is now viable and is here and it's present. So if you're serious about building scalable electronic health records and digital solutions for any care context, I believe persistence is very key to that. And open air is presently the only viable solution. But don't think of it as a silver bullet, but just think about it as the right tool for the job right now. And thanks to John for that video. Sadly, he couldn't be here, but uh, that was fantastic. Now we've got some time for questions and I think we've got a couple of microphones. So I'm gonna ask a first question of the panel, but anyone else that would like to ask questions, please put your hands up and the microphones are roving. So the question I'd like to ask is, we've got a number of people in the room who are just starting their open air journey um, or are curious about open air. And I wondered what your words of advice are to them. So Ian, if you could condense 20 odd years experience, what would you say to those people that are just starting? Hang in there. <laughs> it, it can be confusing. I, I started my journey um, uh, by accident. I was actually trying to build a better UI for my GP system, uh, but I needed some data models. And it, you, we, you have to realize this is a, quite a profound change in the way that we, health systems are built. So you do have to get your head around it, and that's probably tr more true for people who are already working in this area. If you're completely fresh, in some ways it's easy. Uh, yeah, make use of the, the website, um, make use of uh, any training materials you can, you can find, uh, and definitely ask on discourse. So we have a, a, an open air discourse channel, which is completely free to use, very friendly. People will pop up and try to answer the questions you have. But very welcome, because it is a very, very friendly community. Paul? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that video from John, incidentally. I thought you, John presenting from his car the entire time, didn't even notice, he just seatbelt on as well. Um, a great, great video from John. Um, so open air is a challenge to get your head around because it's a paradigm shift in the way of thinking. Um, how you learn about it really depends on your background and your context. For most people, don't go to the specification pages and often and as your first port of call. Um, unfortunately, often when you start looking for advice in open air, you get links into specification pages and they're really dense and they're really good, but they're full of class models and big words. So don't go there. Good places are actually social media sites like the YouTubes and Ian actually has some fantastic videos through open air days along with colleagues, uh, many of whom are in the room. And the videos are actually a good way just to get yourself grounded in the space, but when it comes to your particular use case, um, you really should be making use of the community, I think, as Ian says, through discourse, through events like this, to start to, um, you know, if you come from a clinical background, to start to understand how the, the data modeling works, coming from an engineering background, understanding the implementation, deployment, API use. Um, one of the things I think that is maturing within the open air space, open air international at the moment, is the uh, uh, educational board. Um, so we do increasingly have good training materials um, being provided through the educational program, um, which is a step forward again from where we were you know, five, ten years ago. Um, and as that uh, program matures, there'll be uh, more and more material for you to actually use. Um, but don't, don't, don't become disheartened ask questions and, and, and seek clarity. You're on the right path, I think, if you're going down that road. Thanks, Paul. 
Right, questions. Let's see who puts their hand up. Any questions out there? Come on, I know some of you have got burning questions. I'm going to ask another question while they warm up, if that's all right. Um, So, Ian, I'd like to ask you, because um, you've been involved in London, and that has been quite an incredible journey interoperating with a lot of different complex systems. I wondered if you could just reflect, really, on what that looks like, because for me, that's really quite a new environment, interoperating with some big systems that we've not seen interoperated with in that way before. Yeah, that's been interesting. Um, so uh, w- one, of the, one of the major bits of, of potential interoperability that we've had in this project, which is a pan-London end-of-life care system at the moment, uh, because actually through FIRE, through HL7 FIRE, we have access to the GP systems. Uh, we have access also to some of the other systems, but the, they're much more limited in terms of what they can either give to us and certainly very, very limited in what we can send back. But the GP systems actually have some fairly decent uh, proprietary interfaces over which there is a FIRE wrapper. Um, what that has shown me is, yes, this is technically possible, but actually in a complex world like, like end-of-life care planning with critical information like do you wish to be resuscitated or not, we can't afford to get that wrong. And it has highlighted to everybody on the project that actually getting that kind of synchronization across all of these systems is actually really difficult. Even if you can make the data flow, and it is starting to flow, Uh, making it synchronous and getting all of these different systems, which, remember, inside are engineered very differently, is actually a real challenge. And I think this is where the rubber is going to really hit the road as HL7 fire and and equivalent start to mature. People will go, hang on a minute, we're actually just creating another problem, which is a very difficult problem to solve. And this is why I think increasingly we will be pulling the data out of those individual applications into the common data stores where the data is continuously synchronized. So we are moving from a world where these GP systems will read and write to the data store. They will still be their own applications, but we, we stop trying to synchronize the data back to their data stores. Fantastic. And I haven't see, seen it work with some of the big EMRs alongside them in London. That's, that, that's been pretty incredible. Thanks for that, Ian. Um, Paul, I'm just going to ask you a quick question about the CPB, so the Clinical Programme Board, because obviously sure. you've stood forward as part of the leadership of that board, yeah. and the governance is growing and, and becoming yeah, yeah. You know, scalable. So, so I, I don't... You're a very lovely audience. You're very quiet. How, how many of you are completely new to open air, hands up. We've got a few. We've got a few, yeah, yeah. yeah. How many of you would say you're kind of nah, halfway getting your head in, beginning Off to in understand it? Yeah. Okay, experts. <laughs> <laughs> so what makes open air uh, different is the international community and international collaboration, as I was referring to in my talk, is the internet. These are tools that we've never had before. Um, You couldn't have done modeling, data modeling at this scale uh, in in silos without the internet. Um, So this is when you look at, we've got this uh, repository of clinical data models called, um, stored in what's called Clinical Knowledge Manager. It's an application for motion informatics who are also here today, I think. Yes, they are. Um, And in there is essentially the crown jewels of open air and actually as a resource for a um, uh, global resource as a way of, of starting to model uh, health and care data. Um, it's a, a, a incredible. Um, but it needs good governance. So the thing that really works to make open air systems fly is to have good governance so that you're not duplicating all your models, that people are, are using the international archetypes and they're templating in their data definitions. And from our perspective, we need governance internally within Open Air International to make sure that the Clinical Knowledge Manager repository is well managed, that the versions are maintained through their life cycle, um, and that it's access- accessible so people can actually use the, the content that's there, understand how to use it, and also understand how to contribute to it. 
So that's what the Clinical Programme Board is tasked with doing, but it's, it's very new. We've only been on go for about three months as co-chairs, and in fact yesterday was the first formal meeting of the board itself, in which um, I think was a success. Some of the people were in the room, uh, were at it. Um, and we've now, formally, we've now formed that board with our first full-on meeting probably in September. And there's quite a lot of work to do, but we'll, we're, we're on the case. So this community governance is, again, a, a key part of Open Air. What makes, I think, Open Air different is that it's driven by the users of the, of the uh, specification, driven by the users of the content models. Okay. Wonderful. Is it question? Oh, well, we've actually got juiced one of your co-members of the board. Yes, uh, thank you for your excellent talks. My question is uh, to Dr. McNichol, because you mentioned that you as a company make a lot of money from mappings. <laughs> so there's, I think there's quite a lot of vested interest in the status quo. So I wonder what would be your advice to the co companies who are currently big doing system integrations and uh, monolithic EHR? How would they profit more uh, from an open EHR world than they do right now? People, people will say, um, well, we'll when, when will the big guys adopt open air? And the answer is probably never. Why would they? You know, they're doing fine with their existing ba uh, models. And, and I think the, really the question comes as well, do we just let them get bigger and bigger and bigger, even though they're maybe not delivering an optimal solution, even for their core hospital or GP system? Um, and I think we're just working around them. Uh, and I, what I see is that these systems will start to shrink. They won't disappear. Because certainly in the UK and many other countries, they are delivering you know, decent functionality. Uh, so hospitals are not going to let these systems go overnight. They've probably got 10 or even 20 years before they before they need to be re-procured. But there's a whole other patch of health and care around what happens just in a hospital, and I think that is where open air and the kind of community-based approach that, that, that the, the uh, CHS is, is proposing is exactly the sweet spot to start to really transform the way we deliver health IT and watch those monolithic systems. It's like the high tide, you know, they've got there, now they're going to start to go back slowly and we'll start to tease data out of those systems into our common data stores. Fantastic question. Another chap up here. Could get him the microphone. Could you just wave, sir? Thank you. If you could just tell us who you are as well. Hi, um, Owen McGrath. I work for ICBA. We're, the, we're a standards development organisation for uh, medical products of human origin, blood cells. So an SDO in a, in, a, in a tiny niche, but I would say a critical one. So I'm, I'm one of the people who put up my hand when you asked who's new to EHR or to open, open air. And I'm, I'm completely new to, to EHRs in general. My, my first, I have two questions. First one is, how do SDOs engage with, with open air? Because I've seen you mentioned LOINC and uh, SNOMED, for instance, on the terminology uh, side of things. Um, and the second question then is, how does open air fit into the European health data space? That's a great question. So the terminology one is easy, right? So, um, you know, we routinely use SNOMED CT or LOINC or any, any other terminology alongside open air. Um, sometimes people in terminology world, I think, push its use a little too far. But I think actually having fire on the space has helped get that balance right. So the balance between what you put in the information models and in the terminology, I think we've got about right now. It's good understanding. So that's pretty straightforward. The SDO one is, is quite interesting because uh, Open Air is not formally an SDO. Uh, some people would call it an SSO, a standard supporting organization. Uh, and there is, I, I, I wouldn't say there's a tension, but we've actually discussed whether we should try to become an SDO and have had discussions in the past. But it, and there would be some advantages, probably political, uh, but actually other disadvantages in terms of the way that we like to do, do our business um, is not necessarily terribly aligned. Um, 
I think the European health data space is an interesting and emerging one. I think something that we as an organisation need to do more is to engage more with European um, health initiatives, including the health data space. As I understand it right now, that is very largely on the kind of data lake analytics side and not so much on, on the, you know, operational data, which is what, what open air strength is. But yeah, I, we, we really need to be more engaged in that um, I, I, and because it, you know, it's, it's the right place to be. And there are various touch points with the European health data space. I know certainly there's been bids put in to do sort of pathfinders around open air, but at this point, I think they are still defining the standards that they will work to. Right, well, I think we're about time. So if we could thank our panel and we should be back after coffee for uh, 11.15, please. Thank you.
for the next session, if you could take your seats, please. Okay, so our next session is entitled From Theory to Practice, and we're going to be looking at experiences from around the world. We have, uh, first of all, Alistair Allen, who is Chief Technology Officer at BETA. Alistair, can you come and join us on the stage, please? We have Patrick Georgie, who is the Chief Medical Information Officer at Karolinska University Hospital. Patrick. We'll be having a video from Anand Yagadar, who is the principal software architect at Karkinos Healthcare. So he'll be joining us via video. We have Daniel McCafferty, who's principal software architect. <laughs> I've got both of you. I'm taking it that Anand is not. I, I, you're from Karkinos Healthcare? No. You're, you're actually from Scotland. Of course, you're from a health board in Scotland. Wonderful. We've got Paul Miller, who we met before, who is clinical informatics lead at NHS England um, and co-chair of the... NHS Education for Scotland. All right, NHS Education for Scotland and clinical program board, Open Air International. And we've got Miguel... Uh, Padera Jimenez, who is head of data science unit at Hospital 12th de Octobre. Welcome, everybody. So I think, um, I think, Alistair, Wait. you're our first speaker. Hi, everyone. So we did a big project last year in, in England uh, across London. Uh, based on, on OpenEHR, so uh, unfortunately the London team were hoping to come and tell you themselves all about it. Uh, they couldn't make it, so unfortunately you're stuck with me today. Uh, so my name is Alistair Allen and I am the CTO of, of Better, uh, so we were one of the, the team behind the, the project at One London. Uh, so London is quite a diverse uh, landscape, as you can imagine. So 10 million people, uh, over 40 NHS acute hospital trusts, uh, 1,400 GP practices. Uh, the NHS in England is now divided up into uh, a regional healthcare model. So there's 42 integrated care systems uh, that span across England. London is actually responsible for five of those. Uh, so those five ICS regions have, have come together and formed what is known as One London. And they're working together uh, under a strategy of making London uh, the healthiest city globally. So digital, data, technology, uh, and transformation underpin that, that quite lofty ambition. Uh, so let's have a look at some of the things that they've been up to. So as you can imagine, data uh, is a really important part of, of the overall transformation. Uh, you can also imagine that the scale of, of London, shown on the previous slide, data is, is everywhere. Uh, and a lot of it is, is quite messy, it's poorly coded, incorrectly classified, and really quite difficult to use, uh, both direct care and secondary use. So London have, have been investing in a platform-based approach uh, that will allow them to really start to get control of their data. Uh, and then being able to use that data for a range of, of different use cases. They've got a three-step approach that they've been following for a number of years. And, and step one is really bringing data together in whatever format uh, they can. Uh, and a lot of this is involving bringing data through in unstructured uh, formats. Uh, and the idea here is just trying to present to a clinician at the point of care information in the best way possible. But really they want to go beyond that. And, and level two then is where they started working with ourselves 
And this is really trying to introduce structured data at the point of care in a consistent format that's well classified, correctly coded, uh, and can be easily understood uh, both by computers and, and humans. Level three then is, is really, really important, and, and that's putting the patient at the center of what they do, giving people access to that information uh, where patients are not digital native, providing their families and informal carers also with access to that information. And this is the program that, that we've been working together with, with London on. But as you can imagine, that's, that's a huge ambition. And, and the last thing that they wanted to do was to get really uh, caught up in a multi-year uh, data normalization project. Uh, it was really important that, that they were able to go live and deliver value early and build on that and create momentum and, and deliver benefit. So the first area that they decided uh, to uh, roll out was around care planning. Uh, so this is what has been already mentioned by Ian earlier. And, and care planning, they, they have this sort of uh, tagline on, on the right-hand side. Uh, what matters to me is just as important as what's the matter with me. And the whole idea here is, is, is really trying to bring that information together around what's important to a person and making sure that everybody involved in my care has access to that information. Again, care planning is a really broad topic, uh, as you can imagine. So the area that they started on was end of life. So people who are in the last weeks or, or days or months of their life, uh, how do we uh, document a care plan and, and collaborate around that? And this is some of the, the people who are involved in that collaboration. Uh, obviously the patient and their family, uh, but surrounded by you know, urgent care, uh, clinicians in, in a hospital, community nurses, uh, social care, really trying to architect and design a system uh, that puts the patient in the middle of this uh, and allows all of these people to have joined up access to the same information, regardless of where that uh, person might be. So let's look at, this is the actual problem that, that we were really tasked with, with solving. So this is a, a, a sort of use, use case of, of Mary. She's 86. Uh, she has an end of life care plan. She's supported by Mark, who's her informal carer, or her son, in fact. And, and Mary's record is spread across, uh, in this case, uh, four different digital systems and one system that manages part of her care plan on, on paper. This was presenting many challenges uh, across, across London. So to try and really uh, bring this information together and allow everyone to have access to the same information, every time a change was required, there was local changes that need to be, needed to be made in each of these individual systems. Uh, and this needed to be prioritized. Individual healthcare providers needed to prioritize this change. Rachel mentioned earlier about the, the roadmap situation with, with the non-named EPR. It was a similar scenario here. Each of these vendors had to prioritize and roadmap any of that change. And even when some of that change was implemented, there were constraints around uh, the capabilities of making those changes, making interfaces, uh, supporting uh, some of the read and write capabilities. And ultimately, the person was still locked out. Uh, the person didn't have access to this, and their views uh, and making sure that what is important to them was actually most important. Uh, so these were the problems. This was the, the timeline. Uh, so the, sort of, the first two rows are all about strategy, business case approval. Uh, at the bottom is where we got engaged. The contract was signed uh, at the end of uh, December. Uh, we began implementation in January and went live in only seven months. Uh, and a big part of that was down to the technology and open EHR, but also down to the people as well, which I'll come to later. We're also very proud to, to have recently been awarded probably the most prestigious award in the UK, the Digital Health Awards, uh, which, which is a great recognition for, for what the team have done. So how do we do it? Uh, this is a slide just to sort of show you the architecture. Then I've got a couple of slides to actually show you what it looks like. The first thing that we did is, from talking to the users, it was really key that this was not another new system. This needed to integrate into the existing systems. So we've worked really hard across all the EHR vendors across London, some of which are listed here, uh, to establish single sign-on access 
and, and I'll show you an example of what that looks like with, with Cerner on the next slide. But what this means is I still use the system that I use today, uh, but from there I'm able to access uh, this single view of a care plan. We also uh, provide patient uh, and care access. Uh, we're working with uh, NHS England uh, to leverage the, the national NHS app. We've also integrated, it's really important that this system is not another uh, silo. It needs to be integrated into many of the national services across England. So we do that for patient demographics. We get notified uh, on, on certain events, uh, if the patient dies, for example, uh, and various other national services that I won't go into. But the, the key design pattern that we followed is to, to get away from that problem of requiring change within each individual application. We've centralized the application development. So we've got this sort of logical idea of an application canvas, and this is where the care plans are uh, actually built. We then embed those inside the existing EHR systems, uh, which I'll show you in, in a second. And this gives us real flexibility then and gives London real flexibility to make changes and deploy changes without any uh, uh, dependencies on those vendors. The platform and the, uh, sorry, the, the care plans uh, were all built uh, using low code tools. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick look at that in a second. And again, this was part of the, the real accelerated approach, being able to, to develop this without requiring large teams of software engineers, being able to uh, reuse content uh, that already exists, and to be able to share that across teams uh, allowed us to go much faster. All of this then is managed. Uh, we use FHIR for patient demographics, uh, but we use OpenEHR for all the care planning information. Uh, 78% of the archetypes that we needed for this project uh, were available uh, on the CKM. So we were able to get a real leg up uh, and be able to, uh, again, accelerate a lot of that uh, development. And, and London selected OpenEHR uh, really because they've seen it as, as really being the only way to manage complex data like this end of life care planning uh, in a long term persistent format. Uh, based on, on many of their previous experiences. All of this is open APIs that are secured and governed, but provide read and write access, so people can contribute back from any care setting. It's not just a read-only view. And it's all, oh, it's all hosted in the cloud. Uh, so what does it look like? This is a Cerner HIE. Uh, you see along the top there's a, a red banner. Uh, Cerner have integrated with one of our APIs. They do a check to see does the patient have a care plan. Uh, we've also done an integration with uh, 111 and 999, uh, the call handling system. So if you ring through, it'll detect what your mobile phone number is, and it'll check to see does the patient have a care plan. And if they do, we're able to accelerate the triage of that person uh, if they call through. In this case, uh, there's a button that's displayed in the middle of the screen under the shared record system. So a user just uh, will select that, and from there, they're taken into, uh, into the care plan. This is still inside Cerner. The banner at the top is the Cerner banner. The section below the banner is, uh, is, is the care plan. Down the left are the different sections. Uh, we've co-designed this alongside uh, health and care teams, working closely with uh, partners, including Ian, uh, to develop the archetypes and the templates for this. And this allows that this screen allows uh, the introduction of workflow. So being able to manage cohorts of patients who have a care plan, understanding who uh, needs uh, certain review steps to be taken place, and, and really making sure that those pathways are, are managed in a coordinated uh, manner. This is just a quick view of actually how we built the care plan. So this is the low code tools. Uh, we've actually taken a, a data first approach to this as well. So. Down the left-hand side is, is the open EHR archetypes and templates. Uh, those are designed up front together with the clinical teams. There's a whole governance process around that. And from there, we actually build up the forms and the applications from those data models. So we can drag and drop uh, either parts of the, the, the data model or the entire data model onto the screen. Uh, and from there, you're able to introduce access control, business logic, and all the other uh, business requirements that you need. And this allows us to really prototype really quickly, so we can engage with, uh, with healthcare teams, we can make changes really quickly, 
And again, this is all published then in that shared application canvas uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, how did we do it? So technology, as many people say, was the easy bit. It was really only possible through a fantastic team. Unfortunately, this is only a really small uh, subset of the team. Uh, the customer were fantastic, uh, really pragmatic. We had a fantastic group of uh, partners, including Open Air, uh, Restart, who helped us with some integrations. And of course, our own team at, at Better really pulling out all the stops to, to deliver this in, in record time. But actually, why does it matter? What, what are some of the benefits uh, of this kind of solution? Uh, one of the really important things, if you're on an end-of-life pathway, is actually where you choose to die. It's really important for people. Quite often they want to be at home, surrounded by friends and family. These two graphs, just this is independent of people on an end-of-life pathway. This is just deaths uh, on the left for England and on the right for London. So around 46 or 51% of people die in a hospital. Uh, However, people now that have a, an end-of-life care plan across London, that number falls to, to 30%. And all of these people, actually, uh, about half of these people have already opted in to, to die in hospital. So we're already starting to be able to measure the benefit that by making this information available, uh, people are actually able to, to die at home, surrounded by friends and family. Uh, and that's really only possible by making that available to paramedics and to all the, the people that are, are involved in, in their care. So finally, where, where to next? Uh, end of life is really only the start. Uh, London's ambition is to use that underlying platform, so the, the, the data platform and the low-code tools, to build out a range of different use cases. Uh, and, and they're uh, going to try and build this out themselves. So there's a whole program of empowerment and training and transformation uh, that will support them in this. Uh, but using the tools uh, to work back uh, in areas such as uh, some of those shown, maternity, dementia, frailty, diabetes, uh, and again, trying to build that, that cadence uh, to start to bring breadth and depth uh, to the data uh, that's managed by this platform and then uh, is able to flow across London. Thank you. That's all for me. Do we have questions first? Or? Oh, no. No. There's no questions? No questions. No questions. So, hi, I'm super happy to be here today. I also want to thank you guys here. I think you're doing very inspiring work in Catalonia, so I'm very happy to be here and talk about what we're doing at Karolinska. So anyway, so I'm Patrick. Uh, I'm the Chief Medical Information Officer here at Karolinska, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about our journey. And this is a place I always want to start. It's about people. I'm pausing there. It's all about people and what are we doing in healthcare every day? We're making decisions. And what are we basing our decisions on? We're basing it on data. So if we have bad data, we'll make bad decisions. And if we have good data, we at least have the chance to make good decisions. No guarantees, of course. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, and I also want to say that uh, at Karolinska, we're very clear, you can only have one of two jobs at Karolinska. Either you take care of the patient, or you support the people who take care of the patient. Only two jobs. So we have to start with what are we really trying to do. It's a little bit busy slide here, but I think you can benefit from that we walk through it a little bit, because what are we doing in healthcare? Do we understand what we're really trying to do when we go to, to the hospital to care of our patients? So the first thing is we always collect information and document our findings. Then we have to use the information to make decisions. Then the whole care team needs information about who is doing what and when. And then we need information to follow up, both for analytics and all kinds of improvements. And what I want to emphasize here, that if you come from other businesses, not healthcare, you might think, well, an open platform and APIs, that, that's just bread and butter today. But I want to emphasize there's something special about healthcare. And open air is actually modeled on a deep understanding about how healthcare is working. So it's not any open platform. 
It's a platform designed from the ground up to support the way we work in healthcare. I think it's super important to understand that. So this cognitive loop of, health, of clinical care is actually modeled deeply into the open air specification. Um, anyway, we're not there yet. So the information systems of most health care systems really suck, including the ones we have at Karolinska. We, we are improving it, but we're far from where we want to be. And I consciously say information system, not IT system. The information system consists of all the post-it notes, everything we write on the whiteboards, the faxes, all of that. So we really understand the mess we're in. We can't only look into the current EMRs or current IT solutions. We have to look at the whole information system. And then we really see we have big problems. Uh, and then why are we not focusing on this more than we are? This is a problem. We have many good solutions to the wrong problem. I hope you can spot the problem with this solution up here. Uh, it is a good solution, but it's not the wrong, it's the wrong problem. And uh, from my point of view, I'm every day, vendors, clinicians come to me with good ideas, good solutions. They have developed new AI-based decision support, or they have the idea for mobile app, uh, wearables. Uh, the politicians want to, want to buy a new enterprise EHR and cloud solutions. Well, you really just muddy the water because at the base of everything, you need to have good data. Otherwise, we lost anyway. Um, so I want to stop so long here because a lot of other people have talked about this. But just let me say it once and for all. You can't outsource your IT strategy. There's no vendor who can solve this problem for you. So the big monolithic one-stop shop solutions, just please, just put them to the side. Did you hear me? If, if, you, if you hear me here, I can go home. Because there's still many decision makers who think they can buy their way out of this solution by going to an external vendor that can solve all the problems. That's not going to happen. Enough said about that. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about the rest of my time a little bit about the how. Many people have talked about the what. What is an open platform? Uh, how can we use it? And how is it different from our current IT solutions in healthcare? Uh, but now I'm going to talk about the driving force. I, as a CMIO, I really don't give a about effing about open air by itself. I'm only interested in providing better care for our patients. And I think open air is a good tool for that. But it's all about healthcare, it's all about the patients and my colleagues at the hospital. And now I just picked three driving forces that are very important for us at Karolinska at this moment. We're talking a lot about hospital at home, we're talking about precision medicine and, and supporting research and uh, development more efficiently. I'm going to talk briefly about these things just to illustrate how open air and the things you've heard about today can factor into this work we're doing uh, to improve healthcare. Uh, so this is just a brief example. hospital at home. We're working a lot about this because on the left side here, you have to realize that today we have a new situation. We have a lot of uh, streaming data coming into healthcare. We have to be able to make decisions on, for example, a continuous monitoring of the blood pressure or a continuous monitoring of ECG or something like that, uh, which is not traditional EHR data. So it's, it's a complete, it's a different. So we're working a lot on how can we combine this thing into the ecosystem. So, uh, just briefly mention things we are doing right now. I don't have a point with this one. I don't know. Yes, I can. So, the three parts here I want to show you you have to the top left, um, you have streaming data where you have from sensors put onto the patient. And actually, you usually sample that data like 500 times per second. So, you have 500 hertz data coming into the system. <clears throat> something that you traditionally haven't handled within an EHR. And then we have this little thingy over here. We do real-time analytics. But then we're doing a lot of design work around 
at what point and how should that come into the EHR space. Very exciting, actually. Uh, I haven't prepared any, any screenshots, but that could be for uh, next time. But uh, how we can actually get waveform data in here and present it together with other kinds of data. So this is a very exciting space. How can you get real-time streaming data into the EHR system? Uh, and then this is more something I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the traditional telemedicine uh, perspective on this. So we have uh, video uh, meetings with the patients. Uh, patient can send in uh, prompts and other kinds of patient reported data into the hospital. Uh, and this is kind of fun. Uh, we actually do diagnostics at home too. So we can either post by the mail self-test kits, but the data still comes in to the IT environment. Or when a care team goes out to the patient, they also do the testing at home, but the data goes uh, in this direction. So hospital at home is, is like traditional monitoring, the traditional telemedicine perspective, and also diagnostics uh, at home. Uh, so we're doing a lot of that work now and see how it fits in to this space here. Uh, another example uh, is to support uh, cancer treatment. So we have an oncology management system that's existing, and we have a laboratory information system, and then we have, to ha we have a patient report. So the patient have a treatment for several months, for example, and they scheduled uh, cytostatic treatments at regular intervals. And then before each treatment, you have to know, so is the patient doing well enough to be able to receive the next planned treatment? Should we order the medication, yes or no? So now, this is a very simple application. What we do is, the patient is at home, they're reporting how they're feeling, that goes in here. We get the data from oncology management system, we get lab data in here, and then our nurses can look at an overview to see, are the patient ready? Should we plan them for next week's uh, treatment or not? Simple, but very useful. Uh, yeah. So now the next example is from precision medicine. And it's also about bringing other kinds of data into the open area ecosystem. So we have genomics data, and we're actually playing with words here. We have a CDR. We're also building a GDR, a genomic data repository, uh, over here. Uh, I'm not going into that. But I'm just saying that that will also end up in a report using the open air standard as a format to, to, to store the, the report, genomics report in here. And then if, in the imaging environment, of course, the images is a separate standard, DICOM, but we're also working on uh, structuring the radiology reports using open air. So also that's what's coming in here is also based on open air. And then we have in vitro diagnostics. Uh, the same kind of approach. We, I'm just putting MPU in here because we, oh, it's strange because we don't use low ink in Scandinavia, but uh, random information. But also here, the report that goes in from this external system will also be structured based on open air. Uh, that's just a more example than what we've actually done. This is our current EHR. This is our uh, anatomic pathology laboratory information system. This is our RISPAC system from SECTRA. This is our open air based CDR, and these are the national cancer registers that, uh, in Sweden. And we did a fun thing here that worked very well. But Sectra solution is not at all based on open air. But what we did, we gave uh, them an open air based template. They used that, imported it into their form tool, built a form based on that template, and then they saved the report. Uh, using open air out, sent it out from the risk packs into our open air solution. So this is really not at all based on open air. But the data is, the data is input based on open air and it comes out in the form of open air. A very useful design pattern for us at least. Uh, the other example from precision medicine is that here you have uh, the patients with rare disorders. We do whole genome sequencing. Uh, it's really terabytes of data coming out of these machines, and it's analyzed in several steps here. But at some point, you have com to combine it with clinical information about the patient to be able to interpret a uh, gen genomic result over here. And what we're doing here is that we import we write, uh, the, the results from genomic analysis here, 
combined with phenotype data, and then we have what we need to create the report that goes back to the clinicians over here. Uh, just another example how we can use open air in an existing IT environment. Um, but this is a more long-term goal. We're starting serious work now, basically, uh, last week, this week, because we have to the left here several laboratory information systems, and then over here you have very many customers who want to have the lab reports. And then they can use different EHRs, and, they, and sometimes you want to report it to a national patient overview and to the regis and so on. So what we're planning on doing now is to build a vendor neutral archive for the lab reports. Uh, we could talk a lot about this, because I, I see a huge promise uh, using this approach here. Because, for example, in, in clinic, uh, in precision medicine, you have a part of the results come from, from these guys, and another part come from these guys. But these guys over here, they want to have a combined, interactive, multimodal lab report. They don't want one, one report from these guys, one from them, one from them. Over here, they want a combined report. And this is the way you can support that need. So, I don't know, we have two minutes more perhaps. Uh, this is really the, our view, a super conceptual view of a more comprehensive health data platform, where I just want to point out that open air is super important and very foundational, but it's not the whole story. Uh, we work in a lot of waveform data, and there we have a time series based database. For images, we have multimedia archive. For omics data, we're building a genomic data repository. And then, of course, we have more traditional enterprise data warehouse solutions, too. But this, all this has to be a functioning whole. So uh, we're really working seriously to, to make this happen. And we, of course, we're far from finished, but we think this is the way to, to move forward. Uh, um, I'm almost finished. Uh, I just want to point out something I also hear is that people coming with me, how many guys come from tech here? I mean, tech people, okay. So in this space, there's so much selling about, you talk about Kafka queues and Kubernetes clusters and I don't know what. I don't care. I mean, if you don't put the data in correctly to this, from the start, you just have a mess over here. It doesn't matter how many nice new tools you have over here. You can't solve it, it's too late. So, so let's make sure the data is input correctly in the correct way. And this will be quite easy, actually. Uh, my last picture. Uh, it's all about people, it's all about patients, it's not about technology. And I just want to finish with the first thing I heard from an elderly colleague when I was, the first time I was going to go on call at the hospital. He said, there's only two questions you always have to keep track of. And if you do that, you're ahead of 90% of the people. So, number one, do you know what problems you're trying to solve? That's the first question. The second question is, how do you know when you've solved it? So please, can we all keep track of what problems are we trying to solve and how do we know if we have solved it or not? Thank you. And if we could now have the video from Anand, please. Hello all, welcome to Open Air uh, International Conference. I am Anand Jahagidar, working as a principal software architect in Kalkino Healthcare India. I have around 20 years of experience in healthcare domain, architecting enterprise products involving standards like DICOM, FIRE and Open Air. In this session, I will be sharing my experiences about how we are building an oncology data platform using Open Air. Kakinos Healthcare is a purpose-driven technology-led oncology data platform that supports integration of distributed cancer care. Kakinos works on 4D model of detection, diagnosis, delivery, and discovery. The focus is on using uh, research on genomics as a foundation approach for prevention, innovation, outreach approach for early diagnosis and wellness. Care delivery focuses on establishment of participatory systems and near home care. 
discovery is all about drug discovery using research and treatment innovation large scale screening and uh, longitudinal data to build robust ai ml algorithms predictive models and clinical decision support system for real world evidences the increasing availability of biomedical data coming from large biobanks electronic health records medical imaging wearable and ambient biosensors and with the reduction of cost in genome and microbiome sequencing have set the stage for development of multi model artificial intelligence solutions that capture the complexity of human health and disease the integration of a distinct type of data coming from various sources is still a challenge the vision of carkinos data platform is to provide a secure integrated infrastructure to a fragmented and difficult to access laboratory imaging clinical genomics data ecosystem through this multi model clinical data repository the idea is to meet the various opportunities in the area of uh, population health management which includes risk stratification identification of uh, trends and hotspots so that proactive and preventive interventions can be done distributed care management where the idea is to identify the travel time and the wait time analysis for patient distributed care citizen and uh, patient self service includes uh, providing a patient centric longitudinal view of patient health which patients themselves can use to find the next steps on which diagnosis centers they can visit personalized treatment recommendation with large data including genomics it's quite possible now to uh, to provide a discovery diagnosis prognosis personalized treatment and prevention using precision medicine another opportunity is automating clinical guidelines providing intelligent care navigation and with connected knowledge network we can provide predictive analytics for diagnosis disease progression and care plan recommendation so how are we doing this so this is done using uh, open air open air is the building block of multi model clinical data repository which we are building which empowers the clinical professionals to meet their information needs with the support of open air the clinical data repository which we are building provides storing of high quality structured data text and controlled use of terminology so we are doing this by having a team of domain experts oncologists clinical informaticists who are involved in knowledge mapping and encoding process knowledge mapping is all about uh, creating um, uh, clinical factor clinical factor is nothing but a data point which can influence a clinical decision these clinical factors are modeled using open air uh, open air archetypes and an open air uh, template is used to group this all relevant archetypes using archetype designer terminology bindings are also assigned for every clinical factor using pre coordinated snomed ct concept these clinical factors are the foundation for domain conceptualization clinical context and workflow modeling that are essential to build a knowledge base what do we have currently we are using uh, around 100 ckm archetypes as a building block in our uh, clinical data repository around 40 plus uh, templates to arrange these archetypes around 1.3 million ehrs are already created in our open air around 8.8 million compositions are already created in clinical data repository after setting up knowledge base the next focus is on information integration building of a multi model clinical data repository involves ingesting the data 
from various sources of raw data, which includes clinical, laboratory, imaging, genomics. The steps also include uh, extracting biologically and clinically relevant information, persist them in an open air based repository. It also includes mathematical models at the levels of molecules, individuals, and population level. This is all done to have diagnostic inferences and predictions. Finally, all this information is uh, arranged in clinical actionable knowledge, which can be present to customers. The data is uh, stored as a composition, which is mapped to uh, archetypes in open air and open air AQLs are used to extract the data at patient level and also at cohort level. So we are aligning our open air archetype selection and template creation to M code. M code is minimal common oncology data elements. It's a initiative intended to assemble core set of structured data elements for oncology EHR. M code can greatly increase the amount of high quality shareable data for all cancer types, allowing the data to be created once and used multiple times for multiple purposes by clinicians and researchers to support patient care. We are mapping foundational type of oncology data, which includes cancer staging, biomarkers, and the documentation of adverse events, cancer outcomes. All this data is stored in clinical uh, data repository is categorized into six high level domains of M code. You can see uh, all the archetypes mapping to the domains of M code, which includes uh, patient, laboratory, disease, genomics, treatment and outcome. Treatment and outcome. So let me touch upon uh, applications which are built on top of uh, open air based uh, clinical data repository. One uh, application is longitudinal uh, view of patient. The longitudinal data of a patient is built with patient clinical data, which includes diagnosis, medication, uh, procedures, vital signs, everything related to patient. And uh, imaging data includes um, radiology imaging, uh, which includes uh, CT, MRI, uh, bone scan, mammogram, ultrasound, various uh, radiology images. And uh, laboratory data, which includes molecular pathology, liquid biopsy, cytology, cytopathology, histopathology, immunohistochemistry, various uh, data which is coming from laboratory related to cancer. Sequencing of the data, whole genome sequencing, which is based on uh, germline variant sequencing and whole genome sequencing analysis and anomaly detection as well. The another application is, uh, is an implementation of open air based guideline automation, which is a building block of clinical decision support system, CDS. The implementation of CDS is done by um, arranging archetypes, terminology bindings, uh, the GDL rules together using the standards like open air, SNOMED CT and uh, computers uh, interpretable guidelines. The encoding of the knowledge available in the guideline is done by using GDL2 editor, which provides you to create the rules, which is based on open air guideline definition language GDL2. The system is able to provide diagnostic treatment recommendation based on patient data at runtime by invoking the rules specified in the standard guidelines, uh, which includes NCCN or SMO. Using international specifications such as open air GDL2 and SNOMED CT standards, ensure that the CDS which we, have which we have created is interoperable with external system that use open air specification. In summary, the clinical data repository built using open air enables artificial intelligence, machine learning to improve patient outcomes and streamline healthcare processes. 
Additionally, by utilizing big data and predictive analytics, it is feasible to gain new insights into patient health and informed decision making processes. In Carcinos Healthcare, with open air, uh, open air uh, support, uh, we are able to achieve the goal of enabling the data to be shared and combined to drive scientific discoveries and healthcare innovation. Thank you. Amazing the progress um, that we're seeing with open air news talks. So I was like Rachel's introduction there, which was get up there to me to get up for our next talk. So thanks, Rachel. <laughs> Nicely done. Um, hello, I'm back. I brought more jokes. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the work we're doing in Scotland with the National Digital Platform and how open air has been used in, in that environment. I brought a friend as well. Um, for future reference, if you're looking for us later, I frequently wear this uh, very nice Stetson fedora um, as a trendsetter. You should all get one. It also stops me hopefully getting skin cancer at some point in later life. Uh, by contrast, uh, Daniel, my colleague here, rarely has a small child on his back covering his eyes, so don't try and spot him by using that as a reference point. Uh, I told you I had jokes. Okay, we're going to, this, is, this is our agenda, um, which we're working roughly to. Um, I'm going to do kind of the, where we're at from a clinical perspective. Daniel's going to dip into more technical stuff, Daniel being our, our engineering lead. A little bit of background, in case you don't know, Scotland is a country that forms uh, one of the four countries of the UK, um, the United Kingdom. Um, Scotland is the one in blue in this diagram. Um, it's blue because we're in the far north, so typically cold and wet. On the right hand side you'll see another map, um, Scotland we've got lots of hills, we've got some lowlands as well, um, nice scenery, good things to do, but this is a distillery map, so uh, where the whiskey is distilled, so this may be your sole learning from today, you can take it away with you, and if you ever to come to Scotland please come and see our distilleries, and the other nice things, and take an umbrella, and a good jacket. From a governance perspective, um, Scotland is uh, not an independent country at this time, um, but we do have a Scottish Parliament which has devolved powers. Um, a list of these devolved powers is here in what looks like quite a small font. Uh, we don't expect you to read them all. The important thing from the perspective here is that most of health and social care decision making is devolved um, and the, the budgets are devolved. So that means that Scotland, the Scottish uh, Parliament gets to make decisions about spending and policy and so on on, on health. Um, and this um, idea of devolution actually also um, is reflected in our health and social care governance and structures. Now for a country of only five and a half million people, we do seem to have made quite a meal of this. We have an awful lot of uh, structures, um, as you can see here, to try and deliver against um, health and care. Health boards and um, health and social care partnerships have a lot of autonomy uh, to make decisions um, about how they spend the money they're given and how to deliver best in their health care environment in their particular territory. I think fundamentally that's a good thing. Decisions made locally are usually better decisions. But it does mean that the Scottish Government, when it sets policy or strategy, um, can only do so at high levels. So we, we, there isn't a method to say to um, all the health boards, You've got to do this from a technology perspective. You must use these products. You must buy these things. You must adhere to these standards. You can do it through concordance, compliance, and agreement, but you can't impose. So that's by way of background. In the 2018, um, the Scotland came up with the, the Scottish Government, which is the, the delivery arm of the Scottish Parliament, in essence, um, delivered this strategy around digital health and care in Scotland. It's actually a really good document says some really good things, stuff that I was saying earlier, that other people have been saying. Um, it's, it's worth a read. It was quite revolutionary at the time. And this has set the, the tone for the work myself and Daniel are now involved in, because this document said, there shall be a national digital platform. 
um, a national digital platform being a technical architecture to do these things. Oh, sorry, to do these things. Um, moving away from what we were talking about earlier, these full stack, um, uh, tightly bound vendor architectures of uh, EHRs, and moving to a platform. And this is our platform architecture. I've simplified it. <laughs> you, you may have seen, seen this before, but you may not. So it's important just to understand what we mean by platform. In the middle is our platform. Okay? The platform is a bunch of components and services. It's things that let you identify who the caregivers are, who the patients are, secure places to run things, some APIs. Move back from the microphone. Some APIs. Um, and that's where the data stores live. And you may have more, one or more data stores in there. And that's where our open air uh, data store is. And the idea is that above the information platform, you make it easy for developers to come in and build on top because they don't have to worry about how they model blood pressures or bizarre cancer scores or, or frailty scores. That's all done for them in the open air CDR and the other services about how they identify the patients, how they identify the caregivers. We give them all that. So that simplifies the development. You should be able to come in and build apps on top of platform. A flowering of applications that supports the economy, it supports the education, it supports your people um, as well. And underneath we have the existing systems and data sources. That's the uh, integration layer or the interoperability GER layer. I mean, to be fair, we do need interop. I know I was quite down on it last, in my last talk, my initial talk, but we do need interoperability. It's here to stay because these systems often do a very good job within the confines of what they do, and there's a lot of dependency in these systems. So we need to have formal ways of interoperating with them, but it is hard graft to do. It takes a lot of effort and it's expensive. The other point I want to make today is that open air and healthcare architectures are nothing without this stuff. This is from the King's Fund. It's a really good document which explains that if you're really going to do health and care transformation, don't start with your technology, of course. Start with your people, because you need to get the people engaged and find the clinical and care leaders to actually change and transform the service. There's no point in doing the same thing in digital as you've done in paper. You're not improving your productivity, your efficiency, your safety. You're not getting value out of the, the digital solutions. Um, so we. It, it was referred to me using this analogy at one point of um, the health service in Scotland, health and care service in Scotland being like a, a jumbo jet in flight with 500 people on board, 10K up in the air. And what they don't want to have to do is somehow rip out and replace the engines and turn all the seats around with the passengers sitting in them whilst 10,000 feet in the air. That's just not going to work. What would happen? It would crash. And there's a lot of resistance to that change because everything's in flight and very tight, tightly bound to budgets and tightly bound to resources. So how can we transform in that governance environment and with this stuff in flight, people's experience of using healthcare applications, using open standard technologies, open source technologies and um, platform-based approaches. This is uh, Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams. I, 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 I've never seen the movie, I apologize. However, I watched the clip where he said he, He's wandering through a cornfield and he hears a little voice in his head saying he's going to build a baseball, I think, I've not seen the movie, um, a baseball uh, pitch in his cornfield, why not? And he gets this, what I would call an auditory hallucination, but I think it was just a, a story, um, a way of telling the story, where someone's saying, if you build it, they will come. So that, that's kind of our approach. We are um, building stuff, platform services, and delivering some applications and people are now coming to us to say, can we use this? Can we use these services? You demonstrate success and service transformation. And our first app of type, application of type, is supporting this care planning process called Respect, which is um, an artifact of the, um, or a process really, of the UK Resuscitation Council. So it's well validated with lots of discovery and good research. Not just for end of life care, but for emergency care. So, you know, um, if you're knocked over by a bus, this happens, um, and you're unconscious and able to speak to yourself, having a respect plan says, you know, yes, I would actually quite like to go to hospital and have my hip replaced and be resuscitated, thanks very much. So it's about helping people have their wishes expressed when they're incapacitated or um, but for any particular reason. And actually, our respect process in open air started before National Digital Platform, before 2018 strategy with this document, 
which I found in my archives, which is the commission to build an open-air template for respect. And I'm not quite sure how people wrangled this particular one. I think one of the um, digital health leaders was near retirement. Um, I, if you look through the document, you'll find Ian McNichol's name. Maybe he was having some influence. He's, he's ignoring me just now. So that was good. So that, gets, that, that meant that when we kicked off National Digital Platform, we already had some technical artifacts. We had the templates, essentially. essentially. We'd done through the review sessions with people from UK Research Council, from palliative care leads, and other specialist clinicians to do the review rounds using Clinical Knowledge Manager, um, which enables that collaborative way of developing uh, clinical models. We also had great clinical leadership, and Lindsay Fielden, who's still working with us, an old age, me old age medicine consultant in the lovely new Fourth Valley Royal Hospital in Larbert, um, in, in uh, Stirlingshire. Um, and we had good technical support from that. And um, this, the picture here is actually from a few years ago, so some of these people are no longer with us, not, not that they're passed away, they're just no longer working in the organization. Um, <laughs> and Lindsay is in the middle, the middle there. So um, the point being, if you're going to do this, you have to have that good clinical leadership because we, we can't solve the problems of service transformation. Given the technical tools, but how you get that into your environment, how you get people using the application, how you get it to look after patients, what do they need, how can it work? That needs to come from people on the ground. These are the technical artifacts we're currently using. These are the, the, this is the Respect version 3 template, which is available in the UK's Aperta Clinical Knowledge Manager, which is a local, uh, national, national level uh, clinical knowledge manager positive for local models. And this is the application we built, um, which has still been developed and still getting new features and functionality. And radically, I know it seems weird, but radically it's the only care plan in Scotland that anyone other than patients at this time, but anyone of the care provision people can contribute to with appropriate governance, of course. So, Historically, only GPs have been able to create the national care plan, care plan for patients in Scotland, and that just puts the onus on GPs to update records on behalf of everyone else, and that never works, in my experience. So this has been a good success, but it's a slow burn. It's, it builds up slowly. We have interest and in, in use already in these uh, health boards, Fourth Valley. Tayside is a really big implementation. That's where Dundee is. Um, uh, just give, hopefully give you some context. And then even small places like Western Isles, where there's a couple of uh, Macmillan nurses, that's cancer specialist nurses, who are leading on the, the deployment there because the GPs are too busy, so they're doing it, and they're using the digital app. Um, and we've got lots of interest from other boards, Air and Iron, Grampy and Orkney. So, so if you build it, and it works, and they see the value, they come to you and say, hey, can we get in here? We see the success. Growth has been slow, but going up. We're averaging about two to four new respect plans a day. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it builds. And we're up to now 1,000 plans um, on the system, and the respect system uh, at the moment, continuing to grow as more boards come on. So that means 1,000 people have had their care improved, I hope, and certainly delivered or influenced by the data technology that we've supported and delivered and built on and open air at its core. Um, the Respect app has, gets around 17,000 API calls per day, um, and it's running on the open source version of Airbase, EHRBase, um, uh, at, this, at this time. So uh, Dan's going to talk more about the architecture in detail. I'm just putting this slide up to say to you, it, it's not as simple as taking a CDR, an open CDR, and just going plonk and into your um, technology architecture. There's a whole lot of other complexity around it, because when you build platforms, you need to glue all that stuff together and, and have a strategy for doing so. But it is a key component. Our next steps to expand and scale up the CDR are probably going to be around medical devices. This is longitudinal data that probably matters to you. If you had a pacemaker inserted or a hip replacement done, um, you might want, as a patient, to eventually know what brand that was, what the serial number was, just in case you know, there was a recall and um, you know, you're out of the country and you weren't told. You know, that, that data should be patient-centric, not system-centric. Um, so we've got, working with colleagues in National Services Scotland, a technology delivery arm uh, for Scotland as well, um, we're building this, uh, or helping them to create this data repository for medical devices focused on patients uh, and individuals. And we've done the data model for that. So that's it. You probably all, a lot of you probably were familiar with the slide protect technologists about agile development. And it is what we're doing. We are 
gradually build, giving a little product that works, getting feedback, finding leaders, build a bit more that works, get feedback, build it up, broadcast success, service transformation, more stuff on platform, and the EHRs for individuals in Scotland supporting data, and the more data we have on there that's successful and demonstrates value, the, the surer we are of the success of the foundational EHR open air platform going forward. So I'm going to hand over to Daniel, if I've not rambled on for too long, and he's going to tell you a bit more about the technical aspects of that. Cheers. Hello, hola, buenos dias. Um, I, I, don't, I can't promise that my um, accent is uh, more or, or less legible than Paul's, but if I'm speaking too fast or you can't cut through it, just give me some sort of signal and I'll slow down. Um, so, um, hello, thanks for having me. Thanks to the organisers, thanks to the hosts in the university. I'm very glad to be back in Barcelona. It's my fifth time here, my first time for work. It's... Um, <laughs> I'm already being signalled, I think because of the position of the mic and not because of my accent. Um, it's my fifth time here, it's one of my favourite places in the world. I would have taken any excuse to come here, but this was a particularly good one. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about um, us as the NES Technology Service and, and also about the, the National Digital Platform and, and expand on some of the, the points that Paul's already touched on. Um, so we are historically, NES is historically the, the education and training body within Scotland um, and that was historically where our remit was as a technology body within NES as well, so providing learning platforms and technology that enables uh, the training of doctors and nurses and midwives and the like. Um, with the, the documents uh, Paul touched on, the digital health and care strategy, we moved more into the direct provision of technology um, into the service. And, and over that time, we built up quite a capability in a lot of the areas that you would need to deliver that. So um, software engineering, um, that, that's kind of my background. I was one of the the people that put their hand up when we asked if they were the techies and I apologise in advance because I'm going to mention Kubernetes at some point. I wasn't going to mention Kafka but I think I'll throw it in now just to fulfil the stereotype. Um, and we also have product management and, and clinical support in, in the form of the likes of Paul but um, I, I think we're certainly not the norm in the public sector and in the, the delivery of uh, public uh, technology within the public sector, not just when within health, but more broadly, and that we do have quite a, a broad capability in terms of delivery, and, and that affects the approach that we take and, and the solutions that we choose. Um, so this is broadly our approach. Paul's already uh, touched on uh, something of the, the value of the NDP um, and the open standards that I've listed there. You'll see it's, it's foxes that, that John uh, touched on um, earlier, and we have various levels of maturity uh, across those standards. Um, I, I'm going to add another O to FOXES, we'll maybe call it FOXO, or someone can think up a better acronym, because that's what this industry needs, is more acronyms. Um, and the, the extra O is OIDC, which, uh, because what we found is that access control and security kind of sits at the centre of the platform. Um, and it, it, it pervades all those standards and, and all the elements of the platform. And, and on the platform mindset, um, we are um, we're trying to, to build that mindset within the system. Um, Rachel earlier said about like finance colleagues um, saying just, just do it the quickest way, or sorry, it was the cheapest way, because they're finance. Um, it was the cheapest way, and cheap can often mean quick, and they can often mean the same thing, but that, that mentality still pervades, and sadly, the cheapest way and the quickest way often correlates with the way it's been done before, the way it's been done with a big monolithic system, the way it's been done with an existing provider who has a vested interest in the system. So we, as well as building the platform, we're trying to build that mindset into the system and that um, you need to go a little bit further than the minimal viable product because you need to, you need to leave the platform better than you found it um, as you built. Um, so this is a, a very zoomed out uh, map of what we have. I've, I've, I've um, 
sorted some of the services within the National Digital Platform into some categories here. So we have services that are focused on the security of the platform, on, on hosting and modelling data, on integration, it's apparently a bad word now, um, and then infrastructure, the compute and the, the storage that sit underneath um, all of this. Um, zooming in a bit, I can, I can touch on a few of these, I won't go over them all. Um, we have a service catalogue because we want um, people across the system to be able to come to the NDP and, and be able to know what it does, and know what it can do for them, um, and understand the data that it holds in the form of a, a data catalogue. A service like um, NDP Launchpad, um, that recognises that there's many le legacy systems and many contexts from which a clinician or a, a service user may um, want to come into the NDP. So if they're using their EPR within their hospital, um, they can essentially have a deep link into an NDP system so that they're not rekeying information such as patient demographics. Um, and then we start to get into more developer-focused infrastructure um, layer um, services, and this is where I get to mention Kubernetes. So our, our, our common runtime environment um, is, uh, among many things, is a, is a Kubernetes cluster. A, a Kubernetes, for those that aren't aware, um, is a container-based um, solution to standardizing compute. You could say that um, containerization in Kubernetes is to uh, that compute layer of infrastructure as open air as the clinical data, right? It tries to make it modular um, and transferable um, and standardized. Um, so in our view that um, where we offer open air for uh, people to come in and model their data in that way, we also, also, we also offer um, a standardized way to come in and host your solutions um, if that's what the service needs of us. Um, below that layer, we've got some data storage, so uh, clinical structured data services, that's where open air would fit in. Um, we also have fire services, we have SNOMED, we have uh, now a national uh, SNOMED terminology server that our colleagues at NSS run that's provided by Daedalus. Um, and uh, we have um, workforce data and access control. Getting the right data on a workforce, which you would think would be easy because we are the training body, so we are the kind of front door into the service for a lot of clinicians and a lot of people that join the workforce. Getting that data is absolutely critical to being able to do um, mature and appropriate access control. You need to know who's trying to access the data as well as knowing what data they're trying to access to be able to make a decision about whether they can access it. But uh, still, we find just getting the data on our workforce is, is quite a hard thing. Um, and below the, below the fold, so to speak, we've got uh, kind of all the mess of the existing legacy that, that we still need, will need to integrate with and will need to integrate with for the foreseeable future, um, such as uh, GPIT systems um, and existing integration platforms. It's something um, uh, integration platforms are something that seem to be very popular. It, it's maybe a legacy of where we thought interoperability was the problem over the last few decades. There, there are a lot of different integration platforms in there, and in my short time in the NHS Scotland, I've, I've already came across probably five or six. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a, a broad overview of the National Digital Platform. Uh, coming back to the respect architecture that Paul showed earlier, I can uh, bring it to life somewhat. Um, in the middle there, you've got that common runtime environment. Um, in this case, um, everything uh, in the National Digital Platform is hosted on AWS, so beneath the covers, that's using AWS's Elastic Kubernetes service, which is a, a managed um, service for running Kubernetes. Um, and that's where our APIs run. That's where we provide services like monitoring and alerting, again, to make the developer's job easier. Um, and then below and outside of that, we start to see some common patterns that um, as, we, as we deploy more applications on the International Digital Platform, we see these common patterns of how open air uh, interfaces with other systems. So in this case, you've got a pattern of wanting to take some structured clinical data, and I realize this might be sacrilege, push it into an unstructured format, because that's the way that clinicians maybe currently work, and in, in this case it is. Our, our GP systems rely quite a lot on unstructured data and letters um, to be able to get the data that's not compatible currently with their GPIT systems. So we uh, take that structured data 
uh, we generate a PDF and then we send that off to the existing document stores. And as, as these um, patterns start to uncover themselves, we, um, we try and integrate them into the platform and that's the idea of kind of the, the evolution of a platform. It's not something we're going to build up front and it's going to be a done thing. It's going to be informed by the use cases that come along. And um, just so that I can throw Kafka in there, that's another, that's another one of those, those patterns and it's interesting, some of the stuff you showed from Sweden where um, there's been a move from a kind of batch-based data integration is what I'd call it, where the, the latency that you can expect is for your data to be kind of synchronized overnight um, to API and more real-time-based pooling the data that you need. But I think the next stage is probably into a more asynchronous event-based architecture. I, I, I say that as the next step. I think it's we're still probably five years off from seeing it really uh, permeate, but I, I think Technologies like Kafka, just to say it again, um, are, are, <clears throat> are maybe the, the solution there. Um, I wanted to mention things that aren't on open air for, for reasons, really, reasons. Um, so one of the other services that we run within NES is uh, the National Clinical Data Store for Vaccines. Um, this was a, a project that was very quickly spun up in response to COVID. I'm sure many people in this room had similar experiences. And in that case, it was a case of do it in the quickest way, not the cheapest way. There was plenty of money going around for COVID response, but this was do it in the quickest way. And so what we ended up with, because of the place we were in our maturity with open air and open air on the platform, we didn't use open air. And we instead went for an architecture that um, used fire for persistence um, and that um, us, us having access to the cloud and being able to deploy resources quite quickly was a great accelerator there. And we used Amazon's um, RDS um, service to get a scalable database set up, develop an API layer based on Happy Fire, I believe, um, and, and store, that, uh, store that vaccinations model. Um, so what's next for uh, the National Digital Platform in Scotland? Um, we've got some big programs of work. One of them is uh, known as Digital Front Door. So a similar idea to the NHS app in England, the idea, um, and you can see the, the manifesto commitment quoted there, um, to develop a safe, simple and secure app that will help people access services directly and own their own health information. Um, so that, this sort of uh, patient-centered record um, that would sit behind that and then the services that would sit on top of that in terms of um, identity verification or what would form a digital front door. So we very much see it as a new platform, a new patient-centered platform that will sit on top of the services of the National Digital Platform. Um, there are other, that are always, as Paul said, with the, the aeroplane analogy, that are always um, umpteen, to use a, a Scottish term, umpteen, um, major programs um, in flight within Scotland, and one of them is digital prescribing and dispensing, which is a large program to um, basically do away with the wet signatures and, and change the way in which medicines are prescribed in Scotland. So that's some of the, the new workloads. Um, what's next for open air on the NDP? Um, we need those new workloads. Uh, Paul mentioned um, medical devices, medical implants. Um, we need those new workloads because um, the, the workload that we currently have for open air on the NDP is of a certain scale that's, like Paul said, a thousand records. A, a medical device use case would probably take us to tens of thousand records, right, that next order of magnitude. And, and we need, we, we want to take that evolutionary kind of measured approach to prove out the technology and build the services um, in the direction that we need them. Um, so we need um, scale and stability, essentially, from our solutions. Um, scale, as I mentioned, because we ideally would like to take a workload like vaccines, which obviously has records for almost everyone in Scotland. You're talking millions of records. We'd like to host that on open air, and we'd like the, the, the data to live within open air. Um, but we need to we need to walk that path carefully because we need to have stability. We can't risk kind of damaging the. The, the reputation of open air as a um, solution within Scotland, um, and so we need to take that measured approach. And, and ultimately, if we can get to that um, place of stability that we're happy with, then we can start to build awareness um, and start to put the, the tools that sort of Ian mentioned in terms of no code and low code tools, we can start to put those tools into the hands of clinicians once we build that awareness. 
Um, and how are we going to get there? To quote the song with a little help from our friends, which is all of you. I hope I'm not being presumptive in calling all of you our friends. Um, but I've, I've certainly even just sitting here and listened to the last few talks. I've, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot from, um, from talking to you all in the kind of in the hallways um, and from the, the talks earlier this morning uh, and from all the writing that everyone puts out. There's, I couldn't name them all, but um, Alistair, Ian, there's, there's numerous people in the room who are, are quite prolific writers in this space. And um, I've certainly appreci appreciated that learning personally and we've appreciated it as an organisation. And, and we hope to, to give that back as, as we learn and, and, and give in talks like this. Um, and we hope to have partnerships, both with the, the public and private sector. I don't think we can continue to build this um, open air on the national digital platform ourselves. Um, and yeah, we'd appreciate um, if anyone feels they have something that they could offer um, us and some of the challenges we're facing, we'd appreciate talking to you. Um, so yeah, that's me. Um, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am very happy to be in my first open air conference. Uh, also, say to thank you to Jordi, Paul, and Xavier for inviting us today and also to the, all the open air board for the very, very useful conference. And uh, I, I am Miguel Pedera from the Hospital Universitario 12 de Octubre in the Madrid region uh, of Spain. I am the head uh, of the data science unit of the hospital and of the research institute. And I want to uh, tell you about our Infobanco project, uh, uh, being also the first implementation of the open air uh, in the Spanish national health system, and uh, share with you uh, our very optimistic results about the, the use of this standard. And also, because I am the last of this session, I can say that we, I uh, see many common points with all the data platform of the other uh, uh, people in this session, so it is very good because we uh, achieve the same conclusion in different uh, point of the of the count of the world. So very very nice. So uh, as a very brief introduction about uh, about us, uh, we are a public hospital with with more than 1,000 beds. Uh, we are located in the south of the region of uh, of Madrid, and we. We uh, give uh, healthcare to uh, around 500,000 uh, patients. So in the digital health area, we have the certification of uh, EMRAM, the, the stage six uh, of the HIMSS organization. So it shows that we are a uh, strong hospital in the uh, medical informatic uh, issues. And also in the, our research institute, we create uh, recently two new um, groups, one digital health uh, research group and one data science unit for also uh, make research and innovation and also implement and give data service to other organizations for healthcare and also for secondary users. So we are also not uh, new on, on this, on this uh, area in the health data. We have a long history of innovation in this, um, in this area. Uh, we start uh, making a national project around 2010-2016. Uh, project more focused on the modeling and the formalization of the information, but we also talk in this time of archetypes with ISO 13606, also with other uh, friends from Barcelona, from Clinic, also from uh, Instituto de Salud Carlos III. And uh, in the 2017, we start to implement a real project using this uh, methodology. We start also in the European uh, project, uh, uh, focus first in the clinical trial, like the EHR4CR project and in other IMI projects. And in the 2018 also we uh, participate in other European projects, uh, like uh, Insight Platform, uh, that then also was the Trinetics Platform, and other IT Health project, and we continue with the national project. In the, next, in the uh, next years also we continue with this kind of consortiums for data, for example the Eden, also using in this time, uh, first time the OMOP CDM model, and also uh, other projects like the ISOM standard set projects, etc. And in the 2020, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, come to our life. So we uh, put all our effort in this new condition and all the uh, methodology and process and 
knowledge that we produce in the uh, past years, we can apply uh, in a real uh, big uh, problem in this condition and uh, be able also in this time to uh, make real interoperability and real reuse of the data with full uh, meaning in different projects like the uh, also Eden for COVID-19 pandemic, but also other uh, research projects like ISARI Consortium or 4 ce uh, Consortium for uh, COVID-19. And finally, in the 2022 and now in this uh, last year, we uh, saw that this process is very useful, but uh, it is uh, based on ad hoc process, so we need to implement a real platform who centralize and industrialize all these uh, different process uh, and we designed and we are implementing now the InfoBanco platform. That it is uh, what I want to tell in this uh, presentation and also how we use open air in this uh, project. So our uh, use of data in the organization uh, it is uh, it follows uh, also uh, the European data strategy uh, based on the health data space and we uh, design our strategy based on this uh, pr uh, this big uh, project and also in the uh, use case that it is proposed for this uh, space so uh, our strategy uh, make an answer to the artificial intelligence uh, project also precision medicine evidence generation also based on the real world data uh, value-based value -based care and also the public health surveillance. So, uh, based on these uh, lines of work, we design and we implement a methodology for uh, make efficient and agile uh, reuse of the EHR in any um, purpose. Of course, uh, use also in the healthcare uh, process, but also for any other uh, purpose that demand this data. So in this new new paradigm that we are uh, trying to implement, the EHR is in the middle of the process. It is the heart. The EHR uh, properly modeled and formalized with uh, standards. And then from this uh, healthcare information system, we can produce in a extension transformation and loading process any other uh, data output in any format that uh, we need for other projects, like for example, clinical trials, uh, case report forms or uh, artificial intelligence uh, model training. We also publish this uh, methodology in several papers. You have two of them in this slide. And we continue uh, improving this and validated this methodology. So based on this methodology, we uh, designed this platform, InfoBanco platform. It, this first slide is about the uh, technical architecture. InfoBanco uh, has uh, as data source all the uh, information system of the, in this case of the Madrid region, EHR, but also public health system and secondary use system, for example, research or um, cost systems. It's come to the uh, platform into, uh, through uh, standardized uh, interfaces, and then it is centralized in a data lake. In this data lake, we uh, obtain the raw data, and also it is prepared for the uh, use of this data. And then, based on other systems like archetype repository, terminology repository, and also ETL repository, we uh, create different uh, persistence and interoperability output. The main one is the open air uh, output, who is for, of course, persistent and for primary use. But from this open air repository, this open air CDR, we can obtain also other output more specific, like OMOP repository, I2B2 repository, more focused on the secondary use and also uh, um, create uh, exchange formats uh, like uh, HL7 Fire, CDISC uh, um, also for research, and ISO 13606 uh, standard. So for in, from this platform, we can uh, obtain data from the raw uh, source and then transform into any standard that we need for uh, the use of this data. In this platform, it's very important uh, the governance of the inform of the uh, every part of the platform. The first one is uh, what I am more involved in the governance of the information models, and we talk more about this in this session. For example, how we model this information, which uh, which uh, methodology for model and formalize this uh, concept, and also what standard uh, have to be adopted for the uh, platform. But also, for example, the governance of the data source is very important. How uh, is uh, request the access to a new system in the, for the platform, and also what requirement uh, must be this uh, information system 
and how we prioritize the load of new system in the platform. Also technical and security uh, issues, like how is the service kept operational, and also what, uh, what technical and legal security requirement must it meet uh, for give uh, real service to the organization. And finally, the governance of the uh, data access and use of the uh, platform. It is under what criteria can data be request to the, to the technical people and also how our project to be developed, prioritized. No? So it is very uh, many different areas of the governance. As, as I said before, I will put the focus in the first one because it is my field and also it is uh, more related to open air. But for, uh, all of them are uh, important uh, for um, real, real implement a real uh, useful data platform. So uh, in this, um, in this um, topic about the, what, what is the good standard, uh, we really think that it is not a uh, only a standard for every uh, purpose. We uh, are lucky because we have many different standards that, that the biomedical informatics uh, give to us. So we have an agnostic approach of the use of this standard. Also, my, the people of this, um, this table also say before, we have to use uh, each standard for the purpose for what they were designed. It, is, it sounds easy, but I think it, it takes years to be understand, and now I think we are in the, in the right way. So, we, uh, for, um, we classify the purpose in, two, in four uh, big uh, areas, knowledge modeling, data persistence, data query, and data exchange, and also in two uh, purpose for use, uh, second, primary healthcare and also secondary, other that is not uh, the healthcare of the patient. So as you can see, for example, in the, uh, open air, uh, we um, decide that in our platform it is useful, of course, for the knowledge modeling, for primary and also for secondary use, and also for the data persistence, and data query retrieval uh, for primary use and also use, useful in the secondary use, but we have other standards more specific like OMOP and I2B2 that can be also obtained from the open air repository. And of course, in the data exchange for the primary use, the preferred standard is uh, HL7 uh, FIRE, and uh, it is also possible to uh, obtain uh, that, um, uh, EHR extract uh, based on FIRE from open air repository. Also, we uh, publish now uh, a preprint with other uh, uh, friends from the uh, Spain and international about this um, approach, how we think that this different standard have to be uh, used together. So uh, this slide uh, show a more, um, not technical, but uh, the different um, data uh, access uh, service that Infobanco uh, provides. We divide in four, in four big um, uh, service, and then it is uh, uh, also um, divided in more specific clinical business service. But in this, uh, you can see the uh, first one is the case report forms, the automatic population of a specific research database for uh, be able to uh, put uh, data in our uh, database of researchers, and they don't have to make a manual data entry of 100% of the data that it is uh, yeah, uh, recorded in the EHR system. Also, the implementation of real-world data repositories, for example, OMOP, CDM, or I2B2. Also, the training and the validation of artificial intelligence uh, models for decision support. Uh, also, Infobanco have to provide data sets for this uh, purpose. And finally, also uh, provide data for implement a clinical dashboard for the visualization of aggregated data for clinical management. So in this slide, uh, we divide uh, this big uh, technical service in more specific uh, clinical service that we provide to our, um, to our professional. For example, knowledge modeling, uh, CRF data loading, uh, real-world data repositories, standard data exchange interfaces, cohort identification, predictive artificial intelligence for clinical decision support system, phenotype and genotype combination, comprehensive EHR viewer, and also clinical pathway management. As, as you can see in this slide, OpenAir really play a leading role in this uh, platform. For example, for the knowledge modeling, the, the standard selected is OpenAir, but also for the different, uh, more related to secondary use uh, service, we use of the other standard like OMOR, I2B2, or CEDIS, but OpenAir is the data source for obtaining these different, uh, these different standards and 
uh, formats. Also for the exchange interface, uh, we use HL7 Fire as preferred standard, and also ISO 13606, but also it is obtained from the OpenAI repository, and then for all the specific uh, more uh, exploita exploitation and analytic uh, um, service, we use di directly the open air and the, with using the better platform. And just for the clinical pathway management, we use uh, Microsoft Power BI, but also it can be, this data can be obtained from the open air repository. So as you can see in all the service, open air is or, or, the, or the standard use or the uh, standard uh, CDR uh, data source for the other more specific standard or uh, tool. So uh, in this slide, uh, we show how is our current implementation of the uh, open air in the Infobanco platform. We divide uh, this in four indicators, uh, the number of uh, archetypes from the CKM that we uh, load in the platform, the number of the information system that we load in the CDR, the volume of individual patient, and also the volume of record. So in the current result now, when I prepared this uh, presentation one week ago, we have uh, 35 uh, uh, archetypes in the repository. We, um, we include two different information systems, the EHR from the hospital and also from primary care. Uh, now, in this uh, technical uh, approach uh, for um, proof of concept, we load uh, 500 patients and also a volume of record of 24,000 uh, uh, records, but also uh, when the first part of the project is finished in June 30, we don't change the number of archetypes and the number of systems, but we uh, will load all the, all the patients of the hospital and our area of healthcare. It is for uh, 450,000 patients, and also uh, the volume of record will be all the EHR from the hospital and the primary care of Madrid. And finally, when the, we start to operate the platform and we start to uh, also um, uh, implement in other hospitals of the region, we expect also to load all the CKM architects that are validated for the community. And of course, uh, all the information system uh, that conform the uh, EHR ecosystem of the Madrid and all the, all the uh, population near to 6 million uh, patients and also all the record that this patient, that uh, it is, of course, very, very amount of information. Also in this uh, point, I also want to uh, say thank you to the, uh, all the company who uh, joined us to the, this open air adventure, like uh, Entity Data, Veratech, and Rea Group, and also, as I said before, the better platform that we implement in the Infobanco uh, platform. And finally, I will uh, show two specific uh, use cases where open air is the the uh, center of the design. The first one is the phenotype and genotype combination uh, for the precision medicine uh, service that we provide in the platform. So uh, in the Infobanco, we uh, centralize data from the EHR and also from the laboratory information system, who, uh, which include uh, genetic data and genomic data more specific, uh, in a raw format in the data lake. So uh, in this process from the data lake, uh, we uh, also can make a visualization of the data uh, direct from the uh, data lake, but we uh, make a transformation to the harmonized repository of the better platform based on open air. In this open air uh, platform, we also uh, include two uh, templates that we create based on CKM archetypes. Uh, one for the, we call patient summary or, or phenopacket, and also the uh, genomic report template that our clinical staff uh, uh, design uh, based on open air, but also based on the data element from the OMOP and FIRE. Uh, and uh, we load these um, archetypes in the archetype server of the open air platform. And then uh, we can, uh, of course, uh, uh, make a query to this uh, open air platform for uh, take data uh, combina combinating uh, phenotype and genotype, but also we transform this through a ETL process to other uh, platform like uh, or a standard like OMOP, I2B2, or REDCap databases, and also with the um, interface, interface for exchange, we also transform this data to uh, HL7 FIRE and uh, CEDIX standards, and also in the, with the FIRE, we implement also the uh, phenopacket specification. And finally, the last uh, more specific use case is the transformation that we are uh, implementing now from open air to OMOP CDM. We are designing and, implement, and implementing this ETL process 
from the different uh, data lake domain that we define in our uh, organization. It is a big, um, big concept like patient encounter, observation, diagnosis, medication, and procedure. And then it is uh, based on different uh, archetypes from the CQM. And also we map uh, each uh, of these uh, archetypes to the different OMOP CDM tables that uh, we use in our uh, data ecosystem. For example, for the patient uh, domain in the data lake, we use uh, different uh, archetypes like person, gender, ethnicity, birth summary, and death summary. And then all of this uh, information based on these archetypes is transform transforming uh, to uh, two OMOP tables, uh, person and death. We do this for all the all the archetypes and all the domains. And as I said before, we load 500 pages in this time, but we are now, uh, we can now uh, load the 400,000 pages of the hospital in the open air platform and also to the, uh, transform into the OMOP CDM repository. And I think that it is all. Uh, thank you so much for the attention. And now we answer the, the question. <laughs> Thanks so much to all of the panelists. And I think we're running a little short of time for questions. So I'd encourage everyone to find people during lunch and ask them about the presentations. Um, that was fantastically rich. It felt like a, a mini tour of the world. So thank you so much for that. Next up, we've got uh, our industry keynote. So if our panelists would like to go and take a seat, that would be great. I'd like to welcome Stefan Schraps, who is VP um, for Business and Community Management at Vita Group. So, welcome, Stefan. So, thank you very much. I guess I'm standing in between you and lunch. Or I'm actually quite happy that I'm not speaking directly after lunch, so the challenge would have been even bigger. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you with great enthusiasm and appreciation for the innovative spirit that has brought us here all together at this remarkable, beautiful city of Barcelona. It is an honor to address such a distinguished audience and share my thoughts on a topic that is close to my heart. The importance of open source for the breakthrough of open air. Now that was a boring start, right? <laughs> so sorry for that, I asked ChatGBT uh, to write me an introduction to uh, this keynote speech. Uh, so I put this away and actually go through uh, in a little different way. Uh, but as a matter of fact, it's actually true. Uh, it is coming from my heart what I'm talking today about, and uh, I hope you will realize that this is actually true. So, happy anniversary, 20 years, open air. Come on, this is actually something. <laughs> so I guess we are, uh, from the tech stack, uh, we are now grown up, right? Uh, so we passed the 18 years and uh, we are now adults. Uh, now, but seriously, uh, I think um, if you look back, uh, no one would probably believe that um, uh, open air has meanwhile turned 20. And thanks to people like David Ingram, Thomas Beal, Sam Hurd, uh, who had this vision 20 years ago, uh, we're sitting here. We wouldn't be sitting here if uh, these people wouldn't have this vision. So I think also to them a great appreciation here. So give your applause. <laughs> and I must also say uh, the question is, are we really there yet? Are we, you know, have met all the things that we all believe in? Uh, you know, in a way, it's uh, you know a no-brainer today because you're sitting here because you believe in open air as the de facto standard uh, that where it should be belonged to. On the other hand, I believe that uh, you know, in a way, uh, there's still a way to go. And if you allow me, I would like to you know take an analogy historically. Uh, what? went wrong or what uh, were the challenges, uh, you know, in a completely different area. 
And I must say, it, you know, I, I don't want to ask the question who's older than 55, but you need to be 55 and older to understand what I'm talking about. And I will give a little bit for the younger ones, I will give a little bit of insights what this is all about. I don't know, who remembers the, the war for formats for Betamax versus VHS? Um, so this is a format warfare that took place in the late 70s. And uh, on the left side you see Sony, uh, who came up with uh, you know, the video recording format. Uh, and actually there was a third one for uh, Gründig, or uh, uh, CVH, and, uh, but let's keep it simple here. I just want to talk about those two formats. So Sony came up in 1975 uh, with the third, first video recorders and videotapes. And uh, they had really quite an impressive, back then, price-value ratio. They were earlier in the market. They had, technology-wise, they were superior. They had higher resolution, better colors, everything. And their goal was to be you know, defining and setting the industry standard. And on the right side, you see JVC, who came later, just one year, but still. Uh, and they came up with longer recording times, or, and or, so they had, you know, in their uh, first uh, release, basically, 120 minutes uh, recording time, versus on the Sony side or, uh, and Betamax, it was only 60 minutes. And or, uh, they were download compatible. Now, and, or, I will, you know, draw some... You know, I don't want to talk about uh, video recording, but you will see the analogies to OpenAI in a minute. Uh, so the question is, uh, what are the lessons that we can learn, basically, why didn't succeed Betamax videotape format uh, in regards of, you know, being early on market, having a better price ratio value, uh, you know, better quality technology-wise, and they still didn't make it. So in a new way, you need to understand, you know, one uh, reason for that is, uh, 60 minutes versus 120 minutes. I, even, even back then, uh, movies lasted at least 120 minutes. So there was no meaningful reason for an end customer to have a recording tape uh, where you, in the middle of the movie you needed to exchange the tape and you know, have a second tape in this. So this was a very, very large uh, reason why end users didn't accept this. And, uh, you know, over the time, then Sony realized this, they came up with a new format, uh, and, and they had, like, 360 minutes. And all of a sudden, you know, this came up, and, uh, you know, a big problem, it wasn't downward compatible. And the end users, actually, had to pay an awful lot of money uh, for the video recorders. It was, for German, uh, you know, like 3,000, 4,000 Deutschmarks, and 2,000 euros now today, which was really, really, really expensive. So the end customers actually waited for a very, very long time and, or, you know, because they didn't want to make the wrong choice on which format they wanted to follow. And I think this is actually quite uh, interesting if you actually see this, or, uh, that uh, you know, on the left side, uh, you know, they've done pretty much everything right, but they forgot the end user. They forgot really the target audience they wanted to address and they missed some items actually, and they couldn't make it uh, because JVC uh, was actually, you know, uh, with, a, with a better model in, uh, in the market. One other reason was also in regards to um, the licensing model. Uh, Sony was, back then, was quite arrogant, and they said, uh, you know, uh, in order to uh, be, be in the market, uh, there are very, very strict licensing rules in regards of, uh, you know, you need to be a manufacturer in the local market and all these kind of things. JVC at this time was desperate for money, so they had a loose licensing stream, uh, schema and they said, okay, we just flood the market or everybody can make it. Uh, and, and so they, all of a sudden they were superior. So if you look at this, and now I'm coming to the learnings to this. Why did VHS really win the battle over the right format? So five principles. Principle number one, the first player on the market does not always win. That's the saying, the second mice gets the cheese. And in a way that's true, the timing needs to be right. You need to be at the right place at the right time. And I think for OpenAI, we are at the right time, at the right place right now. Uh, but we still, you know, I think we can all agree on the what but on the how, how do we actually manage to get there, how to, 
uh, you know, have conversions and, and migration paths defined. Uh, that is really something which is, you know, under dispute because that's not really obvious how you actually, you know, which is the right path. Second principle, the needs of the customers are decisive. Even today, I've seen a lot of architectural pictures and uh, you will see also an architectural picture from my, me later on. So uh, I'm, I'm, you know, alike uh, all the other presentations just a little, little bit later. However, it's not enough if you just talk technology. If you just talk about, you know, the best API, the best uh, formats in regards of coding principles and these kind of things. It's really what matters is what we have to offer to the end user, to the customers, to the target audience. They need to understand why they should implement OpenAir as the de facto standard for persistence. We all know that, but we are very often argument from a technical perspective. And I think we should convert this around. The technical parts are a must have. They should meet basically the needs of finding a solution for the problems of the customers. Principle number three. Customers do not want one-offs, they want functional systems. It's really something where we, uh, you know, should work in really finding the right solutions also on, you know, how the customer can come from A to B to C. So this is our responsibility actually to guide the customers through this uh, with functional systems, with working systems. Principle number four, nobody makes it on their own. And we can discuss here in the open air among ourselves, whether we fight for the breadcrumbs or whether we bake the cake, uh, it's still open air internal. But I see this actually you know, much broader. It's the whole interoperability community. It's not the fight against what is the best standard. Is it fire or is it OMOP or is this uh, open air? Uh, is it IGE? You know, every standard was made to address a certain technical topic. And I think it's the synergies that we need to find, basically, why this is important uh, to have all these kind of standards, you know, in a unique way combined in, uh, you know, the platform approaches that you've seen today also. And last but not least, giving up does not necessarily mean failure. A change of perspective helps. So if you look at, say, okay, Sony was uh, the loser in this game, that might be true for the VHS battle or uh, for the, for the type, uh, tape recorders. But then, all of a sudden, the next format came out, uh, and uh, Sony was in the, in, in, in the game again. So they won a battle, but not the war. So giving up is not an option either. So, so far for this analogy, so I hope that you see why I come there, also in regards of showing you why open source might be a piece of the puzzle that is very, very important to address basically all these kind of topics that I was just talking about. So, as a matter of fact, behind every successful adopted technology in the world, there's at least one open source stack. And uh, uh, there's some examples here, and I actually made Sorry for the format, it's a little bit, little bit scrambled here, but um, you know, it's, uh, uh, if you look at web developments, mobile developments, cloud computing, data, you name it, uh, everywhere is open source stacks that are behind that. So this is how modern development actually works. The first thing is that you search for what is open source available and that you actually try to integrate and start something very early on as a developer. And the next principle is that behind every open source stack, there's a main supporter and driver behind. And uh, the question is, who is this driver? And uh, if you look, for example, as you know, just the selection of a couple, if you look at Apache, very often it's, uh, it's actually foundations who share a vision, who share a belief, and who uh, take the freedom, basically, to uh, you know, uh, work on this uh, vision uh, in regards of having an open source stack available. Uh, so Apache, it's Apache Foundation. But there's also commercial companies working on this. If you look at, for example, Android, it's Google behind. Uh, if you look at React Native, it's Facebook. So there's also commercial companies who actually support this kind of vision and who make it, you know, as a de facto standard via an open source philosophy. And I think this is something that, uh, you know, should also be the underlying principle for open air. 
The most well-known, of course, or might be everybody knows Linux. Uh, Linux is, uh, you know, the open source distribution. Uh, and if you look at this on the commercial side, there is a whole ecosystem of commercial distributions uh, around this. Uh, Red Hat, SUSE Linux, or uh, uh, Facebook, y you name it. It's, uh, everybody has a, uh, uh, an, an, a commercial distribution around this. And building this actually builds the market as well. So by 2023, the global Linux market size is actually uh, larger than, than 7 billion US dollars. So this is my vision where I want to be with OpenAir. Uh, we need to broaden the community. You know, it's nice to see new faces here uh, and also a lot remotely uh, are here. Uh, but we need to be beyond that. It's not just 300, 400, 500 people uh, believing in this, uh, this, this vision. Uh, it, you know, if we really want to achieve what we should achieve uh, where we belong to, uh, it should be thousands and many, many thousands of people sharing this kind of vision. So the question is, how do we get there? And we believe open source is part of that. So we as Vita Group, we analyzed five years ago uh, OpenAir when we actually stepped into this technology and said, okay, we want a platform approach. We want to, um, you know, focus on semantic interoperability. Uh, so we said, I still remember I was in London or at the open air uh, meeting, or a small meeting room with 30 people, uh, and or, uh, I didn't understand the word back then uh, because it was so technology driven. You know, I'm not an IT developer by heart or, or by nature, by development. So it's uh, really something where, uh, but, but I try to anal analyze what was missing, what is the missing link basically. And we said, okay, what is not really available is a community capable open source distribution that focuses on the CDR side. And we said, okay, why don't we actually start this uh, in Vita Group? We promote this. Uh, and this is basically how it all started. Uh, so if you look at Airbase, Airbase supposed to remove the barriers for vendors, hospitals, national programs, so for all the target audiences and to adopt open standards and thereby foster the establishment of semantic interoperability. This is the, the, the goal of Airbase. And we must say, uh, when we started, we were not the only one. We had the Medical uh, School of Hanover uh, joining us. Uh, we had the HiMate Consortium, where uh, Hanover Medical School is part of it, uh, but also other uh, eight other university hospitals in Germany. And um, uh, so we said, okay, let's group this together, let's form a development team that is focusing basically on providing an airbase uh, uh, as open source distribution. So this is how we started and uh, uh, then January 2019 we started with it, or we, did, we used uh, in agreement with the Open Air International or uh, you know, parts of Ethersys for example uh, and integrated this into Airbase, the good parts, and then focused basically on trying this to make the de facto standard basically for uh, a starting point on this uh, persistent side. So what we focused on a lot was it needed to be a modern architecture, latest technologies. In Airbase itself, you know, also use open source components that, uh, you know, make it uh, uh, very um, uh, convenient, basically, uh, uh, to also uh, maintain it to the latest versions uh, if some new developments are coming up. So, you see, we rely on Java 11, Spring Boot, Postgres, Juke, Maven, you know, all these uh, things uh, um, that are important to make it community capable. And it's designed for daily operations and transactional systems and uh, for clinical applications, for hospital information systems, and of course for regional and national health platforms. So the service services are, it implements the current version of the OpenAir reference model. We support uh, JSON and XML, uh, the archetype definition language version 1.4. We perform OpenAir object transactional crude operation and uh, also the official open air REST API support or uh, create and manage or AS and uh, status, et cetera, et cetera. So this is now very positive to see that uh, if you go to the GitHub and you download Airbase, uh, it has become really a starting point for a lot of people who try 
to test it, to play with it, to do something with it as a starting point. And then early or later you come to the point where you say, okay, it's doing the job what I want to do. Uh, and then all of a sudden the discussion starts and you know, we get the requests uh, uh, from people, how do I do this, how do I do that, and, and these kind of things. So of course, we also the OpenAI Software Development Kit helps to efficiently implement new clinical application systems. We generate software code from OpenAI templates and uh, it allows to automatically transform data from Java object to OpenAI database formats. Um, so it facilitates the use of the archetype query language. So, so everything what you need basically to get started with OpenAI. Um, now, of course, we are not altruistic. We are not the foundation ourselves. So uh, Vita Group needs to earn money. And uh, the question is, how do we do this? Because what I've told you now is basically free of charge. You can go to the GitHub and download it and play with it and uh, use it if you want. Uh, so where does Vita Group actually start to earn money? And uh, this is also referring to uh, why do commercial companies like Android or Facebook actually uh, support open source distributions uh, because in the end, of course, they have a commercial interest in it, uh, which starts with the vision, with the philosophy, but it ends up with you know, earning money earlier or later. That's what we need to do. So on the left side, you see the vendor independence, complete, truly vendor independent part, where we say, okay, uh, you know, to, uh, to be a true believer in vendor independency, we should also, in a way, make you know, the believer of this kind of approach not dependent on a certain vendor uh, of this platform again. So in a way, uh, if Vita Group is not doing the job down the road, uh, you should also be able to not fall back to zero and start all over again. So in a way, you should start at a certain point where you don't lose your data and have the same migration problems like with the other uh, systems that we are trying to get rid of. So that's our belief and our approach here. So what you, what you see on the left side, you, it's, uh, you, you know, the core of our commercial offering is really, do you have Airbase as the open air uh, part, we, but we also use HL7 Fire, and I promised I come back to the ar architectural picture in a minute. Um, and then on the right side, uh, it's crumbled again, but sorry for that. Uh, so the HIP CDR, HIP stands for Health Intelligence Platform. So the HIP CDR combines the advantages of open source with com uh, convenient extensions of commercial distribu distribution. This refers to security, performance questions, scalability uh, parts, usability, plugins, features, and of course, you know, always underestimated, guaranteed service levels. Sounds boring, but it's very important uh, to have someone who is responding with a certain period of time and actually says, here we are, and uh, we solve your problem if there's an issue. So this is where we come into the picture, and uh, you know, now I promise you the architectural picture. This is actually how we implemented this. And you see on the, on the, on the, on the bottom side, you see that uh, for the demographic data, we use FHIR. For, every, for the care data itself, use OpenAir with Airbase. Um, and then, of course, we have also multimedia data with uh, is, uh, S3 Menio uh, uh, data store. And the big part, specifically, we come from Germany. The, uh, you know, the big challenge, of course, is how do we migrate the data? And this is now refers to how do we bring the customers from A to B to Z? Because no one will get rid of the existing infrastructure that they actually have. So the question is, what is the screw into the machine that we, we can screw into that to, to say where does the CDR in the clinical environment, in the hospital environment belong to. And this is what we want to achieve to uh, not replace the EMRs, not to really say get rid of this and uh, now start from scratch from zero here again. So we are trying to find ways uh, to convert the customers from A to B. And this is uh, a lot on, on, the, on, 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 on the top left side. You see a lot of connectors, a lot of mapping questions that we have. How to 
make the data homogeneous into these common data uh, uh, formats uh, that we have in, in open air. And that is exactly the challenge that we have. The most of the time and the work that we currently have is on the left side, on the connectors basically from the EMRs basically to uh, uh, map the data into open air formats. And then you have those data available, uh, hopefully, you know, archetyped correctly and uh, with the right templates that you, can used, uh, you want to use. And then, of course, uh, the question is, what do you do with the data again? And then, actually, the ecosystem approach starts, where actually we have an open ecosystem where, you know, clinical apps from the care side, not we are the creative part on, you know, telling the hospital what is the solution. They should come up with the creativity, what fits them best. However, you know, it's not a silo approach. It's actually a low-code, no-code approach where you actually say, okay, this is something where you should be flexibly available to design your application. All you need is probably a cool UX company and or a front-end company, but that's all you need. So that's our architecture. And I'm very, very proud that, you know, we share this philosophy with Catalonia and or I'm very proud that we will be, uh, we have been chosen together with IBM uh, and a large consortium uh, with Red Hat, Kindrel, uh, also HiMate is part of this uh, consortium uh, from CDDI and Katsalut to uh, provide the CDR for the next generation healthcare IT in Catalonia. So, um, last but not least, if it was too boring, uh, I would like to actually um, I don't know how to do this, or uh, show you a short, short video how we actually pitch to the customers. Uh, now this is targeted for the German hospital audience or an international hospital audience. The existing IT architectures of clinical institutions pose great challenges to their staff. Hospital departments use software from various manufacturers to record patient data. As a result, data cannot be sent to departments and systems that use different data formats. This in turn results in what could be called a data prison. Hospital IT managers then have to use more and newer interfaces for data exchange between departments, leading to an unmanageably complex system. To obtain these interfaces, hospitals must pay the various system vendors lots of money. Loads of money. But even these interfaces do not bring the desired results, because about 80% of the health data is not correctly collated when transmitted via interfaces. This means that missing data must be collected several times and recorded manually. Efficient data evaluation and the use of clinical decision support systems is therefore impossible. That's why Vita Group has developed the HIP Clinical Data Repository. With HIP CDR, all your systems communicate directly via the open, interoperable data core. This platform stores your data in a manufacturer-independent, standardized and highly structured way. This means that your doctors, nurses and patients always have all the information they need at their fingertips. Easily integrate new systems into your IT infrastructure or replace them as needed. HIPCDR gives you access to all your data, regardless of the manufacturer or system, so that your IT specialists can focus on the real issues of the future. And your clinical staff can finally benefit from the advantages of digitalization. With HIPCDR, you can easily integrate all your supply partners and create the ideal conditions for your projects, such as your German Hospital Future Act projects, for your solutions of the future. Interoperable, scalable and secure. Vita Group HIP Clinical Data Repository. So thanks everybody, I wish you a great lunch and um I, if there are questions, of course, I'm here for the whole day. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And uh, whoever creates your advertising, they've definitely made me laugh. A um, couple of housekeeping items. First thing, if you could just keep your valuables safe. That's just a, a reminder. And the second is, if you could return from lunch 15 minutes early, 
our hosts have got a surprise for you, which I believe will absolutely be worthwhile returning for. So if you could be back here at a quarter past two, there will be something nice from uh, Paul and Shorty. So hopefully see you in 45 minutes from lunch. Thank you.
Everyone got the hoodie. If you've not got your hoodie, they're at the doors. But I think it's time to start again now. So, still a few people coming in, but I'm sure they'll uh, be picking up their sweatshirt. Fantastic. Thanks for all being back on time. So, um, we've got a really interesting session next, which is the origins and the future of Open EHR. And what we'll be doing is we'll be having a conversation for about half an hour and then 15 minutes of questions. I'd like to, first of all, welcome up Thomas Beale, who is now the VP of Informatics for Graphite Health, and also David Ingram, who is Emeritus Professor of Health Informatics at UCL and President of Open EHR Foundation and Open Eyes Charity Trustee. So welcome both. Fantastic. So it, it's a real privilege to share the stage with two people who were really there at the beginning of Open EHR. And I just wondered if you wanted to open, David, with okay. some remarks and reflections. Indeed, yes. Okay, well, it's a very dangerous thing to ask uh, somebody as old as me to talk about history, because you all know with your relatives who are going on a few years that they tend to talk rather a lot about history. And um, it's... Uh, uh, an occasion for me perhaps to talk a bit more broadly but answer questions in the context of uh, open air and how it came to be. I wanted to just say one bit of history though um, which is quite personal uh, which connects me very much with Barcelona and that is that in uh, the mid-1930s uh, my mother uh, was living in Barcelona just behind Tibidabo and there she was taking, uh, she, was, she was operating what you would call a safe house for refugees from the wartime of that period and along with a number of other women who came uh, at, at that time to set up that refugee uh, center. Uh, she was here for several years and without that time she would never have met my father. So in terms of the origins of open air I would not be sitting here <laughs> if it weren't for Barcelona. <laughs> So that's a nice thought in, in the context of being here. <laughs> so are we blaming the Spanish Civil War, is that right? Yeah, well, something like that, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, and, and another thing about history. Um, it's, uh, I mean, there's a very good podcast series. I don't know, I, mean, I have time to listen to podcasts these days because I'm 10 years retired, but um, there's one called um, The Rest is History. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, it's a couple of pretty well-known uh, authors and, and, and writers of history uh, who discuss things, and they've been at it for a couple of years now. And one of the early ones that I listened to was uh, What is History, basically. And history is also it's, it's, it's a very personal matter. I've got one history, but there are loads of histories in this room, and they all relate, and they're all relevant. And they said the best, um, the best uh, definition of history, if you like, uh, that they'd come up with was one by a sixth century muse um, by the name of Gregory of Tours, which is quite funny. He's, uh, he is quoted as saying, a great many things keep on happening, some of them good, some of the bad. End of story, that's history. <laughs> And there's lots of good stories and there are bad stories in any history really. And um, they keep on happening. And you know, it's our role really to uh, work together in the context of uh, making good histories really. The other sort of um, reflection I've got is another one which came to me thinking here about um, Barcelona and going to see the La Sagrada Familia um, quite soon, having seen it last time 40 years ago. And I read somewhere that the architect of Sagrada Familia, he got a bit worried by the end of his days that he wasn't going to see it finished and how true, how right he was. Um, however, he said, um, uh, he, he, he was quite sanguine about it and he said, my client is not in a hurry. <laughs> and um, I think we're dealing with a subject here where we've got a lot of clients who are in quite a hurry. And how we deal with that hurry and how we manage it in the context of doing useful 
and, and important things, I think, is, is, is key to where we are in the discussion here today. So I've just got three things that I want to highlight, and then I'll open the door to Thomas to talk about more detailed stuff and to answer questions in relation to the details of how open air came about. But one of the things that I think is, is abundantly clear is the role of pioneers who have had staying power. And I've certainly known a lot. I've just been writing a book for three years about the whole of the encounter of uh, medicine and healthcare with the computer. It's been running for about 75 years, and my life's been running for roughly 75 years now. And the book's in three stages, really. One is about all the adventurous ideas in and around IT and everything it can do for us in science and in healthcare. And that truly is an amazing adventure. Um, following on from it, once that begins to disseminate out into the real world of what we do about health and disease, it changes everything. And we've been going through a 75 years since the first computers appeared of what in the book I've characterized using a, a, a well-known uh, philosopher who's written on this sort of uh, theme but 100 years ago, is called an anarchy of trans transition. He said whenever you have a major change in society, it plays out in quite anarchic ways. And I think we're all evidence and, and, and experience that you know, what we're going through now is, is pretty anarchic in, in many respects, but it's not the end of any story. We're only sort of halfway through that, and we're in a lot better place uh, than we, we, we have been uh, in that journey. And I think the uh, importance of staying power is to stay through that period and then have a vision to look forward to the way things might begin to evolve and, and change into the future. And if I can just um, bring another luminary sort of thought uh, from, from, from um, Charles Darwin on, on the origins of species, he said, um, surveying the whole of the animal kingdom, the one message that was there, that the species that had learned to collaborate were the ones that survived. So I think, as well as staying power, we've got to add collaboration as absolutely crucially important in, in that regard. Um, and then just the final one, um, I think we just have to remember that nothing is ever the end of a story, that what we're talking about here is not right and wrong answers. We're talking about what have been called uh, wicked problems, which change as you try to solve them. And so we've got a very human context here, which I think some of our speakers this morning have really exemplified, of really putting the, 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 the purposes and the vision of what we're trying to achieve, how we will know when we've got there, putting that center stage, because these are not right and wrong answers that we're going to arrive upon. They're things that we're going to create and make to happen. And so what we're talking about is a very creative endeavor. And that is all the stories that you've been hearing this morning, amazing stories of history, really. And I think the important thing is that they're all eyewitness accounts. They're not what a government's telling us. They're what people are experiencing in their everyday lives and what they're doing. And that is eyewitness history that is very, very important in evol evolving the field. So is that enough for me from just a kick-off? And then we'll come to some details. That's fantastic. I, uh, that's given me some food for thought. Thank you, David. Thomas, over to you for some opening remarks. Um, I, I fell into health informatics by accident in 1994 when I washed up on the shores of St. Bart's Hospital where David was running a research group. Well, it was actually part of the uh, EU-funded project, uh, Framework 3 Project de Guerre, Project GEHR, Good European Health Record. And uh, that turned out to be the beginning of something, the end, I don't know. The, the, you know, the, the reason why I'm here now is what, the, the, that event. Uh, one very good thing about it was the project was mainly conceived of by clinical people, uh, either clinical professionals, doctors like Sam Hurd and Deepak Kara, uh, David, and other people who weren't IT people as such. And I got in the habit of hanging around with clinical people and trying to understand the semantics of the domain by you know, learning from <clears throat> the, the way they describe their work. Uh, and I've tried to keep that up over the last nearly 30 years, so I've spent time, I've even done ward rounds in Mayo Clinic and a few places like that, which is probably technically illegal, but, you know, somebody's got to learn about IT, real hospital IT in, in some way. 
Um, one of the funny things about that project, anyway, so it was 1994, that's a long time ago, and the rest of the group, uh, your group had written, uh, I think, there were, were there 20 deliverables or something? There were quite a lot. There was a lot of deliverables. <laughs> I, well, it was an EU project, after all. Yeah, yeah. There was, so there were eight, eight partners. There were, was Portugal, there was Belgium, you know, the usual thing. I think it was eight, eight uh, countries, yeah. three million ECU, back in the days of the ECU uh, currency unit. So it was quite a big project. And uh, most of the deliverables were written by clinical people or people from, like, with public health background, that sort of background. So it was really very focused on what does the domain look like, what do the problems look like. And my little job was to add a bit of technical formalization of some you know, essential requirements that had been uh, articulated in these other documents. And I, if memory serves correctly, deliverable 19 was the technical deliverable. And I put some models in there. And for about five minutes, I probably thought I knew something about health informatics. But it was actually about 10 years before I realized that I maybe just knew something about health informatics. But anyway, going back to this thing, uh, I remember thinking, okay, well, now we're done. We've put these deliverables in, we've done this beautiful thing, and I've been a part of that, and met all these great doctors and so on. And I thought, well, it's actually pretty simple. What have we done? We've you know, defined a patient-centric longitudinal health record. It's an obvious concept, right? And I thought, well, that'll be implemented in two years. And I started thinking, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? <laughs> So rolling around to 2003, and I'll cut the story very short, is the Open Air Foundation, and David's probably going to say more on that. But just to say, when Open Air was created, what were we thinking about? The lifelong patient-centric health record. And I thought, yes, this is a very obvious concept. This will be done in two years, for sure. And then I started thinking about what would I do next in my life. And here we are, 20 years later, and we're still talking about the patient-centric uh, lifelong health record. It's still not really achieved anywhere, maybe a few centers of excellence, um, but not really, because to achieve it properly means you've got to have it so that it travels, uh, metaphorically at least, with the patient no matter where they go on their life journey, and that, that certainly hasn't been achieved. So here we are still trying to uh, build and even convince um, other people and institutions of something which was reasonably obvious to practicing clinicians 30 years ago, and probably you know, another 20 years before that. So David, we've celebrated 20 years of Open Air this year. Uh, we had a, a little birthday cake for it earlier in the year. When was the light bulb moment for you right, that okay. you should do this? And okay. how and where did that happen? Okay, well, it, the reason I got into it wasn't exactly a light bulb. It was like an invitation. Um, there, there was a, a lot going on around 1990 in the European Union around the Advanced Informatics Medicine Initiative. And one of the uh, scoping areas they wanted to investigate was the concept of uh, an architecture for health records in, in the context of clinical knowledge and how it was shared and how it interfaced into patient care. And um, Sam Heard, he, he was working in the uh, Department of General Practice as well as running a practice in the East End, which he, he created there with various uh, GP colleagues. And he got involved with a, an internist um, who'd also set up a small company in Belgium Alan Maskins, and they thought they would have a go at uh, putting a proposal in there. So Sam came to me and said, how about you leading an initiative into uh, the European Union? I was actually looking around for a change of direction at that point. Um, I'd spent the first, I, I was the first UK professor appointed into that sort of field of medical informatics. And I'd, I got my chair, oh, well, who knows how you get your chair, but um, I, I'd spent sort of something like 15 years working in a department of medicine with a very luminary professor who'd been really interested in this area. But the problem in the clinical domain then was everyone sort of sensed it was going to be important, but there was not a lot of intelligence in relation to where was it going to fit in education, in research, in, 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 in everyday practice. So um, I 
spent my time doing something which turned out to be completely inapplicable in healthcare for 15 years, but I did get a chair for it, uh, which was that I, I, I'm a theoretical physicist by background, but long departed from that scene, although I still read a bit about it. Um, uh, and, and I used what I knew in mathematics and modeling, etc., to build models alongside various people in, in the UK and the USA, which went to about 1,000 medical schools around the world in respiration, how does respiration work, how do body fluids and electrolytes work? How does drug kinetics work? Quite nice ideas for education, but not that brilliant if you try to apply them to individual patients where context is everything, really. So I was looking for a change of direction. Sam came to me and said, how about having a go at this? Uh, we had a go at it. The review board in Brussels thought it was absolutely top hole. Uh, the lead runners who'd been working for about four years to position themselves were very, very... Uh, unimpressed, uh, I think, would be the expression. I quickly departed for a holiday driving the Blue Ridge Highway in America, and they didn't quite reach me there, but they sent a huge delegation to try and ambush a, a Mark Bartz to sort of try and get in, back in on the scene. But that's where it all started. Wow. <laughs> and, and Thomas, you've given us some views on, you know, how, how you became involved with this, but why have you stuck with it lifelong? Why has it become an intrigue? Is it the fact that it is a quest that's worth doing? Is it because it is a set of problems that are so challenging? There, there was a UK project called, a uh, terminology project called the Galen Project, and uh, run by Professor Alan Rector at Manchester. Um, was that EU funded? It or? was, exactly parallel with GARE. Yes. We arrived and met each other in the, the bidding rooms at uh, Brussels. Anyway, th they used to have a T-shirt which read making the impossible merely very difficult. <laughs> and I think that's the attraction of it in health, healthcare generally, but health IT or health information of any kind, because it's a informational profession, even if you're you know, just a practicing doctor or nurse or whatever, things, everything's about information because you're tracking you know, something over time and you, you need a memory device to remember what's going on with the patient. So um, I think that the, the attraction is that a, if we could solve it, or at least if we could solve what we consider to be our sort of part that we know something about the you know, patient uh, longitudinal health record and the care trajectory of, of the patient, that would obviously be a good thing. Imagine if we got to the day where we, you know, the, the, the type of solution that we envisage was all over the world. We think, oh, I can, I can die. I can leave this place feeling like I've, I've done okay. I've added something to society. Um, and then there's, a, there's another part that's just sheer bloody mindedness and you think, well, this is actually unsolvable. And especially with all of the you know, irrational insanity and politics and terrible governments and everything else that we could complain about, um, bureaucracies, uh, the money's all in the wrong places. I mean, in the US, my God, don't even start with the US. Uh, but it, for a certain type of person, and I imagine the room is probably full of them, um, you sort of think, yes, but we could crack it. We, 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 we just might get there. We just might get through all this nonsense and irrationality and craziness, and just we might get there. We'll keep on trying because it's, it's fun and it's difficult, and you know, every, a certain kind of mind likes a, a killer challenge. I think the bloody mindedness is most definitely an attribute of many people in this community and I count myself in with that. Now we, we said in this session we're also going to talk about the future. We talked about the past, we talked about how this came about. David, what is your hope for the future oh, with this community? <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, can, can I give an example of yes, something I'm doing yes, at the moment yes. and, and uh, tell me if I'm prattling on too long? Okay, okay. so I, I've got um, an affiliation with the Open Eyes Muse, um, mission, which is building an open source electronic medical record for eye care, and I've done it with the founder, of, who used to be medical director at Moorfields Eye Hospital London, Bill Aylwood, and uh, he had a vision, having been medical director for a number of years, of how poorly the institution was being served by its data, so he set up and recruited a team and created Open Eyes. Open Eyes is now delivering 50% uh, of UK eye care records. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a long, long uh, journey, that one, not quite as long as Open Air, but it's about 15 years now. 
And I got quite interested in this sort of domain of eye care. Um, um, just, just a personal note, my, my wife just had to have a corneal graft done on her right eye. Cataract surgery had not gone well and she got very foggy vision. We found one of the great surgeons in the world who could do the operation of grafting uh, cells on the inside of the cornea. Perfect vision in that site now, uh, four months later, amazing. And there you've got, you go into that clinic, lots of computer-aided devices. You know, measurement of the corneal thickness, device comes up, click, out comes a number. And that's writ large. You go to your optician in the high street and they do your eye care. They're doing retinal scanning and goodness knows what in the optician, aren't they? All the instrumentation is there as well. And this is a signal of a changing world where the data and where it comes from is coming from a different place now. And that kind of context and what you're attempting here in the context of the, um, the, the, the project here, it, it, it's very, very important in local context. It's very important in national and European context. But progress in this domain is going to be global, really. The, the message is if we get the coherence in and around the methodologies, the collaboration, the ways of sharing things, that can have global impact. And I, I'll just give you one example. I talk to Sam most weeks on the internet. He's now medical director of Aboriginal Healthcare in Australia. Um, he's coming to London. He's just landed in London. He's really cheesed off that he didn't manage to get here, but anyway. Um, and he is often out very remote from Alice Springs visiting the Aboriginal health communities. And he is really uh, fired up with the idea because now Elon Musk, with his low-level satellites, takes 120 megabit internet connectivity to all those communities with battery-driven devices. So they've actually got that connectivity now in the most remote places in the world who you would think would be miles away from what we're talking here. So there's no reason why the instrumentation of the information age cannot connect to global communities of need, which really need the progress that we're talking about here. So that's my perspective, that as medicine gets ever closer to the citizen, not just ourselves in our homes. Uh, 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 Mehdi was telling me about uh, a, a, a surgical procedure in, in, in uh, GI surgery where it was done with robotic surgery and the patients were delivered, taken home the next day, and as a result, less infection, reinfection, all that sort of stuff. So there's that kind of stuff which is taking things nearer to people at home. But then there is all manner of stuff which is bringing new capability, both connectivity plus instrumentation for people to monitor chronic diseases and so on and so forth and be much more engaged in that at home. So I think we've got to look to a very different scenario, a reinvention of healthcare, because I don't know how many of you have read um, Eric Topol's book on um, deep medicine, but his sort of despairing kind of uh, story of what he calls shallow medicine and the need to get back to caring. And um, he says he gets two or three minutes per patient where he previously had 20 or 30. And so we've got ourselves into quite a bind here and we've got to find a way. He's hoping that artificial intelligence is going to help relieve a lot of that pressure. But there's all sorts of ways in where we've got to with healthcare now, which has got to change. It's not just reform, it's reinvention, it's new kinds of services. And I think what open air should do is to attach to some kind of a vision of that kind where the data requirements, it's not just the structures of the data, it's where they're delivered and accessible, where they're coming from, and to have that kind of a vision of a new kind of ecosystem of data. And for, uh, if, you, if you wanted to ask, that's part three of my book. <laughs> <laughs> and when is the book out? When the publishers get it there, it's with them now into the final stages, yeah. Fantastic. And what's it called so that everyone it's can... It's called Healthcare in the Information Society. So it's beyond information age into what's next. Wonderful. Because I know a lot of people will be very interested in reading that. It's quite a hard reading parts, but anyway, it's also, I hope, interesting. I'm sure it will. And it'll be controversial. Because I, I've said there, you can't say anything in this world that's not controversial if you want to do something useful. I like that quote as well. <laughs> Thomas, um, you're going to conquer the US next. Um, what's your view for the future? Yeah, it's interesting. So um, I've joined a company called Graphite Health, which is called 
caused some level of mild excitement in the US and elsewhere. Um, they want to do the same kind of thing we're doing in open air, which is uh, a kind of computing that has, is based on models and semantics built by domain experts by whatever means. So in the future, they might have some machine learning aid to do that, but it's still knowledge coming from the domain, creating computational models consumed by systems, which are then the basis for the data and the querying. So that's the description of an open air system. Uh, it's actually the reason I don't think, I don't worry about whether open air will die or anything like that, because it's quite clear to me at least that the future of computing in any complex domain information heavy domain is something like that. You just cannot have all the semantics buried inside the software and the database schemas managed by IT people who don't even understand those semantics. And yet that is most of the healthcare software that's running today. Um, I made a couple of other technical notes seeing most of this conference as being technical so I'll, I'm not going to read them out, well not all of them, but just skim them a little bit. You can find them on volanscat.net so if you know the Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov, published in 1938, you'll understand the name of the, uh, the website, Voland's Cat. I incidentally, I've read that novel, so I knew about him right from the start. <laughs> Voland is the, is the pseudonym of the devil in that book. <laughs> very strong female characters, by the way. It's very fantastic for 1938. <laughs> Everybody should read it. Um, I think the future of, let's say, health IT computing, if I was just categorize it in sort of major uh, aspects, I would say, knowledge-based, which we've kind of semi-achieved in e-health because we have terminologies and we've got some attempt at computational ontologies that are not bad. You can go to OBO uh, Foundry and look at all sorts of medical ontologies. So we pull that out. That's, that's not part of the software. We have Snowbird, we have Loink, we have ICD, we have ICPC, we have all those things. That's, I mean, they've got flaws, but, you know, it's a pretty good attempt, actually, to do uh, what it was intended to do. Uh, it'll be model-based, model so that's the open-air kind of approach. You need models of uh, operational knowledge, data structures, uh, the way information is recorded, also definitions of processes, and that needs to be computable. I think functionally it's going to be process-based because from the patient-centric point of view, what you're after is continuity of care. And that means I've got to do something now and I've got to do something you know, tomorrow and next week I've got another visit and then I've got to have a scan. And the patient view is over time and the clinicians, what they need but they don't have is a computational way of tracking process no matter where the patient goes to get the next service. So how do we do all this? Short, long story short, take all the hidden semantics out of the software. I forget which, we had a presentation, had um, the, uh, a jail, each application is, oh, it was the uh, Stephens, wasn't it? It was the um, Vita Group one. A jail for the data, so that's exactly right. And I would say, additionally, applications are a jail of semantics, and so are databases built in the old way. Take all the hidden semantics out of those places. Um, you have to create a services-based platform so you can componentize the platform and uh, cre create and deploy components essentially incrementally and buy them incrementally. Um, we need to have use that to represent and track care pathways. That is the thing that has to be remembered. It's not just the health record as a purely historical uh, record of what has been done, but if you're on a two-year care plan or a lifelong care plan for your diabetes, that's a forward-looking thing. Uh, voice interaction, I, and I've worked on a project in Intermountain Healthcare where we more or less perfected it. When you mix voice with models, the vocabularies are reduced so that whatever you've got on the screen at the time only has a small vocabulary, including the terminology value sets. And the effect that that has is that uh, reduces the recognition vocabulary for Google or whatever other voice technology that you're using and you get a uh, millisecond response, so it's essentially real time. So you can talk your way through a complicated form. Well, it looks complicated, but actually each form that you're on just has this reduced vocabulary. So models plus voice. I think typing and so on is, uh, it, it'll be used for some things, but 
uh, one of the things that was the, the voice uh, um, interaction was used with at Intermountain Healthcare was radiology reporting, which you would think would be the more most typing oriented kind of activity, uh, very successfully. Uh, machine learning, so use of AI created via supervised, uh, no, I think supervised training of blank LLMs, or what some people call proprietary LLM AIs. And that will probably get us a fair bit closer to patient specific reasoning on data with uh, machine learning, you know, these tools spotting patterns which humans sometimes miss. Now, sometimes humans spot the patterns and machines uh, miss. And so I'm, I don't really have any worries that doctors are going to be put out of work. I think their work's just going to get more efficient and they'll be able to do more things in less time. So the result of all of this, engineering uh, dimension, we get rid of applications. I think the current concept of the application is dead. We need task-oriented IT. Each task or decision point that is on the care pathway will have some sort of, it'll create some sort of screen interaction or machine, human machine interaction, and there'll be some software or something, a definition that describes what is, should be shown on the screen or on the device. But I don't think we're going to have these applications. As I just said, they're, they're a jail for semantics for data. They're, they're kind of a, a terrible, I mean, it's easy to look back in hindsight, um, but that's what they are today. At the administrative level, um, we get rid of referrals. So I stole that from Geordie yesterday. Um, but it's a very nice way to think about continuity of care and care that goes across institutional boundaries. It's a nice way to summarize it. Why do you need referrals? Because where the patient goes next is just the next carer. Oh, they're in a different building or a different um, you know, legal enterprise or whatever it might be. That's just a detail. Why should that be a big deal? Uh, clinical level, we get rid of separate clinical documenting as an activity. So documenting while doing. Uh, on the project I was on at uh, Intermountain Healthcare, the mantra was uh, decide a little, do a little, document a little. And the documenting was happening due to this voice interaction with the system. And so by the time that was finished, the health record, the relevant part, was already populated. It was done. No more typing or pajamas mm, on the pajamas on the couch. Uh, so, anyway, the summary of all of that, if we were to achieve it, I think would be a true patient care, patient-centric care experience, and that would be the thing that we'd like to achieve. So that's a possible view of the future, and uh, I. I'm happy to spend a few more years uh, working on it, and it's now going to be in the US, so that's going to be interesting. Um, but it's the same, same view I've, I've had for the last, yeah. developed over the last 20 years. Very consistent. And we'll, we'll see how we go. Yeah, good for you. Well, I think the US is very lucky to have you here. Yeah. We'll be watching uh, from Europe. Any questions from the audience? Because this is a real unique opportunity to talk to both Thomas and David. I think we've got a couple of microphones. So hands up from the audience. Have we got some questions? Yes, one there. Well, uh, maybe it's a bit of a uh, joke. I was wondering how much time you think we're going to take us to, Can't hear you. to get there. Is it two years? Is it? <laughs> Yeah, yes, yeah. so I'm thinking two years in the US it should solve everything, and then, I, of course, I have to contemplate what will I do after that. So, yes, you're right. Good point. I like that, the two-year the two two year gap. Right, have we got anybody else across the audience? Yes, there's one down here from Paul, I believe, on the front. Yeah, thanks for uh, Thomas, really. I mean, your vision for, um, for want of a better term, digital health, um, it feels very futuristic. I can see how the technology can, af can enable it, but how do you make the people do it? Um, you know, you talk about the referrals process, for example, it's absolutely you know, inherent as a kind of social construct if our healthcare systems are managed, say, division between primary and secondary care. Breaking down these barriers just with technology is really tough. Uh, any comments? 
Uh, just from my, how do you make people do things? Um, weapons that can help. <laughs> um, you know, medieval implements. Okay, so to be a little bit more serious, my wife is a midwife, and she was a lecturer in uh, nursing, obstetric nursing at um, Federal uh, Hospital of Pernambuco in Brazil, and she's did her uh, spent her uh, efforts on her PhD in thinking about what could we put on a mobile phone, a smartphone, to help pregnant women become part of their own uh, antenatal, perinatal experience and be able to report symptoms even in non-medical, well, it would be Portuguese in Brazil, obviously, uh, and to receive messages just to uh, reminders, but not necessarily reminders of appointments, just reminders to report how you're feeling or if there's something when you urinate, you know, you've got a certain kind of feeling, you know, the typical things that you need it, if you catch anything early on. And I think use cases like that, they're actually, the technology is not that complicated. It does require joining up. But if, you know, she showed me the WHO and the Brazil national statistics of all sorts of uh, morbidity and even mortality uh, of women and um, newborns or pregnancies that don't come to term due to easily preventable problems that it, it does seem, you know, when she said, well, I think that if all those women, particularly less well-educated women, but they've all got a smartphone, probably a cheaper one than some of us have, but every, every phone's a smartphone these days, if they could interact with the system and be part, be an active carer of themselves, just look at the statistics, how many millions of people, how many lives you can improve, how many uh, children you can save, how many um, childhood problems you can reduce or remove. And I think that's the type of, you know, at least a potential place where we can look to uh, where the benefits are so obvious, you know, somebody has to come up with a really good argument as to why you wouldn't implement that kind of system. And I think things are unfortunately a bit more difficult in, you know, our so-called rich countries in the UK and Spain and, you know, Europe, US. Uh, but we have to chase down the obvious places where the benefits are so obvious. And it's actually not that hard to find even in our societies and all the medical people will have a certain category of patients they know about that fit that sort of description. For me, that's probably a way to do it. And if you have to sneak in the proper patient-centric health record by helping initially poor women in a developing country have a better pregnancy experience, fine by me. Good. Any more? Stefan? And then the chap at the back after Stefan. Thanks. Rather personal question for both of you. Um, and now, uh, turning out two years to 20 years, you forgot the zero. Um, are you both happy with the progress where we are today? Or, um, uh, and or, uh, would you have wished that it's... Where, where should we be? Uh, where do you think we should be right now? And uh, do you see the progress? Or uh, do you see the dynamics? Uh, do you feel it? Or uh, are you happy with the progress that we're doing currently? So, rather personal question to both of you. What's that? Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm always pretty happy. Um, I, I think it's an amazing challenge. I think it's, 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 it's so broad ranging that it's going to be an evolutionary progress. It's, 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 it's not like uh, Gaudi saying his, his client was uh, not in too much of a hurry. Um, we've got to be in a hurry, but we've We've got to be careful not to hurry people up to jump on a cliff of unsupportable health care. Um, and I think it's going to take its time. Um, I'm not sure that the drivers of this are all just within the political domain or within the money domain. I think they're in the behavioral domain, like many, many changes of significance of this kind in society are. So I think, you know, we just have to accept that it, it is what it is and do our best with it but I don't think we should beat ourselves up unduly. And obviously, we all just have to live within the practical realities of the world as it is and, and cope with those as well. So I, I don't feel disappointed. In, in, in fact, um, no, I'm, I think this is amazing. I mean, this is quite 
an amazing experience for me to hear all of these presentations today. So I've got quite a long time context of how these things are. It is a long runway, but um, it's, it's definitely moving. Mm -hmm. A, a, a quick answer to that. I heard this funny interview years ago on the radio when people listen to radios. Uh, somebody interviewing Bob Dylan, they said, are you happy? And this is Bob Dylan. And he said, <laughs> of, of course I'm not happy. What sort of a stupid question is that? And besides, I'm a process singer. You know, I mean, that's an idiotic question. So part of me feels like that. And that's the two-year thing. You know, by God, it's still d decades turning into centuries before we make any progress. But the thing that... Uh, I think all of those of us who are you know, pretty rational, uh, we always underestimate the um, impediments of human psychology. The psychological dimension is the first you know, point of analysis of anything that happens in society or bureaucracies or governments or anything at all, health systems. And so if we assume that you know, humanity is what it is and we have this, you know, this, this phrase in English, um, uh, changing hearts and minds, right? Well, it takes a long time to do that, and then you have vested interests and so on. So given that that's all just part of, you know, human condition, then uh, I think, yeah, I'm happy. It's, uh, there's a lot of stuff happening. I mean, what uh, Jordi and his team are doing here in uh, Catalonia is actually pretty courageous. Is very, I mean, I read the first, um, is it 2017 or something, the original, uh, so that's before you even got into open air. I mean, it's, I think Catalonia knows a lot about health informatics and health information and mm -hmm. semantics. And by the way, thanks for having us here. This has been a great event. I meant to say that at the beginning. Yeah. So that makes me really happy because it means that there are people who think, well, this is worth trying at least and we're going to give it a go, and despite all the obstacles, we'll see how we go. And, you know, sometimes it, we need a bit of luck and so on, but uh, we're going to make the effort. And I, you know, congratulate everybody who's trying to make that kind of effort. Wonderful. One last question up at the top here. Yeah. Hello. Hey, Tom. David. So. Uh, when I read the specification for the very first time, I noticed that um, it wasn't meant specifically for healthcare. And it was a two level modeling approach that can be applied to any knowledge intensive industry. Uh, why did you pick open air and why not open ERP or some other industry? Um. Well, this sort of pragmatic answer, that's where the money was to do the work. Um, but I mean, we did have a pretty good idea amongst the, I mean, all these things smart with small groups of people and finding common ground and then how that then spreads to larger groups of people. And the early stages of those things are usually pretty slow, going from one to three to 10, 10 to 100, you know. Um, there's a professor of uh, statistics who coined the square root law that um, if you've got 100 people, 10 people who uh, follow a particular line and are coherent with the way they tackle it can influence the 100. And that applies, you know, if you've got 10 to influence, you need three-ish. If you've got 100 to influence, you, uh, you, you need 10. And you folks are in the 100 to 10,000 domain. So that's where you're at. And um, I think, you know, it, if, it doesn't really matter which part of it we take out, because if we do well in that part, it will influence the other parts as well, I think. Do, would you think that was true? But, uh, I think there is a lot of um, applications of open air to invoicing, billing, and people are needing these in hospitals. So, I don't know, do you think it will extend beyond healthcare? Well, I, I would say technically we already know that that's true because there are people uh, from the defense industry, from geospatial, um, uh, like uh, the geographical, hy no, hydrographical survey of the US, just to take another example, who've used the computational approach, so that's model representation. They write their own reference model because the primitives are different, as you might imagine, it, uh, the hydrographical surveys like fisheries and coastlines and God knows what. Um, yeah, so we've stuck in healthcare. We're not stuck, but we have stayed in healthcare for the 
what, the reasons we articulated earlier, I guess, and you know, you're a medical doctor, so you chose a kind of, there's a vocational aspect to being in healthcare because we think we can do some good. But if we were pure technocrats or technologists, we might actually do exactly what you're saying and make a more generic technology yeah. and yeah. just yeah, yeah. expand it out. And maybe, you're, maybe that's what we should have done, I don't know, but no. uh, it certainly would work that way. And just another thing, uh, uh, on the name Open Air, uh, I remember being over at uh, um, Archway, which is the campus where, uh, the UCL part of the uh, campus where David's group was in 2002, and we were, we'd, I think we decided to create this thing, but we it... We knew the sort of values and how we wanted to do it, yeah. It, it didn't have a name. No. And I remember going home, and Sam Hurd went home, and probably Deepak went home, and a few other people, and we thought we'd think of something overnight, and we came back, and none of us had a good name. And David comes in and says, I just thought of the most marvellous thing in the shower this morning, open air. And it's just, that's annoying. It's one of those <laughs> names where you realise, well, that's the obvious name. Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> anyway, hadn't had enough coffee. So um, that was the name. And the funny thing about it is we still use this acronym EHR. E stands for electronic. We've had electronics since about 1947 or something. So it's, it's very anachronistic. Now, I don't see the acronym going away. I mean, it's a bit like IBM. What does it stand for? International Business Machines. I mean, that's like those adding machines with the mechanical keys. But they're not going to change their name. So I think we're probably in that territory just on the actual EHR part of the name anyway. Yeah, we'll stick with it. Model okay. of models. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful question and a, a great way to end. So thank you so much, David and Thomas. Okay. That's been a really fantastic panel. Thank you. Fantastic. So we're moving on now to uh, building the ecosystem. And I'd like to welcome our next speakers. Um, we've got Verbjorn Artsen, who's the special advisor at, at Oslo University Hospitals. Uh, Joost Holstag, who is the clinical program board co-chair at OpenEHR. And also, ah, international board member at OpenEHR Netherlands. Um, we've got Pierco. Corten Kangas, who is UNA Chief Specialist, and Mikhail Nystrom, who is board member at Swedish Medical Informatics Association. So uh, welcome to the stage. And uh, Verbjorn, would you like to start? All right. Uh, my name is Verbjorn Arnsen. I work as a special advisor in the Oslo University Hospital. Uh, the largest one in, in Oslo, at least, um, in, in Norway, at least. Um, I'm doing this presentation, uh, well, I work there, uh, well, I've been working there for 35 years, actually. I started out as a nurse, but I got tired of doing this manual thing with the pen and paper for, for so many uh, things that um, I realized that we need to do something better with data. So I took a, 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 an IT uh, education for a couple of years, and then since 1996, I've been working in the IT department of this hospital. So that's me. And this presentation, I will, I've had some help from Celia Bakke and Jon Tore Wollen, who are my colleagues in the national governance of archetypes in Norway, which um, I'm a part of. I work 50% of my time there and the rest of the time in the, in, within the hospital. Um, I've got one warning. This presentation will have no diagrams. Uh, Jody told me that you not, some of you might not be very familiar with the with the, all the details in archetypes and, and open EHR. So I will mostly talk about the clinical uh, modeling thing here in this presentation. And it's, um, we can think of the archetypes as a Lego brick. Um, it's not the thing that 
if, if your children drops an archetype on the floor and you step on it on the night, you will be hurt. It's not that kind of Lego bricks, but we can pretend it's a Lego brick, right? Sometimes uh, archetypes hurt, at least for me. Um, but that's on different pain. Um, the technical specification is of the uh, archetypes is in the reference model. And um, there are standardized measurements that makes the Lego bricks stick together, right? And um, that is uh, represented here by those numbers of the hat and things about so many millimeters from side to side and everything, or else they won't fit. And that will be uh, equivalent of the uh, reference model in, 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 in archetypes in, in OpenEHR. So, but this yellow and red, that's our other uh, properties of the archetypes, and that's not really a part of the reference model, if you will use the same analogy. Um, of course, in Lego, they will have standard colors, of course, but let's pretend they don't have. So, and these colors and other properties, they are the semantic content, that's the clinical content of the archetype, right? Uh, that's not part of the reference model. So I thought we can show one archetype, this is the body temperature archetype, which, where is the pointer? There, ah. Uh, that contains uh, uh, only one single element here, the quantity of the temperature that you've measured, and there is one comment. The rest is meta information about uh, the description is, is how it's going to be used. That's mostly information to the implementers. And the attribution is who made it and, and stuff like that. But uh, when you want to interpret the body temperature, you need to know something else as well. You need to know uh, where, where was it measured? What was it measured with? That are parts here that have belonged to the body temperature uh, the, the, the reading, and also the state of the patient. Was it naked, a patient? Was uh, having the patient been dragged out of a, of a, of a snow avalanche? What, 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 what were the conditions where you were doing these measurements? So this is a unique uh, thing. Uh, it's got a unique name. It's got a technical name over here, and this is a published archetype. Um, so, what happened, what would happen if someone else made another body temperature archetype? I've done this myself. Um, I've hijacked, I've I downloaded another archetype called um, temperature, which is not a, a published archetype, but it's supposed to be used for um, measuring the temperature of an object. Um, but I mutilized it a bit, took me five minutes. I renamed the object element here and called it human body. And I renamed the archetypes as body temperature. Now we got two archetypes with the same name. That's very silly. We do things like that. We know, and it's maybe not in the body temperature archetype, but it's being made archetypes now that are similar or the same as some other archetype that exists. And when we're coming to um, a difficult word, words, semantic interoperability, took me two years to say that, um, we can't live with that. We can't. It's not, we shouldn't do that. So <laughs> this means that if we're going to build an ecosystem, all the nice things we've been heard about today, about the um, vendor neutrality and, uh, uh, and a common platform that different vendors can, can, can uh, make a user interface and, and react to the, and, and write and read to the same repository, data repository, 
we, we, we can't live with having um, several archetypes dealing with the same content, right? So, therefore, the archetypes, they have to be sound, thoroughly uh, investigated, and they should be going through um, the reviews, uh, peer reviews, and published internationally, and governed uh, like hell. Because once you've made it, you don't want anyone others to, 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 uh, to change it unless you go up a step on, on the uh, versioning. Um, and I'm not saying that uh, the technical parts of the uh, open AHR is not important. Of course it is. Uh, but I think that's the main thing about the archetypes is that it's is, is the data, right? And if you don't get the data right, the else is just there, but it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So um, it might be uh, archetype-centric in my view on the world, but I think that's the most important part of it. So shoot me, anyone. Um, and that's why local or national archetypes should only exist except as exceptions. And uh, maybe to just make an, uh, uh, an application work, you will maybe have some uh, vendor-specific archetypes. Uh, but be sure to rename them or to name them differently from the original ones, uh, like the body temperature, which I showed, which I I didn't name it Silly Verbion, but I renamed it to Bogus Body Temperature. I'm going to delete it uh, after this presentation. <laughs> Don't use it. So, my message to Catalonia and to all the others, actually, uh, I think you should uh, used to, to, to make the arch well before you start making any, any archetypes just check what's there uh, before uh, in the international clinical knowledge manager or one of the others you might find something there that you need or maybe something that's very similar so that makes it much easier to make your own right um, and but when you do upload them to the International Library, then CKM, and then federate it to your national CKM, and internalize them in that CKM, and do the reviews in parallel. This is what we do in Norway. Uh, the Norwegian CKM is an exact, it's not exact copy because we have only downloaded the published ones and the ones that are in draft and which are we are actually working on. Um, so, by doing that, you will be sure that you don't use any bogus archetypes like the one that I just showed. Um, and don't accept any vendor-specific archetypes unless it's really, really, really necessary just to make the system work around, to, to, to just work, right? Uh, you might need some extra archetype just to, to uh, yeah, some technical reason, but not, not, not archetypes that contain a clinical uh, content. Um, and demand your vendors to share their archetypes. Don't accept any vendors that don't want to show what they are. We're in this together and uh, we're not that many people and believe me, it's, it's enough work for everyone to make the all the archetypes that are needed. Right. That's just what I plan to say. I'm done.
So hello everybody, it's really exciting uh, to be here and to share with you a little bit about the momentum we are feeling today and where Catalonia is, uh, is head, uh, ahead of us. And I want to share a little bit about the momentum of OpenEHR in the Netherlands because also in my country exciting things are happening. I'm a medical doctor, Rachel kindly introduced to me, introduced me, but uh, my main job right now is at Needup. I'll share a little bit more about the, about the company and my role is what's usually called the CMIO. But I want to take this moment to announce that I'm starting a new venture in, in the open EHR uh, space. Not going to go into it uh, right now, but if you're curious, uh, please, come, uh, please come talk to me. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what's specific about the Netherlands, how EHRs work, uh, our national modeling, government policy, and recent developments, uh, um, and the history uh, from the vendors in, uh, in my country. Um, so what's important to know, I know, I understand that here in Catalonia, there's the CatSalut, the, um, the, the um, uh, organization for delivering healthcare, but in the Netherlands, actually, we have a very decentralized system. So there's over uh, 10,000 care organizations, um, and they vary a lot. Some have one patient with one nurse who takes uh, care uh, of one patient at home, and others, they have millions of patients, like big academic hospitals, uh, like where we are right now. Um, and some have even maybe 100,000 employees if they do home, home care cleaning, they're national companies almost. Uh, so there's a huge variation. Um, and for the other people that, uh, like me, they like some statistics, they like some numbers, we spend about 100 billion per year on healthcare in the Netherlands. Uh, that's about 11% of our GDP, so quite a serious sum uh, already. And it's over 27% uh, of our government budget. Um, and if you look at the care organizations, uh, they spend about 2 to 7% of that 100 billion on IT. And a lot of that is just devices and, and servers and IT personnel. But a significant part of it is, uh, is EHRs. Um, so about 1% of the 100 billion gets, uh, gets spent on, uh, on EHRs in the, in the Netherlands. And what's interesting to see is the statistic on the right. It's in Dutch, unfortunately. But what's good is to see that the biggest part of, uh, of our national budget, uh, about 100 billion, we spent in the hospitals. But we also spent a lot on elderly care. That's the second dark brown uh, on the bottom right. And we spent uh, serious money on disabled care and on mental health care. And only the, the GPs, they are after that, like the, um, like the, the people who take care of patients in, the, in their neighborhood. Um, so it gives you a little bit of uh, idea about the context in the, in the Netherlands. So what's good to know is that in the Netherlands, each care organization has its own EHR. So very different from what you're doing in, uh, in Catalonia. It has some advantages, but it also has some, uh, some disadvantages, of course. And we tried to fix this. In 2011, there was this idea to have one national EHR for the entire country, uh, but it was stopped by parliament over privacy uh, concerns. Um, and so currently, there are many, many EHRs. There are about, I, I mentioned some sectors before, like hospitals or mental health care, and each uh, section, uh, session, sector has about a dozen vendors. The leaders are Chipsoft, it's a Dutch uh, company. Uh, it's mostly active in the hospitals branch, uh, and NEDAP, the uh, company where I work uh, currently in the, in the care sectors, sector. And there are many local companies, and of course, they are the big, um, American uh, companies like Epic and in Intersip uh, Intersystems and of course Daedalus um, and some are private equity owned and one interesting one is that SAP um, was active in the Netherlands but they gave, uh, gave up on their product that cr created quite a problem um, for the, the hospitals that used this system because they were forced to migrate with a great cost and they were not that unhappy with their product so that's one reason why you actually really really want a vendor neutral uh, data archive, uh, because you want to do easy migration and you don't want to be dependent on a single vendor. And of course, OpenHR delivers that. Um, so one, uh, one thing we do almost right in the Netherlands is clinical information models. Uh, they are called ZIPs, 
which is like the building blocks and they're almost equivalent or like CKM archetypes. So you can think of them in a little bit the same way. And I would say they are the world's second best, of course, after the OpenEHR CKM uh, with uh, uh, many expert people uh, working on that with a great thanks to Norway and the people from there, but especially Heather Leslie who has put many, many hours uh, in this. And the problem this creates, if you have two things that do something almost the same, the ZIPs and the CKM archetypes, if you have data, um, then you have to map it. And mappings, man, trust me, they're headaches. They never match. Um, and if you're lucky, you can fix them, but often you cannot. One example is that we have the CKM archetype for pulse slash heartbeat. And in the ZIPs, there's one, one ZIP, one archetype, for pulse and one for heartbeat. So you ha <laughs> if you have one of those, you can map it to the archetype. But if you, if you don't know which is one, yeah, what, you, what are you going to do? And then the government comes in and tells you, you're, you're my customers, we pay you $10 million if you fix this. So yeah, guess what's happen what happens, but yeah, <laughs> trust me, it's not really fixable. Um, so they, what I'm really hoping for is that actually these, these concepts of ZIPs and CKM archetypes, they're actually complementary. Um, so my personal goal is that in my country we start doing the modeling of the ZIPs in OpenEHR in the technical specification based on the reference model. Um, that would that'd be really, really valuable uh, um, to me and to the companies who invest in this and it will improve vendor neutrality of our, our country, will be much better for the market. And after that I would really like, there are many, many good ZIPs, um, some are used by Aperta, CKM in the UK, so there's definitely value there, but we should merge them with the CKM and stop uh, stop doing both at the same time. Um, yeah, we'll skip this. It's uh, the same for most of the development co developed countries, so we have a huge challenge in the healthcare sector. We need to do more uh, work with fewer people for the same budget. Um, but this is a quote that stuck with me, so maybe it's interesting for you. It's one of a, my colleagues in, uh, in elderly care, um, physician, uh, uh, elderly care, and he said, well, Joost, most of my dementia patients, they ch have retired children. This, to me, this really exemplifies the, the problem we have with, uh, with aging. Um, so the government, of course, they, they know this in the Netherlands, so they put, uh, put up a policy after the 2011 uh, debacle where they were told stop, stop doing this, stop doing this national HR. They did almost nothing for 10 years um, and left it to the market. That was not really working either, though some, uh, some good stuff happened, but it's not going to fix uh, the big challenge that, uh, that's in front of us. So there's this national vision, it's, it's also in Dutch, it's just to show that something is going on uh, and not to have only text for you. Um, so they say, well, technology, technology has to fix it. And if you talk to them, that's quite, uh, <laughs> they, they don't really have, uh, they re don't really know how it's going to work. <laughs> but at least um, they, the other thing they say is they want more regional collaboration. And I told you before that we have many, many care organizations and they don't really, really work together that well. Um, but at least these two things, technology and regional collaboration, it's a huge incentive for what's called in, the, in Dutch data beschikbaarheid, data availability. So we should have all the data from all the care organization for the same patient available to anybody who needs it, separate from authorizations and, the, and that, that kind of stuff. But that, that requires that you have the data available in a standardized format. And yeah, we uh, probably most of us who, who are here know that there's only one serious uh, technology to, to, uh, that can do this properly. So it's a huge, um, huge incentive for OpenEHR. Uh, so really, really exciting. So the um, people that make the ZIPs, they are part of an organization called NICTIS. It's like a, a government agency uh, that has ex expertise in health IT. And they made this uh, on a really interesting model on the right. I'm not going to go into detail it, uh, in it, but if you want to know, you can uh, come talk to me. But basically, to solve the interoperability, there's... Uh, that went quite well, right, Fabian? Interoperability? Yeah. 
Um, there's five layers that you, you need to fix. There's the, the people, they have to change. And there's the, um, the infrastructure, like the, just, the, just the internet, the computer, stuff like that. And uh, for the first time, this uh, uh, health um, IT government organization recognized that there's a lot of value in OpenHR technology, like the reference model, like the archetype, like the templates. And they finally put it one in one of their advice uh, to, the, to the government. So there's really starting to be interest in OpenHR in my country. Um, and they are asking the right questions. One of the things we, we have, to s have to solve is that both uh, OpenHR and FIRE have information models and usually they don't match perfectly. Uh, so how, how are we gonna handle this? Because very probably you need both standards for the foreseeable future. Um, so yeah, good stuff is happening also from the, uh, from the government. Um, some uh, novel developments, I told you a little bit, but also from the government they paid the big consultancy firms uh, that's, uh, that we all know to write some reports. And usually they are, these are not, um, not that interesting to me, to people who know exactly what's going on, to the, who know the content, who know the medical, who know the engineering. Uh, but it's getting better. There are people are saying smart stuff. Um, in these reports, so I'm starting to get uh, get hopeful. There's also a lot of cri criticism on the, the the report that says stuff, uh, good stuff, probably by the vested interest. Um, EY is one of the parties that's starting uh, to do interesting stuff. I told you about our decentralized um, healthcare system, and what you really, really need for that is federation, that you can access data from a different care organization in the same format in a scalable way. You don't want to build an integration with all other 9,999 uh, care providers in the country. That's not really scalable. Um, and I told uh, you a little bit about that. Our goals that there is starting to get an interest to do the national modeling in uh, in OpenHR instead of the current uh, standard the detailed clinical models. And it's much, much better in OpenHR is my uh, unbiased opinion. Um, there's plans for regional OpenHR uh, CDR to make uh, make the collaboration easier. There are some hospitals that are in the process of acquiring a, a CDR uh, for migration and research purposes uh, mostly. And what's an interesting development is that our government spent or made a budget of 70 million euros for research to start to reuse the data that we uh, collect in the primary uh, care process. Um, and they basically they are building a CDR, and for now they are have, uh, thinking about the custom data model, so something not standard, which is obviously not the, not the best idea, but I'm hoping we can, we can get them uh, there one day. Um, so actually the, the best stuff on OpenEHR is coming from the vendors, um, and especially Code, 20, uh, code 24, is uh, important to mention here because they are, have been in, on open EHR very, very long and they are fully open EHR based for their product. They are uh, focusing on the mental health care in the Netherlands. So really they, uh, they do a uh, good job. And also the company where I currently work is Needup. We are, we are committed to transition to full open EHR. And our story is actually interesting because we had a complete EHR suite um, and we are rebuilding that bit by bit in OpenHR because we realized as a company without any incentives from somebody paying us uh, to do it that we need it if we want to stay relevant for the next 10, 20, 30 years because the current business model is just not sustainable. You need the data in an open format to stay competitive because if we don't, somebody else is going to do it, maybe Code24 or some other party. Um, so that's, uh, I asked Ian uh, at the beginning of the day about what are the incentives for the current vested interest. My position is you have to do it. You, don't, you can't get around it. There's nothing else. We really need this for the future of, uh, of healthcare. So just uh, start tomorrow. And don't do everything yourself. Use what's already there. We publish a Java library, Archie, to get you started um, if you want to work with OpenHR. Um, and there's better. I'm really happy that they are coming to the Netherlands. They're trying to do some uh, some projects, and of course, they uh, many people uh, know them, and they have been great in promoting OpenHR and showing the stuff really works. The final one is an, is a joke. I can't explain in in public. Um, 
And finally, I want to announce that as OpenHR NL, we are an affiliate, uh, affiliate organization that mostly does some promotion of OpenHR in the Netherlands. We're doing an event later this year. The date will be, uh, will be announced, but it uh, would be great if people come from, uh, from here. Um, and if you do clinical modeling, uh, please come uh, talk to me, because as Fabian said, we have to do it together, we have to align, because we really, really want to do it uh, well, and you have to spread the resources. So please, uh, let's do it together, come talk to me. Um, and finally, this is uh, personally, um, that I really, 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 really enjoy this community. Um, and one of the things that I personally really like is the to bringing two worlds together, the engineering world and the clinical world, where I come from. And one of the things we do well together is to, to socialize and to usually with some alcohol uh, involved. So we had uh, drinks uh, Sunday night, it was really fun, some tapas was uh, <laughs> with it. And I walked back home and just around the corner there was a, a bar that had this statement on the, on the door. Yeah. <laughs> is it a coincidence? Is it, uh, is it karma? Is it faith? I don't know. But uh, this is where I'd like to, to leave it for today. Thank you, everybody. Okay, hello, I'm Pirkko from Finland. Uh, I have a bit different perspective to the word of ecosystem as I'm wondering here what, what kind of ecosystem we have built in Finland already and uh, how to use it perhaps to the future. Uh, I myself, uh, I've been il involved in all kinds of things in uh, social and healthcare ICT since uh, 99 about, but before that I, w I got interested in medical ethics and its interactions with law and, and legislation. I think it was a good basic to begin to think about the information exchange in care. Anyhow, uh, my presentation uh, picks up some elements of our ecosystem and uh, my opinion why they are important, although uh, the elements were made and built for other purposes than uh, to implement open air-like systems. Yeah, okay, so um, I go to the point. The first two elements in, in, in our ecosystem is the uh, my background organizations today. The first one is our uh, HL7 Association Finland. Uh, we have uh, built a sub or working group under this association as the point of the association is that it has been deeply involved and to uh, be grateful for all kind of uh, practical implementation of all kind of standards in our ICT world in Finland. So uh, it's an association uh, built on, on, on uh, voluntary work mostly, uh, but it's association where users uh, or authorities and vendors meet each other and make the compromises around the standards. So it's a good organization and I'm proud to be uh, one of the co-chairs of this working group. And then my, my, uh, my, my, my company is UNA, it's a non-profit company uh, since a bit more than five years. And uh, it was created to organize the cooperative work uh, between uh, that days, uh, health centers and hospitals, uh, but nowadays uh, to uh, organize the cooperation of our new welfare uh, areas or districts. Okay, but uh, uh, apart from the cooperative nature, uh, 
think, talking about architecture and so on, we also have made a couple of solutions for uh, uh, to resolve problems of today. So uh, our solutions are uh, not uh, something perhaps that will maintain after 30 years. They are to uh, solve some specific problem like why the patient data doesn't uh, be, isn't transferred uh, with the patient. Although all the fine in infrastructure we have in Finland. But anyhow, Finland is a, a country uh, just on the opposite side of EU than Spain. We are, have the, about the same size as Scotland. Uh, and we uh, got our fourth or third attempt of uh, reform of health and social care uh, 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 through in the beginning of this year. So it's, it means that our whole system is under a total chaos for the moment. Uh, and all the care you can get in Finland depends on the, the professionals who still want to work. <laughs> with patients and, and clients. Okay, but uh, in fact, the, the reform will be the enable or, or option to, to do things in a different way in the future. So, so I hope that within the next 10 years, uh, our system will function much better than today. So it gives an organizational uh, enable of change as we have difficulties to make decisions. So instead of uh, decision making of 250 uh, municipalities, so now they are just 21 plus three uh, welfare service uh, counties to make decisions even on the ICT. The other op option of this reform is that the uh, financial funding comes from the uh, Ministry of Economy, uh, and it means that there's a possibility to steer the investments in our system, and I hope that something could happen even on the field of uh, ICT, and I know that they have their visions of that also. So we'll see what happens. Um, our national ecosystem built already consists of counter services that consist of uh, data archive, document archive, that's important, e-prescriptions, and uh, one of the most important uh, achievements was that our citizens have access to their patient data and soon to their social care data. So uh, more than half of Finnish people uh, use Kanta uh, to, to look at the patient reports and so on. Uh, okay, and then uh, around the Kanta, uh, we have the national le le legislation about the informed consent concerning who can uh, from where you can get the documents, from its origin. But there are also other important elements in our ecosystem, and I, I, could, I, I want to mention a population information system that does not contain all demographic data of citizens, but uh, the most important ones like ID and address and so on. And a uh, third one, very important piece, is code service of our, uh, for social health care. It's, it's as old as Kanta, meaning about 20 years, and, and we have a lot of reference data. And, and uh, in fact, uh, determinations of templates uh, on many different levels. Uh, in, in our code service. Um, okay, uh, we have learned uh, things when building Kanta, but uh, to take it from the viewpoint of open air, it's astonishing how much we have in common, common with the reference model of open air, which gives me hope that it's not uh, 
not so, so hard to change our thinking to, to get a bit uh, a smaller granules of, of information, uh, data components than we have today, as today we have the Kanta documents, national documents that are like paper uh, sheets. Say it shortly. But anyhow, uh, it's not at all hard to, to, to see the similarities between Kanta thinking and open air thinking. And I think that it says to me, anyhow, that uh, two, uh, uh, two, two uh, different paths to come to some conclusion, it sounds that it may be sustainable, you know, uh, perhaps both two can't be <laughs> totally wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about uh, our, my, my company? We have done a, a so-called core una. It's a system to transfer uh, patient and social client data from the uh, source systems to the user use case uh, for the user's application. So it does not contain any uh, repository and so it, it only transfers the data. But the most important component is the access control module. I haven't heard today much ab about the problems of access control, but I think that it's very essential that uh, we have now a uh, uh, working and running concept how to manage the access control uh, when you have all data available. Uh, so uh, what we have learned of, of this uh, core UNA, we have learned that, in fact, our documents, although they are too big to be handled by artificial, uh, artificial intelligence or something like that, uh, but anyhow, uh, we have rather, uh, they are better than nothing. So, so we have an a ecosystem of, of uh, uh, patient and social care data that can be transferred and gathered together automatically. And also we have uh, shown that management of the access control is possible to outsource from the applications as before this, the, the who can use when, what data, it was only built in the applications. And it, I think, is a bit of a risk of, of, uh, of, of misuse of data if it's only on the application level. So now the access to the data is prohibited uh, before it comes to the application. Uh, most of all, perhaps most important piece of our ecosystem system is our legislation. Uh, before Kanta, we had several attempts to do to get the data together, like we called them regional systems. But first, when we uh, began to build the Kanta uh, services, the legislation began to develop. And uh, although it's not true today, but uh, in the beginning of the next year, our new legislation of social and care uh, data management, it's best ever. Of course, it has some uh, problems still, like the concept of health data, of, of European health data space. It's not the same as it's in our country. So the border between social and healthcare data, it's different from the European thinking, but we'll manage that. Okay, but, but uh, the, the main point is that as we have built the legislation on the national documents, and we happen to know how, what data belongs to what document. So in fact, our nowadays all legislation from the beginning of next year, it's mature enough to manage the, the, uh, the data management. So, so uh, I think it's a real good thing to have. So we don't need to invent it again. And then we have experience of data lakes and we have uh, shown uh, in the best two legs that uh, if we try to uh, 
understand the data afterwards, so it's too uh, expensive to reuse the data uh, in a serious manner. So nothing, uh, something must be done before it's stored to the lakes. So uh, uh, we are in the situation that we can, can choose uh, all the fine things we have done on the document, uh, uh, sharing of documents. Uh, we can stay to that and, and, and find after a couple of years that we don't do anything of the documents more. Or then we can take the next steps and now concentrate on the storage of data without killing our professionals with, uh, <laughs> with, with documentation as we have uh, tried to do so far <laughs> too much. Okay, so, uh, um, so I think that we have three different uh, paths to take from uh, this day. It's, uh, but the most important thing is to get resources to this uh, new reform to data-oriented uh, storage of data, and it's raising awareness uh, and in usual language for those who decide of the resource, resources. And then it's to go on with the, the uh, real data repositories uh, without abandoning, abandoning the, the Kanta document thing, as we still need it in the future, but, but uh, we also need the data repositories to make the data uh, uh, sharing possible. And then, of course, the important thing about the archetypes so we have tried to invent all kind of components of data so far, 20 years in Finland. So now it's time to adapt the international models and local, localize them. But we have a good infrastructure like the re reference model and the code service and so on. That is not going to be so uh, hard, the localization. We have much in common with open air archetypes and especially with templates as all the documents at the national level today they are a bit like templates and then the last uh, i think that our path uh, thanks to the ecosystem system we have built so far uh, first it's obvious that which path we should take but also it's going to be rather easy. It, uh, anyhow, if we uh, compare it to the path we have taken so far, it has not been easy. Okay, thank you. Hello? Yeah. My name is Mikael Nuström, and I'm a, here as a board member of the Swedish Federation for Medical Informatics, which actually is the home of OpenEHR in Sweden currently. I'm also a board member of OpenEHR International, and on my day job, I'm a principal informatician within the solution management and architecture team in the Cambio Group, which is a Swedish EHR and information system vendor for health care. And the Swedish Association for Medical Informatics, the home of OpenHR in Sweden, uh, are an independent organization for all kinds of medical informaticians in Sweden. And we work for increased medical informatics knowledge in many different ways in Sweden. We have meetings, both internal and larger conferences like the Medical Informatics Europe conference two weeks ago. And we also have other kinds of information disseminations. We are also a formal referral body within informatics and e-health. And we are also a member of the Swedish Society of Medicine, which is the professional uh, scientific uh, uh, scientific organization for physicians in Sweden, and of the European Federation for Medical Informatics and International Medical Informatics Association and we are open for everyone, not only for physicians. So therefore, we are the home of OpenHR. And I have to excuse that it's 
not that many people from Sweden here today, but the reason is that we have our National Day of Sweden. And it is an even more important National Day today, because today it is 500 years since our King Gustav I Vasa was elected King of Sweden, which is seen as the start of the modern Swedish country. But... Um, The, the more important part for you to know about Sweden is probably that we have uh, 10 million 500,000 citizens that needs health care. And the health care system in Sweden is mainly government funded and universal for all citizens. There are a few private uh, non-governmental fundings part two, but they are very tiny. We have private uh, health care that is governmental funded too. And it is in general decentralized into 21 regions that are responsible for the health care. And the size of the regions are very different. We have Stockholm with uh, 2.4 million citizens and we have Gotland with uh, uh, 60,000 citizens. And each region usually have a main regional EHR system with most information within it. And we have several implementations going on there, but it will be soon Cambio Cosmic as the main EHR system in the red regions and Cerner Millennium in the blue regions and in Stockholm and Gotland region. I don't know what they will find out there. And we also have several, several smaller EHR systems also in use that are regulated by our uh, laws for EHR systems. So in that way, maybe Microsoft is our most common vendor for EHR systems because they produce Microsoft Excel. But the start of OpenHR in Sweden, it was actually a part of a research project, I would say. We hosted a network of excellence in semantic interoperability and data mining in biomedicine uh, from January 2004 to June 2007. And of course, it was a project with many European Union participants, but we have a quite large Swedish delegation there. And part of that network was actually work within uh, OpenHR. And I maybe can say thank to Deepak Kalra for starting the OpenHR community in Sweden in this, uh, uh, in that, this network during a workshop in the 27th of November 2004 in Brussels. Uh, because th there we get really many OpenHR and also Snowman City enthusiasts uh, and then continue to do research about OpenHR during this uh, network. And afterwards, we have even more research in different universities in Sweden, and we also gave seminars, tutorials, and presentations because we liked OpenHR and would like it to spread in Sweden. And also, we had companies doing product development related to OpenHR. And maybe the two most eager persons with OpenHR, they actually wrote their thesis about OpenHR. Rongshen and Erik Sundvall, probably quite many of you know because they are still in the community. But then uh, we would like to do more of OpenHR and uh, as a start of kind of the second phase of OpenHR in Sweden, the healthcare provider Region Östergötland started to do more of a localization work about OpenHR in 2017. They wrote translation guidelines that were partly borrowed from the Snowman City translation. They did archetype translation experiments, and they also created some collaboration areas for a Swedish collaboration. And afterwards, two year, three years later, we would like to have a little even more OpenHR work, so then they reached out to also the regions Uppsala and Värmland, and also the companies, and the Cambio e-health e company also would like to join there. And then we have a kind of provisional interest-driven joint forum without any real ownership in 2020. And we then focused on archetype administration and OpenHR presentations to raise even more awareness of OpenHR in Sweden. But we would like to have a real home of the work about OpenHR we're doing. So in 2021, we're joining Swedish Association for Medical Informatics. Initially, we were accepted as a kind of three-year incubator project to work with OpenHR. And the reason we actually selected 
the Swedish Association for Medical Informatics as the home. We, it, we were the first we asked them. It was where, that we saw them as a good neutral ground where everyone could participate in the open EHR work. And uh, by selecting SFMI as the base, there were also more companies in Sweden and also more healthcare providers that joined our collaboration. And also as part of that, uh, SFMI became a member of OpenHR International. And now, two years later, we have even more formalized the uh, work in Sweden. Uh, now we are not an uh, incubator project, we are a formal working group within SFMI, and we have the name OpenHR Sweden in the work group. And we also have started the process to become a formal OpenHR affiliate for Sweden. And our way of working is that we are open for everyone to participate. We publish everything openly on relevant sites on the internet, so both people can participate, but also follow what we are doing, even if they don't have the time to really engage into what we are doing. We have uh, regular online meetings in Teams, so every second Tuesday, most of us have, four, uh, have booked the afternoon to be uh, to have be accessible for OpenHR work meetings if we need to discuss and find out things. And we also have management meetings every second Friday to yeah, do the management. And the, the collaboration, they are run by two product owners or co-chairs, whatever you would like to call them. And they are elected for one year <clears throat> at a time. And our intention is to have one product owner from a healthcare provider and one from an information system provider. And we also use Swedish as the working language just to make all the clinicians more easily uh, can participate because I think it is we technicians that speak best English in Sweden and the, we also need to accommodate for the healthcare professionals to be involved and also come there and discuss their issues. And of course, we use Swedish in our EHRs in Sweden. And the work items we are dealing with is that we really prioritize work items that are genuinely Swedish, so we don't uh, create, recreate body temperature archetypes in Sweden and similar. So if we think it is better to do things on the international level, we try to do them on the international levels instead. And we also prioritize work items that benefit from a common understanding in Sweden. Other work items can be done in other grou groupings in Sweden. But still, if you're dealing with the semantic interoperability standard, it is quite much that you need a common understanding of to have things working. And some of the works that we are doing will be indexed in the authority, Swedish eHealth Authorities Service Natural Common Specifications, which is a kind of quality mark for what we are doing. And some examples of what we are doing. We produce implementation guides for Swedish phenomena, like how we would implement different Swedish things. So we have one implementation guide for the Patient Data Act, which is the big act uh, that say what you can do and what you can not do about EHR data in Sweden. We also have a standardized inf attention information, information model in Sweden that is not cr originally created in OpenEHR, but we have done an OpenEHR implementation guide of it or working with it. And you see the symbol on this slide and it's actually the uh, representation of the attention information symbol that is present in all Swedish EHR systems to warn the clinicians if they need to take care of something special for this patient. And if any of you are going to work in Sweden and you find out exactly that symbol, then you should be very, very careful because then the patient probably have all possible problems a patient can have. Usually it is grey. And we are also having uh, in our legislation and guidelines specific things about health issue and care process in Sweden, and we are also working on implementation guide in OpenHR for that. We also work with uh, archetype translations to translate the international archetypes into Swedish, and the archetypes we are translating is both selected by a specific need, but also some are archetypes that we genuinely believe would be good to have in Sweden in the future. 
and also the translations, they are brought back to the international archetypes. We are not just storing them on our side. We also think training is very essential, and we therefore have a few introduction trainings. Basically, uh, we go to conferences and maybe present a few, uh, one or two hours. Our last presentation was on the MIE conference, that we have a three-hour slot. And we also have Nordic collaboration meetings on a rotating schedule. And uh, maybe Webjörn know which country that is the next country to organize the Nordic meeting? Yeah, enough said. And the current status of our collaboration. It is said that we are a welcoming environment and it is easy to come to us and participate and learn more about OpenEHR and all interested parties collaborate, so it gives a good, uh, good base for a common understanding, which you might know is very important in Sweden and the Nordic countries. And uh, we also believe that this work is fairly easy to scale up because we have a central coordination and uh, several work groups that are working. However, our big problem is lack of man hours to do everything that we would like to do because we don't have any employees in this collaboration, so everything is done on a voluntary basis. And of course, most of it is done during people's regular working hours, but still you don't have that many hours that you really would like to have to have everything happen. And this is just an example of our openness. This is our last meeting protocol in Swedish, but if you really want, you can go to the OpenHR website and probably use Google Translate and find out what we have discussed. And we also have the two JIRA boards, one general board of what we are doing, and the translation JIRA board online on the OpenHR collaboration site. And this is one example of the, an implementation guide about how to implement the Swedish legislation within OpenHR. And his, here are a few links if you would like to use Google Translate to understand more of what we are doing in Sweden. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think we've got time for just a few questions. If we've got some microphones at all. Have we got any questions at all from the audience? Yes, we've got Amish down here, then this chap up here. Just a comment, really. That's a, a nice blueprint that Mikhail just presented, I think, for how to run a, an open uh, local organization. So I recommend, I hope these presentations are available. But some point to I believe see. there may be, and I believe that one of the uh, one of the other national groups has already taken that slide and decided it's going to be part of the yeah. mandate. So that was really compelling. And and uh, thank you for the Finnish one as well. That was also very yes. interesting. This chap over here. Hello. Uh, my question is about uh, for Michael. Uh, when you talk about implementation guides, it's kind of a selection of archetypes. It's a document, a separate document, or what is the what is a implementation guide in this context? Excuse me. Can you please repeat? Sorry. Uh, the concept or the the, the artifact the implementation guide that you talk about. Is that, is that a, like a, a set of archetypes? Is it just a set of rules or how to build them? Uh, archetypes are um, implemented by a different um, healthcare providers, so that is not inside what we are doing in our collaboration. What we are looking at our collaboration is basically the translation of the archetypes because they are of a common interest for yeah, everyone working with OpenHR in Sweden. And I think most of them uh, currently is uh, uh, based on the international archetypes. Fantastic. Any uh, one more question up here? Thank you. And a uh, question also for Michael. 
Um, considering also presentation from Joost in Netherlands, where we have to deal also with age of seven fire uh, and the mapping between fire profiles, Dutch national fire profiles and uh, open HR, R types. I wonder if you have something like that in, in, uh, in Sweden as well, if you have to deal from Swedish Medical Informatics Association also with mapping or, you know, curating or uh, something about national profiles of fire? And if yes, how do you do that? Uh, in general, we are using HL7 Fire not that much currently. We have some implementations of it, but it is more local implementation. Uh, the more national implementation is what we call national patient overview, which basically is that we send smaller or larger pieces of the content in the HR systems to a national repository for viewing of the, for physicians. And that is a kind of 10, 15 year old uh, implementation. So it is some kind of Swedish specification inspired by HL7 version 3. Uh, so I, uh, it's basically that thing you need to map to currently. I honestly hope that we can do more modern things in the future, but that's the situation. Right. Any more questions at all? May I? Yes. May I have a comment to 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 use because I'm I'm going to relieve you from your headache about the um, uh, heart rate pulse archetype. We're going to split it up in two, so that will help, I guess, for some of your headache. Um, and to Pirko, uh, I would like to say that you were asking for what, what should the tune be for the future? Because should I stay or should I, I should I go or should I stay? That was the few, the past one. The new one should be uh, a tune from from an American band called uh, Timbuk Three, and it's called "The Future So Bright That We Gotta Wear Shades." <laughs> So I, I feel a playlist coming on, which um, Björn is going to be in charge of. So we've had a, a blog, a book, and now a playlist. Thank you so much to the panel. Absolutely. Could you send me the, the link to the right piece? <laughs> so. Round of applause, please. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce Tomasz Gornik, uh, CEO at Better and co-chair of OpenEHR in International. So over to you, Tomasz. Uh, thank you, Rachel, and uh, thank you, Jordi, for, for hosting this event. I know how difficult it is to put together, and uh, I'm really impressed with the number of people that have uh, turned up to listen to. Listen to, to OpenEHR, and uh, for me, it's been basically a 15-year journey from the first time I came across it for a project we did in, in Slovenia. And since then, I've traveled basically, I was just thinking about this every continent except Antarctica, uh, to promote OpenEHR and uh, actually managed to find a customer in each one of the uh, continents, which is kind of uh, strange. Find people that uh, believed in, in this vision because in the beginning it was a belief. It was very hard to show that, uh, that this works, uh, especially works at scale. Uh, obviously, now it's a lot easier. And uh, like I said, I'm really glad for the people I met and the people who have led this uh, movement, especially in the last years when it's gotten real, uh, people like here in Catalonia, in, uh, in Sweden, in Norway, in the, uh, Germany, and so on. And if you think about the presentations you saw, you will notice that actually they are from the most developed markets, from, from markets that are digitally quite mature, uh, UK, uh, the Nordics, Catalonia, Spain. And you have to think, what is the reason? Because when I initially entered this space, I thought, well, 
you know, the people who have nothing, that's where, where we should start. But it turns out that people who have been through this journey collecting data for a very long time, doing a lot of great work, now realize uh, that there is a better way and that they found that this is uh, OpenEHR. And that's why I think uh, it's really, really great to see uh, these advanced countries showing the way for the others, despite the fact that they're already digitized. Okay, um, just a, a, few, a few numbers. Uh, we are in 17 markets uh, with uh, uh, a lot of partners helping us. Uh, we've grown to 150 people, and I can say that every single one of them lives, breathes, uh, and dreams about uh, OpenEHR, so it's all dedicated to OpenEHR. Um, and five years ago when we rebranded, uh, we, we set ourselves a new mission, uh, and that was not to deal with care itself directly, but to help uh, care teams uh, simplify their work uh, to accelerate digital transformation, and have everything underpinned by data for life. So to do that, we, um, we built a digital health platform. Uh, this term was, was uh, put forth by, by Gartner just a few years ago. But it means that it's not just uh, the data layer. It's actually three different layers. Uh, one is the, the core, which is, which is the longitudinal care record. Uh, next, a series of tools which enable us to build applications quickly and then a portal and a design system to make everything work, uh, and I'll talk more about this. Um, and we've managed to convince a lot of, uh, a lot of customers, uh, over 120 installations. Uh, and like I said, uh, most of them in very developed markets, which for me was uh, actually quite a surprise. Uh, our biggest market is the UK, uh, where we do about half of our business. Uh, and uh, we don't do this alone, of course. Uh, we have many partners. Uh, which enables us to keep small uh, but scale to uh, some uh, really large uh, installations and, of course, many, many customers across the globe. Uh, a number of them are actually here, here in this room. So one of the things that, uh, obviously, to adopt OpenEHR, you had to think differently uh, and you had to um, uh, think out of the box and accept the fact that this is something new, uh, maybe unproven, go on a journey. So the first thing we, we realized is that we needed to compare this to something. And uh, this is actually a slide I used 10 years ago here in Barcelona at uh, the World of Health IT. Uh, and I did it to explain how it's basically the same concept that we're used to with images. Uh, and I still use this slide always because it's so simple to understand. Everybody has done this in images and documents. And now with structured data, open air is the way to do that. Next came something that uh, actually Thomas pointed out yesterday, that uh, we're up against some uh, pretty big companies. Uh, and, the, and the only way to disrupt this market is to join together. Uh, it has to be an ecosystem of companies. It cannot be one company alone. And especially for this reason, for us, it's really important that there's more companies building uh, software in open air, even if that means competition for us. We've actually helped a number of these companies uh, develop stuff faster because if we all develop things quicker, get it out to customers, prove value, the market is much bigger for all of us. And I firmly believe that. And uh, this is supposed to show how a fish consisting of uh, many partners can actually eat the big fish. Um, next, we realize that obviously, uh, especially in these developed markets, there's no greenfield. So we need to find a way to stand a, uh, alongside the existing applications. Uh, applications in healthcare are notoriously difficult to replace. Some of them last until they die, which could literally be tens of uh, years, so 10, 20 years. So the idea here was to um, borrow something from Gartner, which was something called bimodal, which was leave the system as is, uh, start building new stuff in a new way storing it in a vendor-neutral data repository, uh, add applications, and go after the stuff that is outside of the EHR. Uh, you have to realize, I'm sure this group does, that the EHR, even the best ones, are not even half of the IT of a hospital or a care system. So how do you do the other stuff, even when you do buy or spend a lot of money on, on the, the mega suite? Uh, and then finally, this, this concept that it's not just about the data. If we want to make this useful, we need to build new applications because the old applications will just not work 
in this new environment. We can take data from them, but of course we want to use this data to enable new applications, and the new applications we build have to be built differently, and above all have to be built uh, quicker. Uh, all, the, all the IT departments have huge backlogs, so how do we make sure that they can build applications quickly to provide uh, value? Um, and we also worked with the consultancies. Uh, the first one, and I've been working with Gartner for 25 years, uh, was, was Gartner. And uh, you have to realize that even five years ago, Gartner, if you asked them, what should we do, they would say, buy the mega suite without reserve. The last two, three years, three years probably, uh, this has shifted. Uh, it could be because uh, some European guy took over healthcare at Gartner, which helps a lot. But uh, they're starting to talk about platforms now, not about uh, monolithic solutions. In fact, they even say that the EHR is just one data source uh, in a hospital. So this was really important, uh, and the fact that it's now layers instead of silos uh, uh, as well. Um, and uh, they've actually put open EHR in this uh, digital health platform slide uh, and actually put fire as a connector instead of a persistence store. And again, all of these things are really important because companies like Gartner, EY, they speak to the decision makers, and the decision makers need to have some trust into how will this work, will this actually work, and these companies are immensely helpful in this regard. Um, and then this one is, for me, one of the most important ones because EY is the first to clearly say that OpenEHR is the only standard that is built specifically for persistence of clinical data. Um, again, uh, we saw the other slide from UI, which came out of four or five years ago. Uh, this one is uh, very recent, but it's really, really important to reinforce our message. And it's also, Rachel, what, five, six years of work with UI? Uh, okay, so we have, uh, as a company, we have two products. One is uh, what we call Better Meds, which is a medication management solution that is built on top of the platform, and then we have the Better Platform which uh, underpins uh, meds and other applications. Uh, and I won't talk about better meds. Uh, it's uh, doing quite well in a number of markets. We're actually quite proud that uh, Catalonia selected it for their national system. So we hope to deploy uh, better meds in all the hospitals in, uh, in Catalonia in due time, starting with the first two this year. Um, but the way we, we present better platform is uh, has changed over the years. Uh, of course, the CDR part is still there, but we are more and more presenting it as a low-code platform uh, and as a care planning platform. And the reason for that is, like I said before, we, we actually need to get these customers to value as soon as possible. Uh, and usually the data part is not enough. Uh, users need to see applications and they need to see them quickly because as you know, governments change, CIOs go, and uh, this is still very much a decision of a few people. Uh, so let's talk about the first one. So music was mentioned before on, on the panel, um, and one of the things that uh, I really like is this uh, comparison that Gartner put up. Um, well, again, some of you might not remember vinyl records, but it was an all or nothing proposition. You bought the whole record even if you wanted to listen to one song. Uh, then if you were a little technical, you could actually do mixed tapes to tape recorders, uh, build a playlist, but you had to have some expertise. But today with, with Spotify and products like that, you can actually, anybody can build a playlist. So applying this to, to uh, IT, uh, we have the monolithic application, the one size fits all, which, which you buy in one chunk. Then you have the application integration, best of breed, which needs some type of capability to integrate. But then Gartner is now betting on something they call composable enterprise, where an end user would assemble their application experience just as you assemble your playlist today. And for those of you who are technical, you know that's not easy, but I do believe that that is the future because uh, we actually are now today, many users are using the same uh, application or different uh, things uh, with a lot of uh, fields that are not relevant, uh, a lot of functionality that they have to skip over, and assembling this experience to exactly what they need uh, would, be, would be a fantastic achievement. Um, and actually, uh, it's, if we take another analogy, 
Uh, it's kind of like the difference between a set menu where you pay for the menu, you eat what you want, what you want but you still pay everything, um, versus, uh, since we're here in Barcelona, right, the tapas concept, where you actually just take what you actually eat, pay for only that, and then, of course, you also have the option sometimes of building your own tapas uh, with, with tools uh, to have precisely what you need. So it's, it's kind of the same analogy that, uh, that uh, is, is coming to, to healthcare. And there's many reasons for this. Uh, one of the bigger ones is that we just don't have enough resources. If we heard anything today, it was that we don't have enough resources. Who's going to build all these applications? You know, during COVID, we were dealing for two years just with that. There's a huge backlog of applications we need to build. And it's, it's, uh, it's crazy to think we can build them in a classical way. We need to basically change how we build applications. And other industries have shown us that uh, the low-code approach is definitely something that can help in this regard. And this new idea of composability will help as well. Uh, because it broadens the amount of people who can actually build these things. And of course, it reduces time, the time to build. Okay, so what did we do in this, in this regard? Well, one of the things you quickly realize is that if everybody's going to be building applications, they better look and work in a similar way so as not to confuse the end user. Because while, while you're okay on the phone to have uh, you know, Google look different than Facebook, uh, if you're dealing with one patient and you have to have five, six apps to, to deal with that patient, you actually don't want them to work differently, uh, have different coloring for the same type of data so as not to confuse, uh, confuse the user uh, and cause patient safety issues. So we actually invested quite heavily. We have 15 designers who are building a design system, which makes sure that the information we present in different parts of the, of the application actually use the same uh, methodology, the same coloring, the same fonts, uh, so, to, so as to look consistent even if they're built by different people, and of course also to increase productivity. Uh, next, uh, we have built um, a, a set of local tools we call Studio, which enables us uh, and our customers to quickly build these applications on top of clinical data models. And we have now a few customers who are building their entire EHR uh, solution based on this, and uh, the Christie, the largest cancer trust in Europe, is one of them. And it's actually quite interesting because they have over 650 forms to manage specific cancers, which they need to move over to this new platform, and they have a really good team assembled to do that. Now, most of you have heard of low code, and uh, like I said, it's being used heavily in other industries. But the problem with the approach of most low-code uh, vendors is that they actually build the form and then they somehow tied, tie this to data. And we believe in healthcare because the data is relatively complex. This is not going to work. So our approach is that we take the data model and use that to build the form. So by dragging uh, from, from, the, uh, from the left, from the, from the template, onto the canvas and including the widgets, we're able to build quite compelling applications which, after you're finished building the form, already store data correctly. Uh, and the added value is that you get all the validations and the uh, terminology bindings automatically while you're building the form. Uh, and you can have uh, quite complex widgets, uh, graphs, and, and things like that as well. So the next step was um, one of the bigger problems, uh, and, and what we found was uh, almost an empty space in terms of vendors, was coordinating or joining up care. Now, we actually uh, did this in a uh, type of integration scenarios in many of our, of, our, of our customers, even sometimes at national levels. But the problem was always that we connected at the data level, and then, of course, when we needed additional functionality, we had to go back to these vendors of applications, ask them to update their application, and then all the hospitals and care providers had to upgrade their systems. And, in a city like London, which you saw this morning, this could take years. So we decided to do it differently, and I will show you uh, through a case uh, what, what this looks like. So this is a diagnostic journey for a patient with uh, heart failure, uh, and he goes to his uh, GP um, and uh, complains of some, uh, some problems he has. Uh, the GP does the regular measurements, uh, does a write-up, uh, ECG, and all that stuff, and 
of course, writes that into the uh, GP application, which is tied to a unified regional patient record. So um, it's basic uh, SOAP stuff with labs, uh, some scoring systems, things like this. Next, he gives him a referral to a cardiology clinic where uh, a specialist will repeat some tests but also add some new ones, uh, maybe some labs, uh, maybe some uh, 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 diagnostics uh, in addition, uh, and of course fill out a form uh, for uh, that specific uh, specialty. Uh, then the cardiology uh, uh, clinic does a follow-up uh, they can check uh, everything that's happened up to then, and this could even be in different uh, organizations uh, around the healthcare system, something like you've seen this morning with, with One London. Uh, they can check basically where the patient has been up to now, what the planned uh, encounters are in the future, the scoring systems, fill out, uh, look at the, the, the current forms that have been filled out, and of course fill out uh, a new form uh, to, to, manage, uh, to manage this disease. Next, uh, he goes home and he has an encounter, so he has to visit the emergency room. Uh, this time, uh, in the emergency department, they can pull up the data from the central uh, record uh, and manage this patient uh, as an ICU patient, including all the devices. And then finally, uh, he's discharged from the ICU into the hospital, uh, and the hospital, again, manages uh, the patient, submits all the data to the central record, uh, and then finally they are sent home. So in the home care, uh, he's connected to some devices to monitor him at home uh, and uh, alert the physicians if anything is wrong, so they need to uh, check on the patient uh, again. Uh, and finally, He's supervised by his GP uh, while at home. Now, the interesting thing about this demo was all of this was built using low-code tools. Uh, I'm not saying a single line of code was not written, but it was written in the, in the tools uh, and using the widgets that we have developed using the design system, including the multi-patient forms, the word lists, uh, task lists, and so on. Uh, and this is the power of, of this technology, and as you've heard this morning, uh, we managed to do this in, in seven months in, uh, in, in London City with quite a lot of uh, healthcare providers. Uh, and just to finish, I will show you a short video of uh, how that works in London. London is on a journey to become the healthiest city in the world. There have been several attempts to address the changing needs of London's growing and diverse population. One of the solutions is also the Universal Care Plan. The Urgent Care Plan enables every Londoner to have their care and support wishes digitally shared with healthcare professionals across the capital. How to store data in the right place, at the right time, in the right format and easy safe to use, while being available to all who need it. As a paramedic, being able to see key medical information about a person enables our teams to make informed clinical decisions in an emergency without delay. Having a digital care planning system, such as the Urgent Care Plan, ensures the same information is visible to all staff in the entire patient journey, right from when an ambulance or 111 is called, through to their care in an emergency department, or at home in the community. One London opted for a platform approach with a persistent data layer that is separated from applications, combined with low-code development. The Urgent Care Plan is based on an open health data platform technology called OpenEHR. Using this technology promotes flexible information sharing, which enables clinicians to provide safe and holistic care for our population by making sure that information is available to the right people, in the right place and at the right time. The use of low-code technology to develop these forms allows the rapid and scale co-production, putting clinicians and care teams at the heart of all development. All data held and managed within the platform is exposed through open yet secured APIs, allowing real-time read and write access to other applications through a range of different use cases. The technology provided by London's Urgent Care Plan enables us as GPs to create care plans more efficiently, giving us more time to spend with the people who need it. 
While the current fields in the plan are based on end-of-life and palliative care, there are now 12 new use cases that have been submitted by London Clinical Networks to make further use of the setup. In summary, 51% of Londoners currently die in hospital. But for those with a UCP care plan, that number is greatly reduced to 30%, meaning that their wishes for the third place of death are met and they pass away in the environment of their choosing. So, um, what's next? So, uh, obviously we're building out these tools uh, further and getting more and more functional so that we can support many more use cases. But one of the things which has always uh, driven me from the start was this idea of shareable content. And with clinical data models and templates, of course, we are sharing the content. But what if we could share a lot more? So, imagine if the Christie uh, finds a new way of managing a certain cancer, why couldn't Clinica Hospital download this pathway into their system and run it immediately? It's true that in under, other industries this would not work, but if you think about healthcare, this type of stuff is published in journals. It's just in PDF form. It's not executable. And of course, to execute it, they would have to hire somebody. They would go, go out, build a system. It would take a year, at least if it got on the roadmap. But this is our vision, so the ability to have a community which would freely share this content in executable form. Thank you very much. that Tomash and we're going to go straight into our industry panel now the view of industry so uh, could I welcome Sharef Arikan who is the uh, technical lead at Ocean Health Systems uh, Francesc Matteo who's the principal industry solution uh, solutions for healthcare at MongoDB and David Mona Cano who is the CTO at Veratech Welcome to the stage. Hopefully you're all here. We are running a little bit early, but that's good news. <laughs> Fantastic. So let me just check. I think we're on your slides. Yep. Yeah, okay, next room. Sorry. There we are. Um, do we have the mobile microphone. So I can't stand still when I'm talking. There's got to be... No, no, I know that one. I just... Yours was using a mobile microphone. I hate it when, you know, just trying to speak to this thing. Who has the mobile microphone? It's all right. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. They've been doing a wonderful job all day, and I'm making it even more difficult um, at this hour. So let's try to do this. OK, hello, and welcome again um, after six hours. And thank you so much for still having the stamina for staying here after such an intense day. And apologies to the guy with the camera as I keep moving around. Just don't bother if you can't catch my head. It's all right. They'll be looking at this anyway. So my name is Sheriff Arakan, and I am the technical lead of Ocean Health Systems. It is our absolute pleasure to be here with you today. And Tomas was saying that um, he was really impressed uh, by the number of turnout. I have to say I'm even more impressed by the number of people who stayed until this hour. So uh, thank you so much for after such an intense day of high bandwidth conversations and discussions still having this stamina to, to be with us. So, Okay, um, I am the technical lead of Ocean Health Systems, but before I start talking about surprise open air, um, I would like to take this opportunity, actually liberty, to express my 
gratitude and appreciation for a small number of people. Um, Stefan already did that, uh, but I'm not going to lose the opportunity to improve on a German, which doesn't happen all the time. So um, this group of people, some of them came together and they created an amazing idea. Then they turned that idea into reality. And some other people who are also in that group stood by them as they put in literally decades of work for laying out the foundations of open air as we are using uh, and talking about today. So genuinely, thank you so much for making today possible. Um, with that out of the way, just a little bit of information about myself and then our company, Ocean. Uh, as I said, I am the technical lead of Ocean Health Systems, and I've been in software industry probably for too long. Uh, I spent the last 20 plus years in e-health, and my involvement in e-health also has an academic dimension. I had the privilege of doing my PhD under the supervision of Professor David Ingram, and my academic interest and my research is on integrating open air with artificial intelligence for clinical decision support. So, about Ocean, um, simply put, we are the first open air company. We implemented the specs, then we implemented the first generation of modeling tools, the archetype editor, the template designer, and then we implemented the knowledge governance tool, CKM, which you've been hearing about, and on top of those components and the platform, we then implemented various clinical applications. And uh, the much beloved archetype query language also came from Ocean, led by my fantastic colleague, Dr. Chunlan Ma, who is still with us at the company. And after all this time, uh, we have been going still strong. We have multiple members in the specifications editorial committee, and we take pride in working with other vendors, members of the community, any stakeholder you can think of who's involved in open air. Um, this is something we are really passionate about. So today's agenda is an answer to a very good question someone asked us. So someone said, what can you provide to the audience in 15 minutes um, that would help them? So we thought that if we can somehow tell you about what we learned after all these years um, and help you initiate some conversations and discussions, questions, comments, objections, that would probably be the next, you know, best next step starting from today. So um, hopefully we'll be able to um, put some ideas in your minds. So what we know as Ocean, after doing everything we did, is Open Our Works. And I'm going to change what I'm going to tell you a little bit because you've been seeing a lot of proof about open air actually working. So I'm not going to you know, just say the same thing about having these applications and those applications um, proving that open air is a solid, mature approach to building e-health solutions. But I think that's quite, quite obvious by now. But what I would like to emphasize as I go through those applications is, is the fact that they all fit into the existing ecosystems, into whatever you want to call them. You can call it leg legacy applications, you can call them existing systems, but there is something out there, and in case of using open air, we are going to have to fit in. So it's going to be the case for Catalonia as well. So let's take a look at how different applications we, we, we built actually fits into the existing environments. Um, so this is an infection control system, multi-practice multi and application, that is used by infection control professionals to manage um, the risk and the reality of infections acquired during care. Um, it is used across 14,000 beds in Australia, um, more than 130 different facilities and locations. 600 professionals use it every day. And um, as you can see, it fits into the HL7 feed of the existing pathology labs, which means we don't go to pathology labs and ask them to migrate to open air. We process the data we get from them, and during the pandemic, um, that 
kind of tripled and we were able to cope with that. So um, there's a bit of a proof that you can build really resilient and scalable systems using open air. And as a result of about, I think, 10 years, uh, we now have 160 million version documents, open air compositions sitting in our repository. Um, I'm sure you, you are mostly familiar with the concept of a clinical portal. And what is interesting about this clinical portal we built is that it actually fuses an open air based portal with one that is based on HR7 and CDA documents. So it unifies those and presents a single view. Again, fitting into the existing systems, existing investments, um, not asking the national portal infrastructure of Australia um, switching to open air. And not only it does that, it also integrates with the national identification service, therefore reusing the existing facilities, but still improving care. Um, and if you go beyond federating data, you can start thinking about orchestrating the flow and the creation of data across federated distinct locations, clinical care facilities. And um, that's what we did with um, Linked EHR, integrating into GP systems using their custom APIs and not asking them to build GP systems based on open air, for the moment at least, and then describing care processes, uh, including all the critical information that a clinician may need to provide better care. Again, I'm going to emphasize the same thing. We managed to fit in using open air. And um, it would be a sin for me not to mention a mobile solution when we're talking about an e-health um, you know, just ecosystem. So what we did this time with the uh, National Prescribing Service Medicine-wise app is um, we provided an app that allows not the users directly, but um, the people the users are providing care for to manage their healthcare information. Because you have some numbers there. Um, there are 2.6 million more than um, carers in Australia. About 1 million of them are the primary carers, which means that they are the people providing the most essential care to their loved ones. Um, average age 54, uh, but you have almost one in 10 uh, under the age of 25. So you can build an application like that and reach an audience. But what we did here is we worked with another team who wanted to build the application using Fire. So the application was actually developed by uh, an entirely different team than Ocean. And as they asked, we provided them a Fire server backed by Open Air including the fire demographics. So once again, it was their skill set, it was their choice, and we somehow again managed to put open air into whatever shape or form they require and managed to deliver this um, under the same concept. Now, this particular solution I say for the last because it's not a clinical application, it's something you've been hearing about all day. Um, personally, the importance of CKN for me is that it proves that open air has a methodology. And this is important. Open air is not just a data persistence standard. Open air is not just a data validation framework. It has a methodology. It is a methodology that lets clinicians gather their know-how, share, discuss, and then refine it, and then build systems based on that refined information, which makes it uh, a unique product um, in a space of knowledge governance in clinical care. So um, I don't want to deviate from apparently the open air tradition of showing various videos. So there is one that I'm going to um, display and play for you now. And after that, uh, I'm going to switch to the second part of the agenda. Let's see if I can make this work. The world needs efficient delivery of effective care as resources are stretched to the limit. Globally, with so many views on the best or most current treatment, 
it can be difficult to diagnose correctly. So being able to analyse the available data in a universal format is vital. Wouldn't it be great if we could join forces with others, collaborate and share our work through a standardised comprehensive set of clinical content models for everyone everywhere to use? From international initiatives to governmental institutions across the globe. The problem is there are many digital health programs and projects popping up around the world. They emerge, run their lifespan and conclude on completion. They're different projects run by different people from different organisations in different regions, countries and so on. And they achieve their goals using different tools, methods and ideas. It's the same clinical content redefined repeatedly. Often on paper, not stored digitally, with little attention given to how the content is modelled until it's too late. Clinical Knowledge Manager, or CKM, from Ocean Health Systems aims to address these issues. CKM does this by supporting the creation of a collaborative library of content models and providing management, governance and publication of these models digitally. These are then available to everyone in health services everywhere. CKM uses archetypes as the building blocks to create clinical content models. This makes the pieces reusable while providing the basis for semantic inter or intraoperability. This enables the development of clinical models that can fulfil local, regional and national requirements. These computer processable models allow knowledge reuse as a solid foundation for a digital health ecosystem. They allow customizations for local use cases and can be accumulated in repositories to be used as the basis of future clinical models. CKM proves that a lingua franca of healthcare is possible today, spoken among clinicians and information systems from 109 countries. CKM's sophisticated knowledge governance capabilities deliver clinical models that are high quality, comprehensive, transformable, intuitive and internationally agreed upon. CKM supports stakeholder engagement with minimum time and effort so the shared knowledge can stay meaningful and continues to grow with its user community. CKM users can engage in informal discussions, make change requests, propose new clinical models and even participate in the review of all clinical content models, actively improving the ecosystem as it grows, supported by detailed reporting and statistics. CKM allows fresh initiatives of any size to close the knowledge gap almost instantly by allowing instant access to over a decade of open clinical modelling work ready for customization for the immediate near-term goals. CKM makes the collection and creation of clinical content models an easier and more manageable process, benefiting you, your organisation and patients now and into the future. Ask us and see how to start your CKM journey. www.oceanhealthsystems.com Okay, so the reason I was flying through the first part of the presentation was that I wanted to get to the second part, which is where we would like to talk about what we learned um, doing all of that, including the CKM we learned that there are some ways of increasing the success of an open air implementation and we think that's going to be critical here for Catalonia. So we would like to share with you what we think about uh, the risk elimination when you're implementing open air. First of all, um, we found out that identifying the stakeholders from the very beginning as early as possible is extremely important and extremely helpful. Finding out that a particular department in an academic institution or um, some reporting department in a government institution needs something just when the EHR platform is going live is not a good experience. So finding out who are the stakeholders and what they need and what they should expect um, from the platform as an ecosystem is, is our, almost like the um, 
backbone of our implementation process in whatever project we do. And what is even more important, which I'll get to in a while, is talking to the stakeholders in their own domain language, trying to keep the learning curve as low as possible so that they do not have to deviate from their existing um, roles and responsibilities. So most of you will go home or to your offices tomorrow and we'll probably take a look at the OpenR website and you will find a lot of content there. So bridging that gap between what you see there and what you have to do during your daily job or daily responsibilities, we found out that it is really, really helpful. Um, if I were given just one slide um, to, to present to you, if that was the only opportunity I had, I would actually use this one and I wanted to underline um, the critical message as much as possible. So shaping the platform for the people, for the stakeholders who are going to use the platform is really, really helpful. So this could be um, developers working in a technical company, clinicians working in a, tech, uh, in, a, in a clinical institution, government agencies working on some reporting requirements that they need. All of that needs to be considered. And even more important is um, finding ways to leverage existing skills. For example, um, being a software developer, I'm going to go back to the software example. What Vita Systems and Airbase team is doing, for example, with uh, the ecosystem around Airbase, I really appreciate that. I think it's, the, it's a good idea because it allows uh, the developers using their existing tools and languages to start build solutions uh, with a very, uh, well, as little as possible learning curve. And there are some organizational factors, like the responsibilities of someone in a hospital. You have to find, as Ocean, a way of turning whatever needs to be done related to an EHR implementation into something that fits into their role, not asking them to step outside of their role and assume new identities. And all of that takes um, planning, consideration, quite a few mapping exercises, but they all help tremendously when uh, trying, to f for f trying to build a solution on top of open air. And this is the bit where I think we may um, deviate a little bit. Uh, what we think as Ocean is, not everything necessarily needs to go into the EHR platform. When you look at the open air scope, it's fantastic. I mean, it can do anything. And it's by design, it's very powerful, very generic. But based on the circumstances, it is okay not to do everything in open air. You can have a roadmap for implementation. You can implement a particular capability outside of open air and then plan for migrating into the platform later. That is possible. So um, what I was trying to say is you don't have to feel pressured to do all of open air from the get-go. It is a very case-specific situation and asking yourself what are the most useful elements of open air in our case, in our context, actually helps a lot. Um, in many cases, this uh, eliminated the friction of implementation and deployment for us, so we really suggest that you consider this as a strategy. And some other thing we learned is we made a lot of mistakes, and some of them were really, really expensive mistakes. And for a specialized but still small company like Ocean, um, we had to work very hard to fix those mistakes. But what we also learned is if you share those mistakes and stop others um, from falling into those traps, it actually helps you. Because the way open air is built, it isn't about letting somebody else fall into that same trap so that you can get ahead. It is the ecosystem that needs to succeed. So what we suggest is if you're working on something like the Catalonian deployment, try to come up with local communities, local groups working on the same goal. It could be developers, it could be clinicians working on CKM, it could be all the government agencies related to the whole roadmap, but 
there is a local context, and in that context, if everybody starts talking to each other and share their mistakes, especially specific to that project, it really helps. I mean, the global community of open air is always there. It doesn't mean you don't have to talk to them or get, get advice from them, but um, what we've done in multi-stakeholder projects where there's a mobile team, there's a um, clinical quality team, there's an um, on-prem technical team. So bringing those together and making sure that everybody talks to each other really, really helps for a smooth development and deployment of the solutions. So um, hopefully without eating into every other speaker's time, uh, I just want to say that as Ocean, uh, we are still as excited as we are when we started working on open air. And what we would like to do most is talk to you, learn from you, especially whatever doesn't make sense to you, whatever objections you may have, whatever discussions you may want to have, because those are the bits that help us improve open air and our solutions. So hopefully we'll be able to talk to you after this. And in the meantime, in the QA session, please don't hold back if you have any questions. Um, including this session or maybe about something you heard in another session, please let us know. So once again, thank you so much and have a lovely day. Thank you. So, uh, hello everyone and welcome to the presentation Driving Open EHR Successfully with MongoDB. First of all, I want to thank the opportunity that uh, Jordi have uh, given us uh, organizing this amazing event. And uh, from a database perspective, uh, which is uh, MongoDB, we will just talk about uh, like our little grain of sand of what database can contribute to this amazing uh, challenge that uh, OpenAir is trying to build, or is building, in fact. So I am uh, Francesc Mateu, the principal for uh, healthcare, uh, the industry solutions in MongoDB. So let's go for it. For those who don't know MongoDB, MongoDB is a document-oriented uh, database that was created in 2009. When we say document-oriented database is one that stores and retrieves the data just as documents. Therefore, uh, not organizing the data in columns and rows as basically we are used in relational databases. And we have become the most popular database uh, by far in no SQL. Okay, and open air challenge is about data health uh, management. And this is uh, the core, is storing and retrieving data. And this is what MongoDB is trying to do, what it's doing. Here we see a composition in open air with complex fields, uh, including uh, sub-documents, arrays, and these are the type of documents that MongoDB supports. The healthcare data is very complex, and it needs to be retrieved and supported in a proper manner to be efficient. At the same time, in a successful open-air project, the data tends to be and tends to grow a lot, and MongoDB document-oriented uh, database is inherently uh, created originally to scale horizontally because documents are much easier to organize in different servers than uh, complex relationships in tables. As the data sets grow, you simply add more servers and you split the data across it achieving at the same time that you accomplish with the demand of 
new data you accomplish also being having a better reliable system. At the same time, if we shine also in the uh, in the performance, why? Because often you model the information and you store the information just as it is used in the applications. Then you get complex structures like the one we saw before, for instance, Olive One, if you need it. And if you need, you can also create compound indices or wildcard indices to support and enhance uh, performance for complex queries with multiple fields. Also, with our, uh, with our uh, Atlas hosted uh, database service, that is the database service provided by MongoDB, you can uh, query the vast amounts of data benefiting from the Lucene indexing because MongoDB is more than a database. It's a developer data platform. To, in today's digital economy, the competitive advantage of the company is how the companies are able to build applications and use their data. The most competitive applications struggle to permit that the teams that build this differentiation, that they don't have any obstacle to build these applications. They try to remove all these obstacles. To, to reach a sustainable and recurring innovation across all the organization. But we see that many organizations never get there. And why? Because uh, listening to our customers, uh, we see that during the life cycle of the development of applications, the hardest part is when they work with data. And what happens is that the way the developers have uh, evolved during these years, it has changed radically, but the infrastructure remains mostly the same. And if we go deeper, we find three main reasons for that. In first place, the relational databases were created to solve other kind of problems. Uh, back, when the, back when the storage was very expensive and hiring employees was not, well, was not expensive as it is today. Today is the opposite. We want to maximize the productivity. At the same time, the data structures based in rows and columns clash with object programming. And the, that's the way the developers work today. The rigidity of these schemas make it very difficult to iterate and to evolve. Every time that there is a new business requirement, it takes days or weeks to reach it. And rigidity is not everything. There are other shortcomings of the relational databases that at the end, the companies are forced to add bent aids continually to the architecture, like adding single purpose non-SQL databases to accomplish demands from modern applications, or adding search engines to permit Google-like queries, or even other modules that increase the complexity of the system, a sprawling, uh, never-ending complexity, uh, and making the system more brittle. This unnecessary complexity addresses at the end with a fragmented and inefficient development experience. Managing a complex operational workload with different security models, with tons of integrations, and with unnecessary duplication of the data. We call it the data and innovation recurring task. Dirt. And to remove it, we thought and we developed a platform developed in three main pillars. The first of it is that it has to be built around the data 
the, the document model, because it's the way the modern developers think and develop. Second thing is that the document model is inherently flexible. So you can model, remodel, of course, you can have the data governments you need if you want, huh? but uh, you can accomplish with an extreme uh, flexibility the new requirements. And using a unified interface, you should be able, using the same platform, to manage many different types of workloads. At the same time, this platform needs to provide a, a strong consistency and acid transactions and cutting catch security, including encryption, uh, fine grade access controls, and auditing. This platform, at the same time, has to solve the necessity of today's most demanding applications, like the built-in full text search, or thinking on mobile uh, applications that without any type of connections can still, be, uh, can still maintain the data which is synced uh, intelligently by the system without implementing custom code and seeing middleware yeah? or developing new workloads with operational analytics. At the end, you have to be able, at the same time, to upload all these developments and to deploy them in any of the cloud providers. And if you need, you can develop your applications on-prem, and when you are ready, you publish the applications in the cloud. So, and let's talk about the radical interoperability approach because uh, we strongly believe with the approach of open EHR that at the end, if we reach this patient centricity data architecture, we reach a way uh, to have a common data that is accessed by many different applications having a vendor neutrality. In this uh, vendor neutrality, the different vendors can collaborate, innovate, but using the same data set, decoupling totally the applications from the data stores. And it's in that idea that we probably, as a database that is managed internally, but also used for by developers in a human readable format that you can leverage the data you store in it because you understand the data even when you didn't participate in the initial design of the schemas. Therefore, you can combine different data models for the requirements of the applications that you have using different APIs, canonical or non-canonical. Well, we have thousands of customers more than 40,000 in healthcare, thousands. I, and I invite you, vendors that are here, and any initiative to share this vision of really having an independent storage from the clinical data repository. And whoever knows if that might be an option uh, for institutions. Thank you a lot for your time. Well, uh, hello, uh, my name is David Morer. I'm uh, the, the current uh, Chief Operating Officer in Bratec for Health. And well, I think that except for Jordi, that now is leaving, uh, that is the last speaker. I'm the last one from the, from the, from the main conference, let's say. So the, the good thing of that is that nearly everything has been said. And I decided to mm, maybe make a summary of where are we coming from and where are we going. Uh, that's why I, I call it, uh, I put this, this title. 
Well, Veratech, uh, we are a, a small company, but very focused on consulting uh, on semantic interoperability. That has been always uh, where we have worked. Uh, we, we always wanted to help health organizations to achieve uh, better management and use of telehealth data by using basically standards, EHR standards. Uh, and we have been doing this for more than 20 years now. Uh, in fact, we started in 1999 uh, at, uh, as a research group at the Technical University of Valencia. Uh, maybe some of you know us from, from those years. Uh, but from the very beginning, as I said, we saw that uh, EHR standards were the way to go if we wanted to, to solve many of the problems that this industry has. Uh, in fact, and also very soon, we, we knew uh, about uh, these new standards in that time, 1366, and the open air, and all these kind of things. And uh, in fact, in 2006, we, we released Linker. That was our, our first uh, implementation or tool around uh, archetypes. I think it's one of the also first uh, examples or, or, or tools around uh, using archetypes. And also in 2007, in fact, we, we work with uh, Pablo, that is over there uh, uh, in the Hospital of Fuenlabrada, and I think it's the, the first deployment of an archetype-based system in Spain uh, at that moment. It was a patient summary based on 13 oxys archetypes. Uh, so from the very beginning, as I said, we, we have been convinced that this was the way to go. Uh, and we continue uh, on that, um, mostly uh, focusing on, on education and also collaborating with Open Air in uh, its different uh, programs. So as I said, with this experience, I would like to go back to 18 years ago, because when I was preparing this presentation, I found uh, this slide from 2005. It's in Spanish. Uh, the, the style is more or less ugly. But it's still valid. Let me update it to today. What said that uh, that slide, and it's still valid, is that we, we are combining two different kind of problems. On the one side, we are, in, 2000, in 2005, we expected that at some point we will have. Now we can say we have opener-based systems, archetype-based systems that can work in a native way with archetypes in order to get data and process that data. But on the other side, we had in 2005, and we, and we still have, and we will have probably forever, other kind of information that must be translated into open air, or that, or that never will be into open air, but we have to um, cooperate with that kind of data. That's why we created a linker at that time uh, to solve a very specific problem that is still a problem, that is the transformation of existing data into uh, standardized data, in this case using archetypes as, as the way to go. And finally, another thing that is changed for the better is that uh, we have now a, a library of archetypes that we can use. We can, we can reuse those, all that knowledge in order to put uh, all these applications uh, working. So, where are we now, apart from for, for that uh, figure. Well, I think that uh, at least we have achieved something. That is that uh, is no more discussion about uh, the approach, the general approach that we need something that adapts to the needs of the, of the data information. I mean, uh, we have forgotten, or at least I, I hope that many of the actors in the, in the market have forgotten that a uh, closed solution is the solution. Uh, instead of that, we are talking of having models, having flexible models in the, in the form of archetypes, for example, that can evolve with our needs. So this is a progress. What else? As I said, we have examples of, exist uh, of native systems that are going to be implemented uh, using uh, all, these, uh, all these methodologies. Uh, for example, we have this Catalan Digital Health Platform. I'm not going to explain this because uh, I will let this to, to Jordi, but we, we could simplify it by saying this is opener. Okay, so uh, it will work with, with that because it will work with that. <laughs>
Another example uh, of the other side of the part of the transformations uh, has also been explained today by, by Miguel, uh, the Infobanco project. Again, uh, so I have little to add here. Is the case where we have uh, data that is not standardized, but we have to move it into this standards uh, world. No? Not only that, not only to put it in open air, but also to be interoperable with other standards. There will exist other standards. We have also heard of that today that uh, cover different needs, and we have to co cooperate with all of them. And for that, th there will be transformations of data but that, that will be with us for, for all, forever, <laughs> probably. Finally, another, another thing that uh, we are witnessing this, these years is the increasing need for training and certification. The increasing need for creating a professional career uh, for those that are working with this new open air, with these archetypes, with these modeling things. So uh, we are also very focused on, on this, on we are collaborating on the education program of, of open air uh, in order to define which are the roles that the, that the professionals will have in this uh, open air led uh, technologies or, or platforms or systems. Uh, and how can we uh, teach them? And how can we certify uh, their knowledge? So this is also something important that is happening now and we have to finish and, and really define how, we, how are, are we going to, to do this. And what's next? Well, uh, Thomas before was talking about, uh, he was not expecting that uh, he would be working on this 20 years later. Probably now we know that we have worked for or, uh, or the rest of our lives we, because uh, there will be always things to do here. We could talk, for example, of, uh, of this clinical research. I mean, uh, open air is very focused on the, on the clinical care, on, on the primary or the uh, primary care, not primary, but uh, the direct care of uh, health. Of health. But also clinical research is, uh, is a, a play uh, uh, somewhere there where it can play a, a role. Also, uh, there are things to resolve about the, those shared knowledge libraries, those archetypes. Yes, we have the CKM, but of course, uh, mm, information models are not just archetypes. Uh, I mean, uh, information models is something that could and should be shared between many other technologies, many, many other types of implementations. So probably we, we have to move also uh, towards that, uh, not only thinking on open air archetypes, but on clinical models, on creating those kind of uh, global uh, knowledge artifacts somehow. Also, uh, I talk about ETL, about transformation. When it's structured data, it's more or less easy, but there are lots of non-structured data. And for that, uh, there are problems where we, we should apply um, natural language processing or we should apply different techniques to bring all that uh, textual data into a structure of data. And there is also some challenges there. Terminologies. This is something that I usually feel that we are forgetting sometimes. I mean, we talk of creating archetypes and we are focused on creating the information structure. But archetypes are also a mapping to terminologies, or include also mapping to terminologies that define the, the meaning of those structures. And we cannot forget that because if the final objective is semantic interoperability, it's not just defining a, a, a data structure, it's defining a data structure that has a meaning, and that is given by terminologies. So don't forget about this and continue working on, on that. Data quality. Data quality uh, is fundamental. Uh, obviously, in, in what we do, that is transforming data, we have to be sure that the data, the quality of that data is maintained even if we are changing it, if, even if we are transforming it, and to, to know that we can safely use that data for other purposes. And finally, and, and maybe a, a, a concept for, for, for everything, semantic by design. I mean, let's stop thinking that, uh, well, how can I take archetypes and how can I map it to what I'm doing now? No, maybe may we have to start thinking on 
let's design new systems that have semantics in, it, in, the, in its core, uh, that are gu guided by, by semantics, by those uh, uh, semantic structures of data, and let's build the solutions over that. It's not just that we have to apply uh, open air to our existing problems, it's just that we, we have to think maybe, uh, or to find a way to think that, well, the future system, how can be built using these tools we have now? And I wanted to be a bit provocative at the end, because we are now, look all these people, this was incredible 15 years ago. So, is open air just hype? What do you think? You are very interested <laughs> people in this, so I hope that nobody is going to say uh, that yes. But of course, uh, a hype doesn't last for 20 years. Of course. So no, but why not also? Because at the end, when we talk of open air, we are not talking of a technology. Technology uh, it's, uh, gets outdated with the years. We are not uh, talking of just uh, take a specific technology and implement it. What we are talking about is changing the way we are doing things. We are changing the way we are formalizing the meaning of the data, of the health data, that, so that it can last uh, for lifelong or more or over than that. And in fact, this could be also, um, someone could understand that uh, this is a speed race. I, it is not, and it has never been. Uh, as I said, we are changing how things have been done for many, many years, and that will take time. That, that will not happen tomorrow. Um, so, don't worry. Uh, we still have time, but we don't have time to waste. So. Uh, my recommendation is that tomorrow you uh, have a meeting with your teams, and all, of, all of you that you want to, to join to, to this new wave. Um, join your teams, uh, talk about this, think uh, how could be your strategy to start adopting this kind of solutions. And of course, if you have any doubt, who are you, know, who, who you going to call? Baratek, your health data partner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. The hype curve, it definitely doesn't last 20 years, a hype curve. But uh, wonderful. So on to just a quick couple of questions from the audience. Have we got at the microphones? And do we have any hands? There's somebody at the back waving. Mehdi, is that a question or are you just doing a human wave? <laughs> Mehdi's got a question up there. Hi, my name is Mehdi. Thank, thanks for the brilliant um, conference and quality of the speakers and the pictures and the content, really great. It, it, not a question really, just to enhance what has been said. Um, a question emerged during the day that said, are we gathering momentum? I, I think, raise of hands, who was in Berlin two years ago? That's the momentum we're getting. Everyone else was not in Berlin. Mm. If that's an answer, you can see it. Now, I think it's gathering momentum, and I think in the last 20 years I've been doing EHRs, etc. I've been having conversations with Tomas about Japan. In 2013, Japan had in the year 2013, Japan had 126 digital health projects in the country, more than districts. Why? Most of it because every university hospital had its own data model. Data models. And every data model had pros and cons, and ones were better than others, and arguments were back and forth. But, you know, data models were religion, so you can't talk anybody out of its own data model. But I think today, with some time and some hindsight, we can, tell, we can say that data models are coming together and open air is redefining data models. And, you know, if you think about data models as, as religions, 
I think they're consolidating now into open air. And I think this religion at least is different because we have a prophet. So thanks, David, for being here today. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, culture wars. Question over here. Thank you. I can only apologize that my question is nowhere near as philosophical as, as that <laughs> comment was, and it's, it's much more technical. Um, but we heard about MongoDB there, MongoDB being a NoSQL database, the historical uh, kind of approach to uh, relational versus non-relational databases is uh, or the litmus test for me has always been, and it's actually uh, it was communicated to me by someone who now works at MongoDB, Rick Houlihan, who used to be um, at AWS working on um, their uh, NoSQL database. And it was, are your access patterns predictable? Do, do you know your access patterns in, in advance? And it, the, the, it's a rough rule of thumb, but if you don't know your access patterns in advance, then a relational database is useful. And if you do know your access patterns in advance, then a NoSQL database is useful and you get more performance and cost efficiency. And it's kind of a question for the whole panel, but um, is, there a, is there a gap in the kind of technical market for open air where we are using kind of one solution to support both transactional application workloads and broader querying and supporting any query that could be done through AQL? And we're trying to... Um, arrive at technical solutions that will support both those predictable application-based qu query patterns and access patterns and also the, um, the, 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 the broader, I can query anything under AQL. And just a very specific question is I was wondering if there's any, if MongoDB are doing work with any of the uh, kind of uh, existing open air implementations on, on platforming a, an open air engine on, on top of MongoDB. Die. Yeah. So, thank you for the question. And according to what you were telling about the have, that it performs very well when you have a predefined access pattern, yes, this is like that, and it happens the same in relational uh, databases. And uh, for that. Uh, we also provide uh, other models and different patterns to model the data. Uh, it's not techno. We, we can discuss that further we, 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 with other, uh, in another session. But is about the attribute pattern, so flattening information when needed, or, or leveraging complex indexes that uh, attempting, I talked about compound indexes, wildcard indexes, or leveraging the search engine integrated in the same data set, okay? And uh, we basically uh, want to be an option more to clinical data repositories. Uh, this is an initiative that was started uh, years ago and of course started with the technologies that the developers know more we arrived later into the market, but we are achieving uh, lots of success in many different industries, and uh, we think that here we have a clear space, and this is basically our exposure. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Works now. Um, without going into um, other vendors' implementations, Yes, uh, we separate them. In open air implementations, when you start implementing a system, there is volatility in the archetypes, and requests arrive, and data keeps changing, and as the requirements about the clinical processes are better understood, access patterns keep jumping around. But after a while, um, when it's established, um, in, in, in our experience, um, that's when an interesting opportunity arises. The system I mentioned, the one that's been running more than 10 years with 160 million compositions, it is now so stable, it's been running uh, for such a long time. Um, we have the you know, blob type of efficient storage, but we can, after a while, start introducing purely relational 
data warehouses fed off from the operational systems, which work extremely well um, with the existing skills as well, because in every clinical institution, there's a room full of guys with, you know, just beards and white hair, where they do SQL and reporting. But you can't jump to that directly. Um, that's when, you know, just the system kind of settles down in terms of requirements, and then you have to keep updating it. But until you reach that point, then um, the blob storage and Mongo-like solutions, obviously, they do have an advantage. Good. Hopefully that answered your question. Can Anyone? the panel ask questions to the audience? Oh, Let's turn yeah. it around a little bit. Okay, yeah. you, you've been absolutely wonderful. I'm just wondering if those of you who think that open air can help them in any way, could, could you please raise your hands after you know, listening to all of this all day? What do you think about this? All right. David's okay. not raised his hand. I'm slightly yeah. worried, and that is Thomas. All right, just there, there are some <laughs> waving hands there, but in general, I think we've done a good job. So I think it's been worth everybody's time. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> are, are you not sure, David? It's a, it's a little bit too late, isn't it? <laughs> good question. Well, thank you, panel. That has been really interesting. Have we still got more questions? Yeah, we've got another five minutes for questions. Okay, we'll take a couple more. So you've been uh, developing a lot of these mappings uh, from open air to other standards. So is that something that you are maybe going to open up to the public or maybe put that in something like the CKM? And if so, can the CKM support these mappings? Uh, so question to both Ocean and Veratech, I guess. Doing that, uh, in fact, my, well, the expert there is my colleague Diego, and he is uh, working in well, different uh, uh, things that are happening in open air towards OMOP mapping. He's also collaborating in some ISO standards that are also talking about the common use of standards. So there can be things through open air, things through uh, free software or open, open software, and things through an ISO committee. Uh, we go to for everything. <laughs> A little bit late, isn't it? Yeah. Um, if that begins to emerge, especially if there was some fantastic work around OMOP, I think Severin, um, I, don't, I don't think he's with us now, but brilliant guy. Um, he, he did some work um, when it comes to OMOP, and I think, you know, just you have a lot of expertise. So what we want to do is actually, if that becomes um, like a shareable artifact, these mappings, then we think CKM may be an interesting place to have them next to the models, because that's um, kind of the kind of review you can do, but um, you know, just mappings are just like, um, if you think about them, they're like translations in the way you do languages, so um, we can have a discussion about whether or not that's a good idea, but that definitely requires a few drinks. Joost, you, have you got a, a comment to make? Yes, have we, we've got a microphone, hopefully it'll come down. Yeah, thank you. Just to respond to the previous uh, discussion, that this is actually one of the advantages of OpenEHR. I told already about the mapping in the Netherlands from ZIPS to CKM archetypes. And one of the great things is that if you have a standard, then you can do it together. So we're uh, doing it together with our competitors. Uh, and we are pub we've published the mappings on, um, on GitHub, it's just a CSV file. It would, would be amazing to have better tooling uh, for that, especially around reviews and uh, maybe a better data format than CSV that's computer processable. So please, uh, if anybody uh, goes ahead building this, I'm the first one in line. Yeah, let's talk. Did we have one last question at all? No. Oh. So thank you so much, panel. That was amazing. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much for standing there all day. It's all good. So, um, on to our final session now with Jordi. Now, the reason that I like Jordi so much is he introduced me to a phrase or, or 
terminology infrastructure, and I think you may have invented it, Jordi, but it has become something that I am really interested in. And I believe you're writing a paper on infrastructures, so I'm hoping we hear a bit more about that. But thank you for everything you've done today, putting on this conference, and we'd really like to hear a little bit more about building the new EHR for Spain. Uh, so, well, thank you everyone for, for still being here. Now, uh, I, would, I would like to start by going into, into the bits, uh, whether hype or, or no hype. I think that uh, other than the 30 years, that, uh, that 20 years that Open Air has been, has been on the market or running, I think that, uh, well, it's quite of a signal that in Spain, at six in the afternoon, uh, after nine continuous hours, uh, the auditorium continues to be full of people because normally we flee after lunch. We, we find an excuse and we flee after lunch. So I think that this is a signal that, that something else is, is happening in here. Uh, my presentation, I mean, we have heard a lot about, uh, about technology. Uh, we have heard a lot about uh, architectures. We have heard a lot about uh, building, the, building the ecosystems, the, the view of, of the industry. But uh, what I would like to share with you is, uh, well, how to convince, this came from Tom's and, and David's discussion on how do we convince uh, our ecosystem in order to move towards something such as uh, open areas. And, uh, well, for the few of you that, uh, that were in, 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 high, in the HiMed conference a couple of years ago, I stood in front of you and I explained uh, in the way we in Catalonia decided to move uh, towards, uh, well, this may be crazy idea. And I, I'm not going to go in, into that again. Uh, I think that uh, it was all a matter of uh, an exercise of uh, strategic planning. And for me, strategic planning uh, involves, um, you know, we imported strategy from war. And uh, it includes a bit from uh, these guys, uh, and also fool your enemy, uh, and also convincing them of something which may be true or, or not. And I think that we in Catalonia, as we were a small or relatively small group of people, it worked very well for us. Uh, I would say um, a recipe of three ingredients, uh, which was in equal parts. I would say one is told technical, so people won't fully understand you. The second one was, uh, mm, let's think, uh, or let's seem that we talk confident, so that we hold the one and only truth, uh, and people will trust what we say, and then use a bit the gypsy charm, uh, which I say, to convince people of, of, of whatever you want them uh, to be convinced, and, and they will think that it's even their idea. And that's, I think, the way we proceeded here in, uh, in Catalonia. But now, I want to talk to you today about something else, which is way bigger than Catalonia. It's not this small group of people. It's, uh, I'm talking now uh, in a project that we are involved on behalf of the, of the Spanish ministry. In fact, it's a project that we are leading with, uh, with other two regions. Uh, it's Catalonia, Andalusia, and Asturias, the ones that are leading this, this project. Uh, and, uh, well, here maybe these three ingredients that I was talking before wouldn't work. So we have come up with, with, with a different idea. So, uh, first, a bit for you to understand, I mean, Spain is, a, is quite of a complex uh, environment. It's not just uh, one region, uh, it's not just one healthcare system. We are talking about 17 healthcare systems. And 17 healthcare systems that historically have had the ability, and still have, the ability to decide on their information systems. So imagine uh, about the fragmentation that we have managed to achieve over, over all this year. But no matter that, that uh, I would say that we've been quite successful and, and possibly we are one of the, of the countries out in there in Europe with the longest tradition in sharing medical records. And this has been going for maybe for the past 15 years. And I don't think that there is not a single country in Europe, because I know most of them very well, that has managed to assemble or to link 
uh, the medical records for almost the overall population uh, of their country, uh, having the size that Spain has and also the complexity that Spain has. I mean, we obviously know that Denmark has managed something similar, uh, but it's just specialized care, very few on, on, on primary care. Here in Spain, it's the 17 regions and almost 40 whatever amount million of, of Spanish citizens. It's quite basic sharing, and it's what you have, uh, what you have on screen. Uh, it's basically international patient summary, uh, it's discharge reports, well, everything you have on screen. Apologies, uh, it's in Spain, it's directly from the, from the website of the, of the Spanish ministry. But what I would say is that we have here an ecosystem that it's quite mature, and that we know a lot uh, about the classical approach to interoperability. And, it, and it's quite similar to the situation that we faced here in Catalonia. So the reflection process starts in here. It's a fragmented ecosystem, which is quite mature and quite proficient uh, in, in conducting uh, interoperability. So we got uh, a lot of money, you know, from the next generation uh, funds from Europe. And, uh, well, I think that, the, that with the leadership of the Spanish Ministry of Health, uh, for the first time that, that I know and, and that I have seen, uh, they took the chance to develop uh, an overall strategy to spend this money wisely. Because normally what they would do is to split this money among the regions and let them do their thing. But the end result of that would have been more fragmentation. But no. They didn't proceed in this way for this time. So uh, with the leadership of the, of the Secretariat General of, of Digital Health, they came with a very good idea, uh, according to my understanding. And this idea is, uh, let's uh, decide to split the funding that it's coming from a specific part of these funds, and those are concretely uh, for, for, for primary care. Let's split these funds among uh, seven, what they say, it's collaborative uh, working groups. And these collaborative working groups, what they have to do is to produce results that can be reused by the rest of the regions uh, of Spain. And most of the budget, not most of the budget, but at least 40% of the budget that each of the regions was getting needed to be of this type of projects, which is collaborative projects, thus producing results that can be uh, reused by, by the rest of the regions. And in this context, we ended up with these uh, seven working groups. Obviously, the other 60% of the, of the budget, each region can use it in, in, in whatever they want to, but at least 40% is, uh, is fully devoted into that. So I'm coming here to talk uh, to you about the working group number four. It's called uh, the Digital Health uh, Record. And as I was mentioning before, it's co-leaded by, by Catalonia, by Andalusia, and, and, uh, and by Asturias. And in this work, uh, we, are, we are, I mean, from Catalonia, the work that we are conducting in here is split, uh, I would say, among three different work streams. We in Catalonia are leading the, the normalization part. Uh, Asturias is working uh, on the epidemiological surveillance. It's part also of this project. And then Andalusia is working on the, on the integration of the, of the social information and also on care process management. Uh, so our part is the one that I'm mainly going to talk about now, uh, and it's the one related, uh, related to normalization. And in fact, it's a, I would say that it's a strategic reflection process for us. And it's a strategic reflection process for us because we have decided as a country formed for all, by all these different regions to put a stop uh, in our evolution of health information technologies and uh, start this reflection uh, on which should be the future. And there are many questions that, that uh, or many situations that brought us uh, to, to proceed in such a way. Obviously, uh, there's the idea that uh, we, we've been talking. I mean, Tom, Thomas was saying in his speech uh, with, uh, in the table with David uh, and Rachel, they were saying, well, we know for 20 years that we need to, deal, to deliver patient-centric care. And in fact, this comes from a report which is quite seminal, which is Crossing the Quality Chasm, where the first time patient-centric care was named, I think it's from year 2001. 
And uh, do we really think that the current model of information systems is helping us to reach such a, such a situation? And, and I'm sure that the, if, if we think uh, through the question, I mean, the answer is absolutely not. I mean, the current model of information systems and information technologies is not allowing us to deliver patient-centric care. Also, the obsolescence, the current model of information systems that we have, everywhere it's patchy solutions, 30 years old. Uh, early this morning in the, in the presentation from Paul, we see uh, how most of these uh, monolithic solutions, how old they are, and the amount of years that we've been patching them. And we continue to sustain them because, well, replacing them, it's, it's a big problem. And uh, I think it was also Paul that was saying, well, it's like painting a, a, an airplane while, while, while flying. I mean, it's plenty of passengers inside. So, so it's, a, it's, it's a tricky situation. And normally we are lazy to, to confront such a situation. And we prefer uh, to, to avoid the problem, keep on adding layers and layers and layers of front end and forgetting really about the true problem that we are facing, which is the foundations of this system, how the data uh, is stored, and uh, all the technical debt that we are accumulating while we are investing in these uh, in this different obsolete solutions. At the same time, we see more and more that our healthcare system is shifting towards these longitudinal care pathways. And we see that primary care doctors, specialists at the hospital, uh, in intermediate care, new healthcare professions, uh, social care, all of these people want to work together and interact together. And uh, in a very, well, late night conversation with, with Thomas, I was saying, I truly think that we should stop talking about referrals and to start thinking about multidisciplinary teams of professionals that interact together towards solving the specific health challenges of a certain individual and not continuing referring them from one healthcare setting or from one healthcare provider to the other because we all know that within these transitions there's a lot of risk of losing the patient and with the patchy information systems that we have the, the risk is always uh, higher and, and in terms of safety of these patients, uh, medication, reconciliation, we all, all know all these problems. We are also facing a, an era in which, uh, and this was also a question that came uh, from the audience, uh, what's going to happen with the uh, European health data spaces, and which is the role the European health data spaces will have. Well, if we think that the European health data spaces will be uh, a place in we will keep on dumping HL7 CDA documents, okay, uh, Spain is ready for that. So we already have the European health data space ready to be plugged uh, wherever they want to in Europe. And, and then we, yeah, we can achieve having some very simple use cases of our patients, well, moving across Europe. And well, maybe, I don't know, for the simplest use case of cross-border healthcare, it may be useful. And I don't say there's no value in this, but possibly the European health data spaces should be something else. Uh, where there's real value to be taken from them and not just the tip of the iceberg, which is for me the HL7 CDA documents. And then, uh, well, in Spain, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have uh, a lot of money right now, so uh, it's coming from the next generation funds. Obviously, we will have to pay it afterwards, but right now it's wealthy moment. So why not, uh, when these times of wealth, to stop and rethink uh, about our current model of, of information systems. So basically, the, the, the project that we are conducting on behalf of the, of the ministry is to rethink about the foundations of our health information uh, model uh, and with a strong focus, obviously, in the electronic medical records, in the electronic health record, and how to proceed in the future uh, through that. Uh, it's obviously we are willing to, uh, as I was mentioning before, we have linked all the medical records or all the different, I would say, regional level medical records at the Spanish level. Uh, and this link has gone throughout uh, the ISO 13606. But how can we increase the granularity of the information that we share among the regions? Then when we have a patient with complex chronic conditions, is it worth it uh, to move uh, him or herself uh, with all this information? And then the question is, well, whether we truly want to build 
this, this longitudinal EHR that we've been talking for, for such a long time, uh, so how to do so? And, and that's, I would say, the late motif uh, of the project. So we are proceeding uh, in a way which is very classical in, uh, in strategic planning, I would say in general, also in information systems strategic planning, which is, well, let's analyze the situation that we currently have, which is the Aziz. Let's think about the to be, which is the desired future, and then let's look around us. Let's check um, what else uh, is happening around the world in systems that are similar to ours. Then from the desired situation and the current situation, let's conduct a gap analysis, and from the difference, let's think which is our roadmap towards uh, advancing there. And we are doing this throughout a, a, a Delphi consensus process. So we are being in here very scientific, opposite ways as uh, when we did the thing for Catalonia. As mentioned before, there's a lot of people to be convinced uh, among the region, so we obviously need this to be, uh, this process as, as, as robust as, uh, as possible. The Delphi processes, I mean, well, most of you, I'm sure you know, it's a, it's a scientific technique to reach consensus or to increase uh, the, the information about a specific uh, subject matter. So how have we uh, organized this? Uh, we have mainly two groups of uh, participants in this consensus process. We have what we call the driving group, and it's the group who is truly uh, I would say the, the mastermind behind the consensus process, and it's the people that are defining which is the questions that we need, or the statements that we need to agree upon within this process. And it's also the people that, once everyone has answered these questions, will drive some uh, conclusions and then propose uh, the way forward. And that's the, this driving group that we call, and it's currently formed by experts from the Spanish regions, uh, scientific societies, and people that is very well known in this environment uh, of, uh, I would say, medical informatics and also uh, in interoperability. And then we have a second group of people, which is bigger. And this group of people, which is bigger, are the ones who will agree or not uh, on the statements that we will present them. And these will be people mainly from the regions. So the regions will be deeply involved in this. We will recruit a lot of people who are experts from the regions, and we will ask them for their opinion. So it's people that they will accept to be part of the process, and it's people that at some point will answer, uh, will answer the survey. So uh, the survey uh, is formed by uh, four main areas. Uh, we have one area, I cannot disclose, I mean, it, it's finished already, I, I will explain you the current status, but basically the survey, it's currently finished and it's ready to be, to be delivered to the, to the regions. But, well, the survey, it's uh, split among four areas. One is, well, we justify why this exercise is important. And here we are dealing with things such as obsolescence, so do we agree that the current model of information systems that we have and that the current ecosystem of health information technologies that we have is 30 years old and is patchy? Because if we no, do not agree on that, well, maybe people is happy with that and then uh, there's no need to continue discussing this. But if people start to agree with these questions and it's what I call the nasty questions, then maybe it's worth continuing uh, this research, so to say. The second one, uh, the second uh, thematic area, it's the functional characteristics uh, of this model of health information technologies for the future. So we are thinking in here, or we are asking the people, do we truly believe that we need to move towards patient-centric care, or do we want to continue to do uh, provider-centric care, physician-centric care, uh, healthcare-level-centric care, which is what I think that we are doing now, or do we tr truly want to do patient-centric care? Do we want to move towards integrated care approaches? Do we want to stop talking about referrals, things such as this? So we also are talking about the functional requirements. We are also talking about how to build so from a technical perspective. And here it's where we are going in things that, well, may sound familiar to you, such as, uh, well, mm, do you think that the system should have or be built on the top of a, a dual model? And, and then we are starting to focus the, the, the discussion 
do you think that we should have a, a, a central clinical data repository, obviously, or a federation of clinical data repository for, following Clomont semantics, da, da, da. So this is another uh, thematic area of the survey. And finally, we have uh, the very last area, which is uh, the governance models. And, uh, and we think that this, is, uh, that this is also very important and, and most of the times uh, overseen, which is how are we going to rule such a thing? We think, uh, and I think personally, that this should be some sort of a federation in which obviously the Spanish Ministry of Health has a big role and then with the regions around the ministry uh, providing our experts in between all of us throughout a common effort, we are able to advance uh, the model, whatever it is the model that we end up uh, deciding. So this is our, this is our timeline. Uh, we started uh, working, I would say we started working in January, but uh, the truth is that uh, the group started to meet uh, by March. Now we are in June, uh, so you wouldn't believe it, but we are on time. The survey is ready and it's ready to be distributed uh, into the regions. And we are aiming to have uh, all the conclusions and the approval uh, of our future model of health information technologies uh, by October, and we aim to present this in the uh, annual conference of innovation from the Andalusian uh, healthcare system, which will happen in Malaga. Well, it happens every year in Malaga in late September, uh, early October. So that's, that's what we are aiming for. This is, uh, I wanted to share with you the composition of the group. Uh, some of the names in here will, will sound familiar to you. As I mentioned before, it's a mix of people from the ministry, from the regions, and also experts in health information, uh, in health information technologies. And uh, these are the guys that have prepared the questions, and these are the guys that will help us uh, drive the conclusions and propose to the ministry which should be the way to, to, to advance. And this is my last one. And my last one is, uh, at the beginning I was telling, uh, well, in Catalonia it was, yeah, uh, let's fool people by talking technical, looking confident, and using the, the gypsy charm. I would say that here uh, it's something else, uh, and now not joking. I mean, I think that in order to reach such a status, the, the, the system needs to be mature. So you, you, you have, I mean, there's a need for you to have gone throughout uh, the road of interoperability and then suffer it. And then once you have suffered it, uh, you will realize that, well, maybe something else is possible and this will help. Uh, we need uh, a strong leadership and, and I would say that, well, here in Catalonia we have to thank Paul for, for, driving, for being the driving force behind us and, uh, and pushing all of, all of this to become real. Uh, it's very important to involve everyone within the, the decision-making uh, process and uh, it's really key to involve uh, all the stakeholders so everyone feels represented and everyone feels that they have been able to have their say. In, in, in the digital health strategy for Catalonia, as an example, more than 300 people were part of them in one or another way. So uh, the idea for this project is the same to happen for, for, for Spain. The question is also, well, to really understand or to be uh, able to define which is the problem that we are aiming to solve and also being able to answer or, or to, well, ask and also be ready to get the answers from the nasty questions that I was mentioning before. And then obviously there's a bit of courage or bravery or, or craziness and that's for me the, the, the recipe for success. So. That was it from, from my side, and uh, yeah, thank you all for still being here. We have some closing remarks if you want, and I will have some thank you for everyone. And you can name a lot of people one by one. one by so. We're all going to take a photo down here on the stage with our sweatshirts on. So if you could put your sweatshirts on while we talk, um, that would be fantastic because I think it's worth marking the occasion with a, a photo. But thank you everyone for being here and thank you to all of the speakers. Um, I've certainly learned a lot today and I know that we've got a lot of people joining us online. So thank you to everybody 
that has been uh, part of this virtually. Sorry you didn't get a sweatshirt. Now, just over to Jordi, I know he's got a number of thank yous while we're getting ready for the photo. Yeah. Well, while, while you get the sweaters on, uh, this is just to thank uh, everyone that has been, I mean, first you, the ones who have been attending, for your patience, it's been a long day, uh, and uh, yeah, I can say that you are super committed, so thank you. Uh, I would also like to thank Xavier Pastor, uh, University of Barcelona Hospital Clinic for hosting us, Paul and the Catalan Health Service for being the, the main uh, organizer and, and sponsor of the conference, also uh, TIC Salud y Social Foundation and, and Belen for all the effort that they have put uh, into helping us with this, all of our sponsors, all of our speakers, uh, also for the first time in a tech conference, not having any problem with the computers, so the technical guy who is standing behind there. Yeah. I mean, I, I never, I never seen that before. So many videos, people coming here with their computers, and not a single mistake. So uh, unbelievable. We are hiding them again. Uh, and then also, well, for me, a, a very special thanks to one of the driving forces behind this, uh, which has been Maria, that she has been working her ass uh, for uh, yeah, this to happen. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you, and, and now we have the photo. So as Georgie puts his shirt on, could you all come down to the front, please? Tallest people at the back, and not so tall people at the front. And uh, we'll get ourselves ready for a monumental photo. Are you taking the photo? No, it's this. Yep, so everyone's here, and then it gets... Right, we need everyone up the steps. Right, could everyone come behind the stage? Yeah. Okay, everyone right. Oh, there! That way! Okay, right, the other way around. Okay. 